Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 9th of April 2021 of His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. I thank the Senate. I move that the following address to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II be agreed to. We, the President and members of the Senate of the Commonwealth of Australia, received with great sorrow the news of the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. On behalf of the Australian people, we express deep sympathy to Your Majesty and other members of the Royal Family and give thanks for a, rem a remarkable life dedicated to service, duty, support and his family. Mr President, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, earned the admiration of generations through a life committed to selfless public service that stretched across the better part of a century. He lived a long and full life, only retiring from public duties in 2017 at the age of 96. When asked to reflect upon his contribution to public life, Prince Philip responded with trademark honesty, I've just done what I think is my best. Some people think it's all right. Some don't. What can you do? I can't change my way of doing things. It's part of my style. If it's just too bad, they'll have to lump it. It was the authenticity of Prince Philip that captured the attention and left an impression upon many. As the Prime Minister has remarked, he was part of a generation that we will never see again, a generation that defied tyranny and worked to build a liberal world order, holding up and protecting the freedoms we enjoyed today. Prince Philip is remembered for his distinguished naval service in the Second World War, as well as his unwavering support for the Queen as the longest serving consort in history. Prince Philip's life was nothing short of extraordinary. From the earliest days of his disrupted and at times challenging childhood, through to upon finishing his schooling in Scotland in 1938, in the run-up to the start of the Second World War, where young Philip began his naval career. He was accepted into the Britannia Royal Navy College at the age of 17. Prince Philip thrived at the Naval College, finishing top of his class. It was here that a young Princess Elizabeth fell in love with him when he escorted her and her sister Princess Margaret during a tour of the college in 1939. Prince Philip rose through the ranks, becoming one of the youngest officers in the Navy, to be made first lieutenant and second in command of a ship, HMS Wallace, at the age of just 21. It was in 1941, serving on HMS Valiant in Alexandria, that Prince Philip was mentioned in dispatches for his actions during the Battle of Cape Martupam after spotting an unexpected enemy vessel in the searchlights. He continued to serve his country for the rest of his life, maintaining a keen interest in the military and furthering his own training, even earning, even earning his flying wings. After the war, a 1946 letter from Prince Philip to then Princess Elizabeth revealed an ardent young man with a new sense of purpose. To have been spared in the war and seen victory to have been given the chance to rest and to readjust myself, 
to have fallen in love completely and unreservedly makes all one's personal and even the world's troubles seem small and petty. His words embodied the tone of what would become a life of unswerving devotion. On return to the UK in 1946, Prince Philip went to ask King George VI for Princess Elizabeth's hand in marriage. In 1947, the then Lieutenant Mountbatten married Princess Elizabeth, who became Queen just five years later. At her coronation in June of 1953, Prince Philip swore to be Her Majesty's liege man of life and limb, as he gave up his active military career to be the Queen's consort. Prince Philip was, in fact, the first subject to pay homage to his newly crowned Queen. But the story goes that he would later, following the coronation, ask his wife in private, whilst she was still weighed down by all of her regalia, where did you get that hat? A man with good humour and an unmistakably authentic approach about him. He took on the role of consort in a posture of humility always putting the needs of his spouse above his own, allowing her to shine always one pace behind. In describing her husband on the occasion of their golden wedding anniversary, Her Majesty described the Duke of Edinburgh as her strength and stay, a simple statement that captured the essence and significance of his role as her consort. Their marriage would span an extraordinary 73 years. In 1956, Prince Philip launched the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, a youth awards program inspiring teenagers to challenge themselves physically and mentally and build their confidence through non-academic activities. The award was introduced to Australia in 1959 and has since developed and grown internationally, now reaching young people in more than 130 countries, with over 8 million young people having participated worldwide on last count. This includes over 775,000 young Australians who have participated in and benefited from the opportunities created by the Duke of Edinburgh's award. Prince Philip led a life of strong advocacy for scientific and technical innovation, for wildlife protection and conservation. He was the patron or president of more than 750 organisations. Sixty years ago, in 1961, the Duke of Edinburgh helped to found the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, and two years later, in 1963, on a visit to Australia, he would float the idea of a local branch of the World Wildlife Fund. In fact, it was from this suggestion that Prince Philip that led to the foundation of the Australian Conservation Foundation in 1965. Prince Philip was the foundation's president, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature's president, from 1971 to 1976. He was very passionate about many environmental issues, including in Australia. He spoke to a number of issues, from endangered species to the protection of the Great Barrier Reef. True to form, Prince Philip also acted in typical blunt style to urge the federal government in 1973 to act on protecting Kakadu by declaring it a special reserve. In a letter to former Prime Minister Gough Whitlam about environmental issues, he described the issue as, and I quote, probably the hottest of the potatoes. He was a friend to Australia and passionate about protecting Australia's unique natural beauty and our wildlife. But more than that, he had a genuine interest in and compassion for the people of Australia. Prince Philip made 22 tours to Australia. He was the royal representative who opened the Melbourne Olympics in 1956. From his first visit to Australia as a young sailor aboard the battleship Ramillies to his final tour in 2011, Prince Philip had an informality that endeared him to Australia. In December 1945, he spoke of his love for our country, the people and the food. Reflecting then that on his visit to Australia, he enjoyed the week in Tasmania best. It was reported that one of the many things Prince Philip had in love with Australians was a love of beer. It was fitting that in his 1967 visit, when Prince Philip toured the bushfire-ravaged Tasmania, he visited the Longley Hotel to enjoy a beer with the locals. 
He met with some of those who were badly affected in the township of Snug, south of Hobart, where 11 people had tragically lost their lives in the fires. He also on that occasion visited Taruna, Kingston and Margate. Prince Philip was mobbed every time he stepped out of his car during his tour of fire-affected areas of southern Tasmania, notwithstanding the tragedy and devastation those communities had endured. His informality and natural disposition towards the people of Tasmania placed him well as a comforter in a time of need, as it did in many other circumstances across the Commonwealth of Nations. He cared deeply for Australia, its natural beauty, wildlife, welfare and people. And Australians cared deeply for and respected Prince Philip. Prince Philip will be missed by all that knew him, met him or respected him from afar, but of course none more so than Her Majesty and their family. Today we give thanks for the sacrifices he made and the good that he did in the service of our nation and of free peoples across the world. We place on record our sincere gratitude for the service Prince Philip gave to the Commonwealth and extend our sincerest condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and to Prince Philip's family in their time of grief. I thank the Senate. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. In 1959, Prince Philip visited Kota Kinabalu, uh, my hometown, in what is now known as Malaysia, but was then part of British North Borneo. And large numbers of lo local schoolchildren lined up, ready to see him pass by. And I know that because amongst them was my father, Francis Wong. Following the death of Prince Philip. Dad, who's now 80, shared details of this event with me, and he told me that he was one of the La Salle students lining up at Tanjong Aru Beach, a beach I played on. This location was na later named Prince Philip Park, and a playground was built where Toby, my brother, and I would play on Sundays. And over 60 years later, Dad still remembers this visit. Of over the course of his long life, Prince Philip would have made thousands upon thousands of such visits thrust into the spotlight following the premature death of King George VI and his, the ascension of his wife to the throne. At the time of his retirement from official duties, his official engagements numbered over 22,000, and those don't include the ones in which he participated with Her Majesty the Queen. So there would be countless numbers of people in the same position as my father who vividly recall the time they saw Prince Philip on such an occasion. And this is a, just a small glimpse of the way so many individuals felt a personal co connection with Prince Philip through his life and work as a public figure. Prince Philip first visited Australia in 1940 as a midshipman in naval service, but he eventually became a regular visitor to our shores, visiting us on more than 30 occasions, at least half of these trips in his own capacity when he was not accompanying the Queen. Royal visits have maintained an enduring popularity in Australia, but they will probably never again reach the heights of the 1954 tour. On this visit with the Queen, it marked the first occasion a reigning monarch had visited Australia, and together they were greeted by unsurpassed crowds. Our population was then around 9 million people, and it is estimated some 75 per cent turned out to see the royal couple. Over the course of these many visits, Prince Philip has been to Australia, all Australian states and territories and ventured well beyond capital cities to many regional and country locations. He was present at events through our history, such as the Olympic Games in Melbourne, as my colleague has mentioned, the 62 Empire and Commonwealth Games in Perth, the 82 Commonwealth Games in Brisbane, and was part of the official opening in all three of these international sporting festivals. And we see reminders of his visits and his life across Australia. His name is recorded as opening such monuments as the Tasman Bridge in Hobart, the Gateway in Brisbane, the Royal Australian Mint here in Canberra, one of the power stations that forms part of Snowy, the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme, and amongst others, other, others the Prince Philip Theatre at Prince Alfred College in Adelaide recognising his 1992 visit to the school named for his predecessor as Duke of Edinburgh on the 125th anniversary of the laying of its foundation stone. Of particular resonance to many Australians was his support following times of natural disaster, such as in 1967 in the aftermath of the bushfires in Hobart, 
or the visit to Darwin with the Queen in 1977, just a few years following the devastation wreaked by Cyclone Tracy. And he made his final royal tour to Australia with the Queen in 2011. One of the most enduring legacies left by Prince Philip is through the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, a scheme which will continue as a living monument to his commitment to personal growth and development as well as to service. And since first being instituted some six decades ago, it has enhanced and expanded the lives of nearly 800,000 young Australians and counting. More than 130 countries have adopted the program with over 8 million young people having participated worldwide. So Prince Philip rightly regarded the award scheme as his greatest achievement. Although some associate him with the gilded life of a royal, Prince Philip's life was not always so comfortable or glamorous. As a baby, he was smuggled out of his native Corfu and into exile, concealed in an orange crate. He was abandoned by his father, his mother went into an asylum and his dear sister was killed in a plane crash and he was shuffled between countries and schools and languages. It was a life that demanded courage and fortitude. But he went on to become an eyewitness to many of the most significant events of the 20th century. He knew war and peace, empire and commonwealth, turbulence and tranquility. His life spanned a time that encompassed such great change. As a child in Malaysia, the legacy of British administration was all around me, in the names of places and buildings and streets, in the system of government, and in the stories told of that time. As you would expect, there were stories of mixed experience and emotion, of progress but also of limitation, of civil laws but also of, a, of injustice. My grandmother worked as a servant to a British family, and I'm a Republican. But regardless of this history or our views, we respect and honour service, and this was a life of service. During his many decades devoted to his Queen, his nation and the Commonwealth, Prince Philip also became an enduring part of the story of our nation, and his visits on many occasions enabled him to form many connections with Australia. His death brings to close, and of course, his death brings to close an extraordinary partnership. On many occasions, the Queen has spoken of how central and irreplaceable Prince Philip was to her. The Queen once said she owed her husband, I quote, a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. Like so many others, I was deeply moved by the image of the Queen sitting alone on a pew at her husband's funeral. The depth of her loss, so vivid. So we in the opposition, joined with the government and all senators across the chamber in making this address to Her Majesty the Queen and in conveying our sorrow and sympathy to her. And we extend our condolences to the royal family as well as those throughout the country and across the world who mourn the loss of a unique figure in the history of the Commonwealth of Nations. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. As Nationals Leader in the Senate, I would like to associate the National Senators uh, with the comments from both the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition. And I think um, the depth of feeling and the respectful tone and the breadth of topics covered by both of those speeches really speaks to the impact that Prince Philip had uh, on all of us, uh, Republican or monarchists um, alike. And we extend our sincere condolences to Her Majesty our Queen following the death of her consort. Prince Philip and our deepest sympathy to her family and the broader Commonwealth. On the 9th of April, Buckingham Palace announced the passing of Prince Philip at the age of 99, and I think uh, a lot of us were surprised by the depth of feeling and the reaction uh, right across Australia, from young people to old, all walks of life, uh, seemed a little rattled that someone that had been such a part of our life, of our history and our future um, was gone. Prince Philip loved Australia. He first sailed into Sydney Harbour on a Navy ship at the age of 18, and he'd then go on to visit us for another 20 times. He shared a lot of our values, and we've touched on his larrikinism, uh, his hard work ethic, um, and his Christian values. The Royal Tour of 1954 was huge for country residents here. 75 per cent of Australians turned out to see uh, Her Majesty and Prince Philip. And like Senator Wong's father, uh, my mum, as a young girl from a little country town called Alex, was one of them waving her flag proudly uh, as they drove past. 
but they travelled 70 cities and towns in that visit. And really, um, Australia fell in love with them as a couple and as our uh, monarchs at that time. Lots of country party leaders uh, were privileged to meet uh, Prince Philip. Mark Vale uh, said that he remembers having a great lunch with the Queen and Prince Philip and Edward, and he remembers Prince Philip at that lunch having very strong opinions and supporting the maintenance of the rights of the individual, uh, which is core to our beliefs in Australia. And it was not only that belief that he shared with National Party uh, senators and MPs and regional Australians. He was a great outdoorsman. He loved horse riding, shooting, fishing, gardening, and even in later years decided to turn his hand to farming, uh, producing produce that he'd sell at the local uh, store just down the road from what I'm sure was uh, bigger than a four-bedroom uh, fibro. There's a great story uh, in the ABC about when the Prince opened the Olympic Games in Melbourne back in 1956, and he reportedly went up to the Northern Territory, Senator McMahon, and shot a crocodile at night before going to inspect the uranium processing plant at Rum Jungle. Now, they are very, very National Party uh, things to do, but he, he was doing them not in uh, 2000. <laughs> Uh, and 21 is doing them right back in 1956. Very retro, are we? Uh, in his time hunting, he's known to have uh, shot a range of wildlife, uh, but in typical Fleet Street style. According to the UK Express, Prince Philip is believed to have had one of the highest kill rates of the royals. I don't know how that got in there, but uh, that's something they're known passionately for. It's safe to say that Philip was no well known for cooking up a barbecue or two in summer. He also developed a passion for horse carriage uh, driving later on and taking up the sport at 50. Uh, he was made ranger for Windsor Castle, which essentially meant he was in charge of running the farm. And as I said, he would often supply shops in the nearby village with the local produce. The BBC revealed that he even tried to use cow manure from the farm at Windsor to generate gas, but that wasn't as successful. It actually blew up. But that wasn't the only attempt at influencing energy policy, and Senator Canavan has helpfully given me a quote uh, from pr uh, Prince Philip that wind farms are absolutely useless, completely reliant on subsidies and an absolute disgrace. Uh, they never work as they need backup capacity, and as we're rolling out batteries, we, we know that is absolutely the truth. Prince Philip's life was a testament to hard work, grit and duty. Uh, and, and that is an attribute that all regional Australians can relate to. Apparently, um, you know, it wasn't all uh, steak dinners and fancy pants. Uh, apparently, Prince Philip was shoveling coal into a boiler room um, for so long that his blistered hands, apparently, according to him, couldn't hold a fork uh, while he was on the way back to England during the war whilst he was in the British Royal Navy. So this was a man that knew what it was like to work hard, that understood service and duty. Um, he was a bit of a larrikin, and whilst conducting royal duties, he often displayed a great sense of humour, and that is something that people that knew him have commented they will very, very uh, much miss. He was always able to put a smile on people's faces. Who can forget when he declared he was, and I quote, the world's most experienced plaque unveiler? Um, yes, he was a good hunter, and it was something he deeply cared about. Uh, but he was also uh, deeply cared about the environment, as Senator Birmingham ha um, has spoken about. Uh, he once said that if nature doesn't survive, neither will man. And we commit to do all we can, as selflessly and as restlessly as the Prince always did, to fix up uh, our relationship with nature that is threatening our food, fresh wa water and health supplies. And uh, as those that live and work out in the regions, we understand uh, that we need to be very good stewards of our land and water resources. He was also a man of deep Christian faith uh, and was also very, very generous. He was patron and president of more than 800 organisations and charities and demonstrated kindness and selflessness, showing loyalty to Her Majesty the Queen over seven decades. The Prince was the longest serving consort in royal history, a demonstration of reliability, and we know we can only imagine how much this constant in Her Majesty's life will be sorely missed. Uh, the Dean of Windsor, Reverend David Connor, recently said about Prince Philip, he's a bit controversial, certainly lively, but anything but boring. 
We need a bit more of that, I think. Uh, he also had a deep passion for helping young Australians and committed to better outcomes. And we've spoken about the Duke of Edinburgh's award, uh, some, an award which is across 130 countries and territories. Uh, and in Australia, more than 328,000 young people have gone through the award, which focuses on volunteerism, uh, a holistic approach to personal development, but importantly on the importance of duty and service. The Duke of Edinburgh exemplified courage, generosity and determination. Some would say they're old-fashioned values, but I would say uh, in an era of a pandemic they're values that more of us need to exemplify and take on board. He was an outstanding role model for us all. On behalf of the National Party in the Senate, we thank him deeply uh, for leading by example, for being a very good man behind the woman and uh, for giving her the love and support and uh, structure that she needed to be our queen and indeed uh, the leadership she's provided for the Commonwealth over a very, very long time. We offer our sympathies and prayers to the Royal Majesty, to our, um, Her Majesty the Queen uh, and her family. Thank you. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify our assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I call the Leader of the Government. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I move that as a mark of respect for the memory of His Royal Highness, the sitting of the Senate be suspended till 2 p.m. Put the motion. Those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank the senators. Uh, we will commence with um, documents before we go to question time. The clerk, the documents. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr. President, committees, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item five of today's order of business. I remind senators a question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call Senator Cash. 
you, Mr. President, and I table for the information of the Senate a revised ministry list, and I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on the 30th of March 2021. Updated representing arrangements are outlined in the ministry list. And, uh, Mr President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you. Uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time today, Tuesday the 11th of May 2021, due to budget arrangements. In Senator Birmingham's absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for the Public Service, the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer. Senator Payne will also be absent from question time this week, Tuesday the 11th, to Thursday, the 13th of May 2021, due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Payne's absence today, I will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Defence Industry, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, and the Minister for Defence Personnel. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Women. In Senator Payne's absence from Wednesday, the 12th of May, to Thursday, the 13th of May 2021. Senator Birmingham will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Defence Industry, the Minister for Veterans Affairs and the Minister for Defence Personnel. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Women. Thank you, Senator Cash. Questions without notice, Senator Ciccone. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. I think I'll be safe where this question is going. Um, my, my, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Coalition Senator Matt Cadavan has said that the Morrison government's decision to threaten stranded Australians in India with hefty fines and jail time is wrong. And that I'd also like to quote: "We have an obligation to help Australians." Does the minister agree with Senator Canavan? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Giacconi for his question. Uh, and, uh, senators in this chamber will be aware that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And as such, decisions are being made by the government, in particular to ensure that Australians are kept safe from the effects of COVID-19. Senator Giacconi, you will also be aware, as has been stated on many of an occasion, the decisions that the Morrison government makes in relation to COVID-19 are based on health advice. On the 22nd of April 2021, you will also be aware that India was designated a high-risk country by agreement, Mr President, of the National Cabinet. You would also have seen that on the 27th of April 2021, Cabinet National Security Committee, they did agree to pause direct passenger flights from India. Senator Coney, again, as you would be aware, this decision was reinforced by the decision made by the Minister for Health, as he is entitled to do, under subsection 4771 of the Biosecurity Act 2000. And 15. This decision, Mr. President, was made Order. on the basis of health advice. Mr. President, the Morrison government, the Prime Minister, and the Minister for Health have been very, very clear. Our first priority as a government must be to keep Australians safe. And in doing that, we will make decisions such as the one that the Minister for Health has made. But what we have also been very, very Order. clear on is this. The government will continue to review these measures, as we have said, Order. including the resumption of flights. Order. Senator Cash. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. And my first question is also reinforced by fellow Victorian Senator James Patterson, who has said criminalising Australians returning to their home country is a step too far. Does the minister agree with Senator Patterson? Order. Order. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I think, colleagues, you will understand as members of the coalition government that we are allowed to have our own opinions. Those opinions 
don't necessarily reflect the position of the government. Order. The government has made it very, Order. very clear. We will continue to make decisions in the Order. best interests of Australians, keeping Australians safe, and those decisions will be made on the basis of health advice. In terms of our position on India, the Prime Minister has made it very, very clear. Order the determination made by the Minister for Health it will end on Friday. And from that point in time, the government intends to continue to repatriate those in India to Australia. Order. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Look, thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, my last uh, question is to the minister. And look, Senator Canavan has also stated that we should be helping Aussies in India to return and not jailing them. Let's help fix our quarantine system rather than leave our fellow Australians stranded. And that is what Senator Order. Canavan has said. Order. Even members of your own Order. government are calling for the Prime Minister to deliver a safe national quarantine to bring Aussies home. Why Order, won't Senator Mr Morrison do so? Order. Before I call Senator Cash, there were interjections across the chamber. Senator McKenzie, Senator Wong, I'm going to insist on silence during questions so that I and the minister may hear them. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Ciccone, you would be aware that the Morrison government's top priority is supporting Australians to return in the midst of what is a global pandemic. But at the same time, Order. Mr. President, whilst ensuring the safety of the Australian community. We make no excuses. Order. Senator Cash, I've sent a warrant a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. We've had two questions where the minister did not respond to the quote, and you know, we've respected your ruling previously. But this is a question. Order. Well, this is Can a I... question which goes to order. safe national. I, I understand why you're a bit grumpy this week. Point of order, order in silence, Senator. Um, this is a question which goes to uh, Senator Canavan's demand that the Prime Minister fix safe national quarantine. I'd ask the minister to return to that question. The minister has been speaking for 22 seconds. I, as I made the point earlier, struggled to hear all of the question myself with interjections across the chamber. Um, I'll listen to the minister carefully and I'll call the minister to continue. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And the chamber will be aware that in March 2020, National Cabinet determined that all travellers arriving in Australia will be required to undertake their mandatory 14-day isolation Order. at a designated facility. Those requirements, Mr President, as Australians are well aware, were agreed through the National Cabinet process to be implemented under state Senator Cash, Senator and Wong territory. Point of order. Senator point of order. Why won't Mr Morrison fix safe national quarantine? That is the question. The, Senator Wong, um, with respect, um, I appreciate you restating that part of the question because that was part of it I didn't hear earlier. I think Senator Cash, by speaking to the issue directly, there's a time to debate the merit of answers after question time. Senator Cash. Well, Senator Wong would be aware that hotel quarantine itself has actually been tremendously successful at preventing outbreaks in the broader community, preventing breaches at a rate of 99.9%. Order, .9 Senator Cash. Time for the answer has expired. Order. Order. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is also to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. The Morrison government's economic plan has helped Australia lead the world in recovering from the COVID-19 recession. How is the government securing Australia's recovery and supporting economic growth and jobs creation going forward? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for the question. And Mr. President, the Australian economy has well and truly demonstrated remarkable resilience in the face of COVID-19. And on any analysis, and as will be outlined tonight by the Treasurer when he delivers his next budget, the outlook is positive. Mr. President, in particular in relation to employment in Australia. The Morrison government is committed to getting more Australians into jobs. And what we have seen in relation to employment levels is they have recovered since the sharp fall associated with the initial impacts of COVID-19. And in fact, what we are seeing today 
As the Treasurer hands down his budget for tonight is more Australians are now employed today than there were prior to COVID-19. Mr President, in particular, colleagues, labour market conditions have substantially, substantially improved over the last six months. Employment increased in October of last year 176,000 800 persons. In November, 86,200 persons. In December, 46,300 persons. In January, 29,500 persons. In February, 88,700. And colleagues, in March, the most recent Labor force figures, 70,700. What we have now seen, Mr. President, is employment has now risen by 947,000. 100 persons from May 2020 to March 2021. And what we have seen in relation to the unemployment rate, it has declined to 5.6 per cent in March 2021, from a peak of 7.5 per cent, if you recall, colleagues, in July 2020, but also considerably lower than what Treasury had estimated first, which was 15 per cent. So in relation to employment, the jobs are Order. returning Senator to the Cash. labour market. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the government continue to support our economy to recover from the once-in-a-century economic shock caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government's economic plan it is working. But as the Prime Minister and the Treasurer remind Australians, we are not yet out of the pandemic. We are better placed than most other countries in the world to meet the challenges that lie ahead. And in terms of the budget that the Treasurer will set out tonight, that will set out the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan to secure Australia's recovery. Mr President, what we will be focused on in our budget is further measures to create jobs, guaranteeing the essential services that Australians rely on, but also building a more resilient and secure Australia. We have already announced, as part of the budget, a $1.7 billion investment in childcare. That is all about boosting workforce participation. In terms of women's health, $353 million invested to support women's health, and of course, $1.2 billion as part Order. of our digital Senator economy Cash. strategy. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. How has the government supported businesses to retain apprentices and help deliver more skilled workers for Australian businesses? Order, Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as you know. In terms of an economic downturn, in terms of a pandemic, the first people to be let go are apprentices and trainees. And that's why the Morrison government put in place policies to ensure that businesses who had employee uh, apprentices and trainees were able to keep them on at the beginning of the pandemic. What we have now seen as a result of our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy is 123,000 apprentices have been kept on since the beginning of COVID-19. But, Mr President, we've gone further than that. We've gone further than that, and we've, of course, put in place our Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements wage subsidy. We wanted to actually bring on 100,000 new apprentices in a 12-month period. I'm pleased to inform the Chamber that we did that in less than five months. We have now extended that wage subsidy, and to date, colleagues, over 140,000 new commencements, new apprentices and trainees have now been brought Order. on. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. I refer to reports of the tragic death of 23-year-old Liam Danher, who died waiting for a seizure mat. The NDIS repeatedly rejected Liam's request for a seizure mat over the course of an 18-month-long AAT battle. His family say a $445 seizure mat would have saved his life. Why was Liam's seizure mat rejected? How many thousands of taxpayer dollars did the Morrison government spend on legal advice and lawyers to deny Liam his $445 seizure mat? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for that question. Um, that is a very tragic case, and I have been in contact with Liam's father, who I will be meeting uh, at his convenience, 
Um, I am still seeking further uh, information on his case. It is complex. Uh, the trustee is also involved. So, um, in, in the process of getting further information, so in the first instance, I can uh, discuss the matter with his father, uh, and then provide more information uh, as, as is appropriate to do so on individual cases. Senator, I, I think Senator, Senator, sorry, I've got to check if Senator Senator Reynolds, I think, had resumed her seat. Um, have you resumed your seat, Senator Reynolds? I'll, I'll call you to ask your supplementary. You can do that as part of that, Senator Kitching. Okay. Well, then, how much was a, could you answer the question about what you spent in legal costs? The seizure mat Liam Danher died waiting for was recommended by three different allied health professionals, a neurologist and an independent assessor, as I'm sure you're aware if you've spoken with Liam's father. Why then did the National Disability Insurance Agency still deny Liam the support he needed? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I'll have to take on notice, Senator, the legal costs, but I will get back to you uh, as soon as I can. And look, if I could, can I reiterate my condolences uh, to Mr. Danaher's family? Uh, any death of a child is always tragic. And as I've said, I've offered to meet and I've been in touch with his father, and I'm seeking some more information for him, uh, which I will meet in person to pass on to him. Um, I understand that Liam did receive support from the NDIS from the 9th of May until the 5th, 2019 to the 5th of February 2021, but at this stage I'm unable to provide uh, any further advice. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Um, as you say, Minister, the death of any child is tragic. This was, an this was an avoidable death if he had received the support. Why did the National Disability Insurance Agency cont contact the grieving Danher family requesting urgent quotes for the very seizure mat that would have saved their son's, son Liam's life a week after his death? Hassam, you've contacted the father, Mr, Mr. Danher. Um, did you apologise in that when you contacted him? If yes, when did you do that in that phone call? If not, Order. why not? Senator why haven't Kitching. you apologised? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you, and I, I did just uh, apologise. So, just to be clear, my office has contacted Mr. Mr. Absolutely, of course, I apologise. Any any death of any child is well. If you let me, fi if you let Sorry, me finish, Reynolds, I'd I have... be happy to, to answer the question. So, I've got so I've got to take the point of order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Kitching, on a point of I'd order. I'd like to know because it was unclear whether Senator Reynolds is apologising now to the Danher family, well, Senator, or as my Senator, question stated, that, Senator, Senator was it Kitching, was it in Senator, the phone Senator call Kitching, with please, Mr. Um, the minister has been speaking for 10 seconds. Um, I can't allow you to re-ask part of the question. You can raise a point of order on direct relevance. At this point, I think the minister was being um, directly relevant. There's an opportunity to debate it after question time. Senator Reynolds. Look, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said, uh, I'm not able to discuss the, the details of this case any further. The NDIA chief legal counsel is currently reviewing the case and will be providing a report on that. My office has been in touch with Mr Danher, and who is currently relocating, and I will be meeting with him at his convenience. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Trade, Senator Cash. Minister, globally, thousands are dying from COVID-19 each day because they don't have treatment or vaccines. At the same time, majority white Western countries like ours are hoarding vaccines and ordering more than they will ever need. The TRIPS waiver proposal to the World Trade Organization would temporarily lift in intellectual property restrictions so poorer countries can manufacture vital vaccines, medicines, masks and ventilators. But since October, the Liberal National Government has ignored the pleas of more than 100 countries for our support. Australia has stonewalled and advocated against the waiver, putting profit ahead of the lives of people that look like me in countries that you don't give a damn about. Why won't the government give its unequivocal support to the TRIPS waiver? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Faruqi for her question. And, uh, 
Senator Faruqi, whilst I understand the sentiment of your question, I am actually going to disagree with the comments uh, you've made in relation to the government. Uh, in relation to the position on the waiver, uh, I will take that on notice and seek further information from, uh, for you from the relevant minister. Uh, but what I would say is this, and in particular when it comes to, say, countries like India, uh, and certainly I've met with the Indian community in terms of um, what they've raised on the waiver, but also countries, for example, in the Pacific. What Australia is doing uh, is working with them to ensure that they do have access to the vaccinations that they need. Uh, as you would know, just in relation to India, um, that country itself has shown great leadership, not just to Australia, but globally, their generosity throughout the pandemic. In fact, they have exported over 66 million vaccines globally, as you would know. In terms of the Pacific itself, when you look at India and you look at the number of vaccines that they themselves have also donated to countries, say, Nauru and to Fiji. And what the government's position is, has been articulated by the Prime Minister, is it is now time for the world to repay that generosity. Um, and Australia, in terms of working with India in this case, is well and truly going to play its part. Uh, as you know, we have made a commitment to India in relation to essential medical supplies uh, as part of the Australian government's initial package to assist India as it battles COVID-19. And part of that includes over 1,000 ventilators and 43 oxygen concentrators. Uh, we are doing at this point in time what we can, identifying with the Indian government Order. its Senator needs. Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. The Morrison government is increasingly isolated in its morally indefensible opposition to the TRIPS waiver. Now that the US, New Zealand Order. and French Order. governments Order. Sorry, I'm going to. I need to be able to hear the question, Senator Faruqi. I'm going to ask you to start the question again because there were interjections across the chamber and I couldn't hear it, Senator Faruqi. The Morrison government is increasingly isolated in its morally indefensible opposition to the TRIPS waiver. Now that the U.S., New Zealand, and French governments have given clear support, Australia is one of the few remaining blockers to a proposal that would be hugely helpful in alleviating the global shortage of COVID-19 vaccines. Why does the Liberal National Government care more about safeguarding corporate profits than they do about saving lives? Bloody good question. Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President, Senator Faruqi, I don't think it's going to come as any surprise to you uh, that I disagree with what you have now stated on the record. Uh, what the Prime Minister has said in terms of the TRIPS waiver is that the US announcement was tremendous news. That is what the Prime Minister has said. The Prime Minister has also made it clear that we will continue to work with the United States and others at the WTO to find solutions that boost the global rollout of COVID-19 vaccinations. But Senator Faruqi, the Prime Minister, has also made clear that Australia remains focused on working with our regional partners, and I commend the work that both Senator Payne, uh, Mr Tian and Mr Hunt are doing in that regard, um, and vaccine developers to support equitable, widespread access Order, to COVID-19 vaccines. Senator vaccine. Faruqi, a final supplementary question. The government should be leading the support for the TRIPS yeah. waiver and broader measures to ensure everyone, everywhere, has access to treatment and vaccines. Instead, you've left people stranded, threatened them with jail should they try and come home, and still you persist in denying countries like India the chance to manufacture vaccines that could save lives. So my question is, where is your humanity? Have you no shame at all? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, Again, Senator Faruqi, it will come as no surprise to you uh, that I fundamentally disagree uh, with what you have said, and in particular, uh, what you have insinuated in relation to the government. Uh, Australia, as I have said, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, as Senator Payne uh, continues to work on, we remain focused on working with 
our regional partners and vaccine developers to support equitable, widespread access to COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, in particular, the development of COVID-19 vaccines through voluntary mechanisms in partnership with vaccine developers, that is our best chance of delivering widespread, equitable access. But as you know, we are working with our Pacific neighbours in terms of ensuring their access to vaccines. Uh, the government is working with our partners to ensure the Pacific and Timor-Leste state. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Rustin. Could the minister please advise the Senate how the Morrison government is securing Australia's recovery by supporting home buyers and construction jobs in the housing sector, including through the Family Home Guarantee, which will allow single parents to enter or re-enter the housing market? The minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question, because this is an absolutely fantastic new initiative. It's an initiative that is included as part of a suite of measures that are in the budget, because we're all about supporting Australians. And we know that single-parent households um, have lower ownership rates than dual, um, dual owners or dual occupants. Uh, and we want to make sure that we support them to jump the biggest hurdle to home ownership, and that is saving for the deposit. So the Morrison government is putting in place the, the family home guarantee so that single parents are able to secure finance with only up to 2 per cent of their deposit. And the government will act as the guarantor for the other 18 per cent. And in doing so, we want to make sure that we tell single parent Australians that we stand side by side with them in their, supporting them in their commitment and their aspirations to realise their dream of home ownership. So this will allow um, single eligible parents seeking to enter or re-enter the housing market to provide a secure home environment for themselves and for their children. Um, in 2021-22, we believe that around 125,000 uh, single uh, parent homes will be eligible to get access to the family um, home guarantee. And I would encourage every single person in the chamber, whether it be this side, that side or down the other end, to tell your constituents about the benefit that this Order. can deliver for your, your uh, um, constituents. Senator Watt, and Senator I'd also Sizelja. like to acknowledge um, the huge amount of work that has been done by the Minister for Economic Order. Security, Senator, uh, Senator, Senator uh, Hume, because we know that the overwhelming majority that this particular initiative is going to be able to support will be women, because we know of the 125,000 um, households that will be eligible for this, 105,000 of them will have women as the sole parent in the household. Um, we also know that 47 per cent of single parent uh, families rent from a Order. private landlord. Senator Ruskin, as time for the answer has dual. expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, Senator, how will the new home guarantee continue to support Australians along with measures like Home Builder? Order. Senator Ruskin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the, uh, the measure is uh, going to help Australians, but it's going to help particularly young Australians, Senator Henderson, to invest in their future, future by extending the, ho the new home guarantee. Order. The extension will provide an additional 10,000 guarantees in the 21-22 year, allowing first homeowners to either build a new home or move into a newly built home with a deposit for as little as 5 per cent. The other 15 per cent will be underwritten by the government. The new home guarantee has proved extraordinarily popular and particularly popular in enabling young Australians to be able to get into their first home much earlier. Senator Watt. 51 per cent of the guarantees that we've put in place today Senator have Watt. gone to people under the age of 30. So this is a hugely positive um, program and it works alongside the Home Builder program, which equally has been very successful, not only being able to provide access to home ownership, but also to stimulate the construction industry. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr President. What other programs has the government announced which will continue to support Australians to purchase their first home? Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, this government is absolutely committed to supporting Australians in their dream to own their own home. And so to do so, we've made sure that we have a suite of measures because not everybody is going to want to have the same measure. As an example, Senator Henderson, um, the uh, first homeowner super saver scheme, which previously we only allowed $30,000 to be paid into it, we've increased that to $50,000. Once again, making that deposit just that much more realisable for young Australians who want to get into their own home. But it will also make sure that we can assist them in saving that deposit more quickly. Um, the first, homeowner, um, first home super saver scheme uh, was assessed by, has been accessed by about 18,500 new home buyers since 1 July 2018. But we are absolutely committed, absolutely committed, Senator Henderson, to make sure that Australians who want to own their own home are given the easiest possible pathway to realise that, because it is the Australian dream. Order. Senator Keneally. For industrial relations, Senator Cash. Within weeks of being appointed to the new portfolios of Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations, the Minister appointed Ms. Alana Matheson, a former Liberal Party Deputy Mayor of Campbelltown, to a 26 year long, $10 million post. 26 years, $10 million post at the Fair Work Commission. Can the minister confirm that Ms. Matheson is just one of 13 former Liberal MPs and political staffers who have been appointed to the Plum federal government jobs since the start of this year? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator Keneally for the question. And Senator Keneally, uh, what I can confirm is this: uh, all appointments that are made by the Morrison government, uh, in fact all appointments made by the coalition government since we were elected in 2013 have been based on merit. So I completely, totally and utterly reject the accusations that you Order. are making. Mr Order. President, whether it is a federal court appointment, whether it is a Fair Work Commission appointment, whether it is an AAT appointment or any other appointment. We carefully and we methodically look through candidates to ensure that the most suitable candidate is actually appointed to the role. But, colleagues, you see, this is where the Labor Party want to have their cake and eat it as well. Because, you see, what they are now saying is this. At Order. times we've appointed those from a different political persuasion because our government believed, unlike clearly Labor, that they were the best people for the role. For example, let's hear the comments they have on Anna Burke, the former Labor member as Speaker, Order. appointed to the AAT colleagues in 2017. Was she not the best person for the role? Linda Kirk, former Labor Senator for South Australia, AAT 2017. John Black, Former Labor Senator for Queensland, AAT 2017. Order. David Cox, Order. former Labor member for Kingston, appointed to the AAT in 2019. All because we just don't appoint like you do. John Rowell, Amanda Mendes de Costa. Oh, this one, I've actually used to uh, work with this gentleman, Philip Deladakis. Gary Gray, on any analysis, Order. Gary Gray was an outstanding representative, and that is why we appointed him as the ambassador to Ireland and the Holy See. Because we thought he was Order, the best Senator person Cash. for the I'm role. I'm going to ask all. I'm going to ask all senators to try to exercise some self-restraint in our first day back in their new seats. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As the Deputy Director of Workplace Relations at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Ms Matheson opposed domestic violence leave, arguing that victim survivors get enough support already. Was this position one of the reasons the Minister appointed Ms Matheson to the Commission, to help prevent the expansion of support for victims and survivors of domestic violence? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I could continue with the list of former Labor members uh, that we on this side of the chamber have appointed uh, to whether it be the AAT, etc., or the Fair Work Commission, or to or as Ambassador Order. for Ireland. Senator, Senator Cash, 
or what I said to Cash, I have said to Keneally on a point of order. Thank you. I just relevance. The question was specifically about Ms. Matheson's views on domestic violence and whether or not the minister supported them, and is why she appointed her. Thank you. Um, I believe the minister had just said that she was turning to something. Um, I'll listen carefully to the answer. The minister can speak about any aspect of this appointment, in my view, and be directly relevant. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. You see, those on the other side don't understand that the employment relationship includes both employers and employees. And that is why you need to ensure that employers are represented on the Fair Work Commission as well as employees. And in relation to Alana Matheson, she is qualified for this role. She has. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, I, I possibly should have jumped when you when you gave as wide a ruling as you did in response to my colleague, where you said I think that anything related to the appointment was relevant to the supplementary. With with respect, I ask you to reconsider that. I don't believe that's consistent with the standing orders nor your previous rulings. This question relates to Ms Matheson's views on domestic violence leave, and I ask that the minister be required or respond and be directly relevant to that point. Um, I, I take the point, Senator Wong. I could have worded what I said more carefully. However, I will say that the part, final part of the question my notes reflect is, was this position one of the reasons that referred to the appointment? I think in answering that question, the minister is allowed to talk about the specific appointment without necessarily uh, specifically outlining a particular issue. That may be debated after question time. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In terms of Ms. Matheson, uh, she is well and truly appointed on merit. She has 15 years' experience in workplace relations, including recent roles as Director of Workplace Relations Advisory at KPMG Australia and Deputy Director of Workplace Relations at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She has also played a prominent role on the international stage Order, at Senator the International Cash. Labor Organisation. Senator Cash, uh, Keneally, a final supplementary question. How can Australians have faith in this minister's judgment and integrity when she refused to cooperate fully with the AFP into its investigation into criminal, possible criminal conduct by her own staff? But she prioritises appointing yet another Liberal mate for life. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I completely reject um, what Senator Keneally has said. And Senator Keneally would know that that is not what uh, is certainly Order. outlined in the evidence. But again, what I would say, Mr. President, is this: in relation to the appointments that this government makes, appointments are made on merit. Order. And as I've said. We have also appointed, over a period of time, a number of persons of a different political persuasion, in other words, from the Labor Party, because we believed they were the best person for the role. And in particular, I go back to Mr Gary Gray. He actually was an outstanding member uh, for Brand back in Western Australia. Uh, when he left the parliament, I think those from Western Australia would say, we worked incredibly well. Uh, with Mr Gray in relation to representing our great state. And as a result of that, the government appointed him as the ambassador to Ireland. I confirm he was not a Order. member of Senator the Liberal Cash. Party. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Regional Communications and Local Government, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is securing Australia's recovery, which means we can deliver better health outcomes for regional Australia, like our plans for an increased bulk billing incentive for GPs? Minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator McKenzie, for her question. Mr President, we all understand Senator Mackenzie is passionate about rural and regional Australia, like those of us who live in the regions. So, Mr President, um, and Mr. Senator Mackenzie, I know you will be pleased that the coalition government is committed to improving the affordability of health care in remote areas. As a part of tonight's budget, we will be, we will be investing $65.8 million to boost bulk billing rebates from 1 January 2022 through an increase in the rural bulk billing incentive. Bulk billing doctors outside of metropolitan areas currently receive 150 per cent of the bulk base billing incentive payment. This will be increased based on how remote the practice is 
as determined by the modified Monash model of assessment. The more remote the area, the greater the incentive payment the GP will receive. Large and medium rural locations, MM3 to 4, will receive an incentive of 160 per cent. Mr. President. Rural locations, MM5, will receive an incentive of 170 per cent. Mr. President. Rural locations, MM6, will receive an incentive of 180 per cent. And very remote locations, MM7, will receive an incentive of 190 per cent. Mr. President. This means that from 1 January 2022, doctors practising in rural and remote areas will be able to receive an incentive payment of up to $12.35 per consultation. And Mr President, these changes recognise the ongoing need to provide the right incentives for the health workforce in rural and remote areas of Australia. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. I do, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate how GPs in rural and remote areas face greater complexities and challenges, and what measures the government is putting in place to assist GPs and their patients? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McKenzie, for the supplementary question. Doctors in the bush face greater burden of responsibility, more complex care situations and high rates of chronic disease compared with doctors in the cities, who can rely on the support from other medical services and facilities. Mr. President. The coalition government understands that GPs face greater health complexities and challenges in rural and remote areas, which is why then more than 10,000 rural and remote GPs will be eligible for the higher bulk billing incentive. Mr. President. Bulk billing is an important component of the Medicare system and, and outside metropolitan areas, many doctors rely on the additional incentive for each consultation to help ends, make, ends meet for their clinics. Mr. President, the new rural bulk billing model will encourage more doctors to consider a career in rural practice. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister advise the Senate on the government's 10-year stronger rural health strategy? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a pity that the opposition seem to be so glib about an important issue. The stronger regional health strategy Order. aims to build sustainable, high-quality health workforce access across our country, Senator according to community need, particularly, Mr. President, in rural and remote areas. The Order. new rural incentive rates are another key reform Senator that we have delivered to attract more doctors to the bush and is a key investment in the coalition's 10-year stronger rural health strategy. We know there isn't a single solution to, to solving rural doctor shortages, and that's why the government, Mr. President, continues to work on a range of practical workforce training and primary care reforms, with the aim, Mr. President, to create more sustainable community health care services in rural and remote communities. The strategy also enables a stronger role for nurses and allied health professionals in the delivery of more multidisciplinary Order, health team-based models. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question is to the minister representing the Minister for Defence. My question is asked in the context uh, of the call on Saturday by the editor-in-chief of the Chinese state-controlled news outlet The Global Times for the Chinese military to develop plans for, and I quote, long-range strikes on the military facilities and key, relevant key facilities on Australian soil. Can the minister confirm that all of Australia's major cities are within the known range of China's growing DF-31, DF-31A and J-2 ballistic missile forces? Is it not the case that Northern Australia is now well within the strike, missile strike range of Chinese long-range Xi'an uh, H-6 cruise missile arm bombers? How significant does the government consider these new strategic circumstances to be? Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patrick uh, for the question. Uh, Senator Patrick, I can provide you with the following information. Um, the government, as you would be aware, has recognised Australia's more complex and dynamic strategic environment 
through the 2020 Defence Strategic Update. The proliferation of ballistic missiles and other long-range weapons is one element of this evolution, but it is not the only change to our nation's strategic circumstances. Uh, you would be aware that the reality is that Australia has lived under the possible threat of intercontinental ballistic nuclear missile threats now for many, many decades. A key element of Australia's strategy to counter this threat is the alliance with the United States, which incorporates extended deterrence, but also uh, actually marks its 70th anniversary this year. Uh, in terms of the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, uh, you may be aware it also notes that the nature of current and future threats requires defence to develop a different set of capabilities for the future. Defence is preparing for these threats through adjustments to force structure that will ensure the defence force can shape Australia's strategic environment, deliver credible deterrence and respond to challenges against our interests. Defence is investing in more potent capabilities and will hold adversary forces and infrastructure at risk further from Australia, including autonomous systems, missile defence and advanced strike capabilities, including hypersonics. Senator Patrick, supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister representing advise what capabilities the Australian Defence Force has in its current inventory that, in the event of major hostilities in the Western Pacific region, protect Australian cities from missile strikes from China? Does Australia currently possess any anti-ballistic missile systems capable of intercepting long-range mi ballistic missiles such as the DF-31, the DF-31A uh, or, or the J-2? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and again, Senator Patrick, I can provide you with the following information. The Australian government is investing more than $270 billion to upgrade the capabilities of the Australian Defence Force. We are also engaging our allies and partners to ensure the peaceful development of our region. We are working in forums including the missile technology control regime and other measures to prevent the proliferation of ballistic missile technologies. Uh, but it is the case that advanced intercontinental ballistic missiles are very difficult to defend against. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Can the minister uh, representing advise uh, what are the government's uh, plans, if any, for the acquisition of anti-ballistic missile capabilities capable of defending Australia, Australia's major cities from long-range missile attack? When will any such capability be operational? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator Patrick, I can advise the Force Structure Plan 2020 outlines government's plans for investment in integrated air and missile defence systems. Funding is planned mid-decade, seeking capability by the end of the decade. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Government Services, Senator Reynolds. The Minister has said she is assisting the AFP with their inquiry into the alleged rape of Ms Higgins in her office by one of her other staff members. Given the minister's colleague and now acting leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Cash, refused to submit to an interview by the AFP, will the minister commit to fully cooperating with the Australian Federal Police in their investigation, including submitting herself to an interview if requested? The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, and I thank the senator for the question. And in short, the answer is yes. I've always said in this chamber uh, that I stand ready to assist Ms Higgins and the current AFP investigation. Um, I have been careful at all times not to prejudice the investigation, and I can confirm that I am in touch uh, with the AFP investigators, and I am preparing a statement, and if asked, I will certainly uh, be, be interviewed by them. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister tell the Senate why she called her former staff member, Ms Higgins, and I quote, a lying cow? Senator Reynolds. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for that question again. And I think that question has been asked and answered many times. And I have, and I have, I have settled with, come to some arrangement uh, with Ms. Higgins, and I don't intend to say anything further. Senator McAllister, final supplementary question. Thank you. Did the minister offer her resignation to the Prime Minister for calling Ms Higgins a lying cow and for mishandling the response to the alleged rape? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, I really have nothing further to add uh, than what I've said previously in this chamber. I, I will do nothing. I said back then I'll do nothing to prejudice the AFP investigation, and in fact I'll be assisting it. And that, and that I will continue to do. Order, uh, any... Senator Reynolds, I have Senator McAllister on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. It, the, uh, my point of order is relevance. The minister has been asked whether or not she offered her resignation to the prime minister on one of two grounds, and I am seeking a straightforward answer to that question of fact. Um, I remind the minister with a question, noting that she has 41 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Reynolds. Uh, what I can tell you about my conversations with the Prime Minister is when I became extremely unwell and ended up in hospital, uh, the Prime Minister was absolutely superb. I had a number of conversations with him. I had a number of conversations with him on a regular basis uh, about a range of issues, including my health. And the, the nature of those discussions between myself and the Prime Minister will remain between the Prime Minister and myself. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. And how is the Morrison government securing Australia's recovery, which means we can guarantee the NDIS and ensure it is fully funded now and into the future? Minister for the National Insurance Scheme, Senator. National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for your question. On behalf of the 10,270 Tasmanians who now have a package on this scheme, I am incredibly proud to now be the minister with stewardship of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in what is uh, a very pivotal time in the scheme's history. Uh, today, this scheme which has been replicated by no other country in the world. This, we, have, we, have delivered, we have delivered the scheme. There's now 450,000 Australians with plans. And the intent of the NDIS was to shift funding to individuals directly rather and away from block Order, funding Senator to organisations, thereby giving participants with significant and permanent disability more choice and control over their own lives. Which, is, which are fundamental values of those on this side of the chamber. But we are now at a point in history where we must work together. And can I just say we have to work together across the chamber, across the aisle, to ensure that we can implement a range of strategies that will ensure this scheme endures. Reasonable and necessary supports must come with some boundaries, boundaries to ensure the scheme is affordable, but most importantly, what I have heard from participants so far is so the scheme is transparent, respectful and fair to all participants. Despite uh, the interjections from those opposite, this government is fully funding this scheme and we are fully committed to its enduring for many generations well beyond our own lifetimes. Last week, the Prime Minister announced an additional $13.2 billion out to 2023-24, uh, which he will be announcing formally in the budget tonight. Now, this reflects an absolute unwavering commitment by this side of the chamber to this Order, scheme. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Why is it important to secure the long-term sustainability of the NDIS? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Askew again for the question. While the NDIS has been life-changing for 450,000 Australians, we also need to realise a scheme that can financially endure, as I've said, for many generations to come. Participants entering from the states and territory schemes are today receiving 50 per cent more support on average than they were when they transferred into the scheme. 
And at the moment, the cost of the NDIS are increasing far more quickly than we ever anticipated. For example, the average pay payment per participant has increased by 48 per cent on average over the last three years, from 2017 to 2020, and the average plan budget has increased by 22 per cent over that same three years. For example, 450 participants receive support packages over a million dollars a year, and the numbers are far greater today than the 2011 Productivity Order. Commission. Senator Reynolds, Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what is the government doing? To Order. Minister Senator Askew has the call. Order on my left. Senator Ayres. Minister, what is the government doing to ensure the NDIS is the best it can be for generations to come? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, thank you, Senator Askew. Since becoming the Minister for the NDIS just over a month ago, I have been extensively consulting with the disability sector, with participants, with providers, uh, with those with lived experience, and of course my state and territory counterparts, including a number of people in this chamber. And I thank you very much uh, for that support. I've made it clear I'll consult on the proposed reforms and wait for the conclusion of the independent assessment trial and discuss the way forward late July with my state and territory counterparts, who, unlike those opposite, have been incredibly, incredibly supportive and bipartisan in their approach to the future of this scheme. We have a window of opportunity now to introduce important reforms and to work collaboratively, not only together but also with the disability sector, so that we can make sure the NDIS endures. And I'll finish, if I've got time, very quickly on Julia Gillard back in 2011. Order. Senator Reynolds, time for the for next answer time. Thank has you, Mr. expired. Senator Waters. Can't wait. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Resources Minister, who I believe is Minister Rustin. We are in a climate emergency, yet in this government, the government is reportedly once again pouring billions of dollars into propping up fossil fuels, including gas, threatening our country's economy, our people and nature. Why does your government remain in the pocket of the fossil fuel corporations and the mining billionaires? Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Waters for her question. Um, however, the difficulty I'm going to have in answering it is because it actually isn't correct, her, the assumptions and statements that she has just made. The Australian government remains absolutely committed to ensure that we have a system in Australia where Australians are able to access affordable and reliable energy, but at the same time making sure that we meet our obligations and in every instance as Australia we have always met our international obligations when it comes to the issue of, uh, of carbon emissions. And it will make no difference, I'm sure, whatever I say in this place, um, that it will not be accepted at the other end of the chamber. But we are absolutely committed to being completely agnostic around how we deal with this issue. What we are absolutely focused on is is that we know the application of technology and not taxes is the way that we can ensure a secure future for Australia, for Australian businesses, for Australian uh, taxpayers, for Australian households, for all Australians. And I think everybody on this side of the chamber would be as committed as anybody else in Australia to make sure that we play our role in making sure that carbon emissions and the future of our planet is secure. But we are not going to do it just on a whim, the, the, the kind of uh, propositions that get put forward by the Greens. We will do it systematically based on the science that's provided to us. We will do it in a way that we can apply technology because we are the most innovative country in the world. And the fact that we are able to apply that innovation in such a way, we are the envy of the rest of the world. And we will continue to do that because we believe that the most important thing that we can do as a government is be responsible. We need to be responsible to make sure affordable and reliable power is available because our economic recovery will not be successful unless Australian businesses and Australian consumers are able to get access to the energy that they need for the recovery. But I can absolutely assure you this government is committed to doing so within the responsibility we have for global climate 
emissions. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Minister, can you confirm Australia Institute figures that fossil fuel subsidies from the federal government cost Australians a staggering $9.13 billion in the current financial year, which means for every minute of every day, $17,378 of public money was given to coal, oil and gas companies and major users of fossil fuels every second of every day. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. What I can tell uh, Senator Waters is that this government is absolutely committed to investing in the technologies of the future. We're absolutely committed in making sure that we provide the appropriate frameworks so that the investment that is being made by our modern technology sector can meet the requirements of the Australian economy and Australian households, whilst at the same time we can secure uh, the future that we want for our children. So, I can absolutely commit that, uh, that both Minister Taylor as the Minister for Energy and Minister Pitt, who is the Minister for Resources, are absolutely committed to working um, on order. to, to Senator put Waters, I have Senator Rustin, I have Senator Waters on a point of order. Yes, thank you, President. Look, it is on relevance. The question went to the quantum of fossil fuel subsidies, and the answer bears no resemblance to um, that question. Yeah, um, Senator Waters, I, I, I take your point. The question I can't instruct the minister to address a specific part of a question, but the, part, the question was about um, a claim and a report with respect to claim subsidies to fossil fuels. So I, I do remind the minister of that part of the question, Senator. Rustin. Look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And in response to the primary component of the question that Senator Waters just uh, 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 drew my attention to, um, you know, there are any amount of numbers that you could extract from any amount of, uh, of uh, data analysis if you chose to do so. And the Greens actually do have a rather extra astounding, astounding track record of being able to extract the most unbelievable statistics out of uh, uh, the information that's provided to them. Order, Senator Rustin. <coughs> Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Does this ideological attachment to fossil fuels explain why Resources Minister Keith Pitt recently vetoed federal funding for a wind farm proposal in my home state of Queensland, and why he couldn't bring himself to utter the word battery and answer yes to the simple question of whether batteries can back up wind farms? Minister, can you now confirm whether batteries can back up wind farms? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, what I can say is that, uh, that Minister Pitt takes very, very seriously his responsibility and obligations as the minister um, who is responsible for the NAIF to make sure that when he gives approval for particular projects, that he is entirely satisfied that those projects can deliver the outcome that they're seeking. Minister Pitt um, has already committed to, uh, I think, even this morning, to say that he is going to provide his statement of reasons why he chose not to approve the particular project that you are referring to. And as you would also Order. know, um, is, uh, firming capacity is a subject of some dissension in the sense of you know, it's a bit like asking how long is a piece of string. But what I absolutely can commit to this chamber is that we are absolutely committed to affordable and reliable power, but we're also committed to dispatchable electricity. Absolutely committed to make sure that when, we, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, we've still got power supplying households and businesses. Order. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Kitching? I rise. To, uh, I rise just a moment, Senator Kitching. Um, I'm not sure your mic was working. No. Just let senators clear the chamber. I, ri I rise to take note of the answers given by the Minister for Government Services and the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Minister Reynolds, in relation to the tragic and unnecessary death of Liam Danaher. So, firstly, Madam Deputy President, I'd like to say thank. God, we've got Minister Reynolds, because the former minister, Stuart Robert, the member for Fadden, had about as much compassion as a typical member of the Gold Coast White Shoe Brigade and should never have been in this portfolio. Let's talk about Liam Danher. On 5 February this year, Liam Danher, a 23-year-old man with a severe intellectual disability, autism and epilepsy, died of a seizure in his sleep while his parents were sleeping in the next room. So just stop and imagine that for a moment. Your beloved son, 23-year-old 
three years old, sleeping in the room next door, dies overnight. And why does he die? Because the National Disability Insurance Agency uh, has given him the runaround for 18 months at the AAT and can't buy him a seizure mat mattress, which would have um, indicated and given an alarm as to when Liam Danher was suffering a fit. Liam's, Liam's parents have said that their son's death could have been avoided if he had been provided with this seizure mat. For two years, the Cairns couple said they felt increasingly cut out over the care of their son as he moved from a state-run service onto the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Last July, with the Danhers increasingly worried their son might be having rare nighttime seizures, his neuro neurologist recommended purchase of the $445 mat, which would detect a seizure and sound an alarm. The seizure mat was recommended by three of Liam's own, own treating professionals, including a neurologist, as well as his independent assessor, the agency itself, the agency used to try and deny his appeal at the AAT. Over the course of the 18-month appeal, the NDIA should have amended Liam's plan to include assistive technology funding so he could access the life-saving seizure mat. And that's the point, Madam Deputy President. It would have been life-saving. It would have saved his life. This was an entirely avoidable death. Instead, what did the NDIA do instead? Instead of purchasing a $445 seizure mat, what did they do? They used taxpayers' money to engage lawyers and barristers to assist in the trial, in, which went for 18 months, an 18-month process while Liam was unable to access legal aid and the NDIA, wait for this one, the NDIA stopped his parents from representing him. It is disgraceful. The NDIA also flew an independent assessor to the family in Cairns to assess Liam as part of the AAT process. As if the trauma of losing a child to a preventable cause was not enough, the NDIA then contacted the family support coordinator a week after Liam's death, requesting quotes for the seizure mat. So you can imagine how upset um, that family was. And Liam's mum, in her letter, which I'll seek to table, Madam Deputy President, Tracy Danher has said, and I quote, it was just so distressing to receive that email. We had been waiting every day for that mat to be delivered. So just pause for a moment and imagine that, just for a minute. How do the people at the NDIA sleep at night? I think that would be beyond most people's ken. To add insult to injury, the NDIA has still not contacted the family to offer an apology or even an acknowledgement of their son's passing, a fact which obviously Liam's parents find upsetting and cold. The minister has said in here in this chamber, Madam Deputy President, that she's apologised, but it, seem, it seems unclear as to whether she was doing that in the chamber or had apologised when she had contact with Liam's father. I do hope those responsible at the NDIA and the minister are able to accept that a grave injustice has been perpetrated here and then find them within themselves the apology to, to apologise to that grieving family in person, so not only in the chamber but to the family, for the loss of that family's son due to an entirely avoidable bureaucratic nightmare. Liam is, of course, the fourth NDIS participant who has recently died due to the NDIS neglect and delay. I'm going to just run through them quickly. Tim Rubenack, who died waiting for the NDIS to provide him with a safe wheelchair. Anne-Marie Smith, who suffered septic shock, multiple organ failure, severe pressure sores, malnutrition and issues connected with her cerebral palsy. She died sitting in her own faeces. David Harris died after his mental health supports were cut off by the NDIA and was found dead in his Parramatta unit two months later by the police. So I would ask the minister, what has the NDIA and the NDIS and Thank the Quality you, and Senator Safeguards Kitchen, Commission your time done? Has expired. Thank you. Senator McMahon. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of questions on the NDIS uh, by Senator Kitching. Um, now, as has been said by Senator Kitching and Senator Reynolds, the death of, of anyone and the death of any child is a great tragedy and not something that we want to see, particularly if it could have been avoided. 
We're all touched by this. We're all affected by this. None more so, of course, than uh, his family and friends. And I think we just have to acknowledge that um, it's not something we want. It's not something we ever seek. And uh, it's something that, um, that we're all incredibly saddened by and sorry for. Um, having said that, um, talking down the NDIS um, is something that Labor does very often, very frequently and very well. They're very, very happy to go on the attack over what is fundamentally a scheme that this government should be incredibly proud of, a scheme that Australia should be incredibly proud of. There are not many countries around the world that have schemes equivalent to this. Um, it's a very, very good safety net. It provides very, very good care for a lot of Australians. Yes, it is tragic that someone on the, the NDIS passes away. It is very tragic and it's something that we want to avoid and, uh, and not see occur. But I would ask those on the other side, how many people, how many lives has this scheme saved? How many lives has it improved the quality of, not just of the people on the scheme, but their families? How much good has it contributed to Australian society? They can't bring themselves to acknowledge that because it's not their scheme, it's our scheme. They can't bring themselves to acknowledge how well we administer this scheme. Yes, occasionally something goes wrong, as occasionally something can go wrong in anything at all. Occasionally things go wrong in medicine. Occasionally things go wrong in aviation. Occasionally things go wrong on our roads. Sometimes these are avoidable. Sometimes they may not be avoidable. But the fact is, instead of sitting over there and knocking this whole scheme for one tragedy, this is a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, but just sitting there and knocking a whole scheme that overall this government administers for the benefit of Australians and generally for the great benefit of Australians, it's just counterproductive. And if you look at how much money this government does spend on this scheme, how much money would they be spending on the scheme? They would be spending unlimited amounts because they know how to spend, they don't know how to stop spending. So yes, it would be great. Give every person on the NDIS $10 million. Fantastic. Who's going to pay for it? Because they don't have anything that's costed. They have no idea what things actually cost to provide. Well, we on this side, we do. We actually take all Australian taxpayers, all Australians, into account. And we recognise that we have to be fiscally responsible and we provide a scheme that we can actually afford. We provide a scheme that we can have a budget for. We know what it's going to cost. And we recognise this. Oh, and by the way, we have a budget. Not that anyone on the other side would know that we're actually handing down a budget tonight. Do you even realise that we're handing down a budget tonight that Australians are concerned about that's going to affect Australians? Because you've not asked one question regarding the budget that we will be handing down, a good budget that we will be handing down that's going to benefit all Australians. Because you don't care. You don't care about Australians. You just care about yourselves. You just care about big noting yourselves and making claims that you cannot live up to. Because that's what Labor does. That's all Labor is Senator capable McMahon. of. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. I'm just going to go back to Senator Kitching, who was, I think, uh, going to seek leave to Thank table you. a Thank document. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Yes, I seek leave to table a letter written by Kevin and Tracy Danher to Minister Reynolds um, regarding their son, Liam. Is leave granted? Um, 
Sure. Thanks, uh, Minister. So, uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I'm really sad to say that that last contribution made no sense. That Senator McMahon has obviously not been listening to the rhetoric coming from her own government. She certainly didn't listen to the minister's response here today when the minister said it was fully funded. The scheme is fully funded. The very last thing, and it's very important that these matters be put straight, the very last thing that the Labor Party would ever do is to talk down the NDIS. The Labor Party were the ones that created the NDIS. About people with a disability, participants having reasonable and necessary supports and services. That's what the NDIS is about. That's what the ALP created. And what this government has been doing is to create a bureaucratic nightmare where those supports and services are caught up in a convoluted process where people are being either denied those services or people are, they are being delayed. Now, with the, 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 the tragic case of the death of Liam Danher, that family had to ju jump through hoops. They had not one treating professional, not two treating professionals, but three treating professionals who all said he needed it. Now, and having said that, they sent an independent assessor. The NDIA sends an independent assessor up. And what did they say? Yes, he needs it. But unfortunately, poor, that uh, Liam passed away. The other thing, the other thing uh, Senator McMahon said was um, that we should be listening to the community. Well, you know, she should take some of her own advice. With these new independent assessments that the government's rolling out to save costs, this is what's been said about them: robo plans, ticker box assessments, 20 disability organisations, and the minister said she's listening. 20 disability organisations have launched a petition and a campaign against independent assessments. That's what's actually happening out there. Professor Bonahady called them robo-plans. We have comment after comment from participants calling the, the process dehumanising. Is that really what you want your legacy to be? Is that really what this government wants their legacy on the NDIS to be. Now, there was a bit of a um, sigh of relief when minister, the new minister was announced. Maybe a reset. Maybe she was really going to reset it. She called a pause. Let's have a look at um, the information and the consultation after the, um, after the trials are completed. But there's no consultation. The trials are going ahead as they were already envisaged. No change. No change whatsoever. The, the minister, and I have to say, if the minister is uh, listening to this debate, she really needs to go back to the drawing board because what we have seen by nearly every uh, per person and witness given evidence to the NDIS Joint Standing Committee, they have asked for the scheme the independent assessment uh, trials to be scrapped and to go back to the drawing board and have a proper look at any of the issues. Because we know this government has been talking down the NDIS, talking about sustainability. When they first came out with independent assessments, they talked about fairness. That wasn't washing with the uh, participants nor advocates or the organisations in the disability section, sector. So now they talk about sustainability. But of course we know that the forecast on the cost of the NDIS was forecast four years ago. 
But here they are now, coming out to say that, um, it's, that somehow it's not sustainable. Well, four Thank years you, ago— Senator Brown, your time has expired. I understand that uh, the leave that Senator Kitching was Seeking to table a letter has been agreed to, so thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Van. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the questions on the NDIS as well. And of course, the death of any individual is tragic, and, and our sympathies go to the, the family of this young man. And rather than being interjected against by those opposite, I'd rather express the sympathies of this government to that family. But feel free to interject into those sympathies, your own if you'd like, Senator. So and out of respect for that family, I don't think we should trawl through that individual case here in this place, because all it seeks to do is politicise it. And if you like, I, I can bring up plenty of ways to, to politicise some of the comments of your ex-leader, as the um, newspapers showed on the weekend, he allegedly calling people who work for the NDIS oompa loompas. Now, what sort of disrespect is that? That is awful. If that's the way one of your leaders talks about the NDIS and its workers, you should be disgusted. We on this side are disgusted by any talk of that. It's awful. We are justifiably proud of the NDIS and the work that we put into it. That is why we. So, you, would you like to call them a name too, Senator? Uh, order. Order. Uh, thank you, Senator Keneally. And I remind you, Senator Van, to make your comments to the chair. Thank you, Chair. It is why we've committed. We're justly proud of the NDIS, and that's why we've committed an additional $13.2 billion up until 23-24 for disability supports under the NDIS. Now, this is in addition to the extra $3.9 billion included in the 2021 budget and bring the total extra federal government NDIS funding up to $17.1 billion. And need I not remind those opposite that tonight the Treasurer will be handing down the budget, and I'm sure he'll have more to say on that. But it's fair to say that the NDIS has grown at a rate well beyond any initial projections. In its 2011 report, the Productivity Commission estimated that the NDIS would support 411,000 Australians and they would have a gross cost of $13.6 billion. Now we know 450,000 participants are now receiving NDIS support, and it's projected that 530,000 Australians will access the scheme with costs estimated to exceed $26 billion in 2021-2022. The, the, NDI, the Australian government is committed to delivering on the promise of the NDIS, and that is to provide people with a permanent and significant disability with true choice and control over flexible support packages to achieve their goals. And the government is very serious about listening to the concerns raised by people with disabilities, their families and their organisations around the country that support them before making any decisions on proposed reforms and the shape of any draft legislation. It's fair to say that since becoming Minister for the NDIS, Senator Reynolds has been, providing, has been consulting extensively with the disability sector, its participants, providers and state and territory disability ministers, and will continue to do so. Those proposed reforms to the NDIS build on the Productivity Commission's original des design for the NDIS, as well as recommendations of other reviews and inquiries, particularly the 2019 Independent Review of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act 2013, what was known as the TUNE Review. And a key aspect of the proposed reforms is the introduction of independent assessments to inform excess and plan access and planning decisions, including the setting of a personalised budget. All governments, all governments discussed the shape of these reforms in 20, uh, April 2021 and key concerns that have been raised by the sector. This meeting, just last month, affirmed all governments have a shared vision and commitment to the promise of the NDIS. And all governments have also agreed the importance of further consultation occurring 
and having further conversations in July 2021 before any decisions are made. Now, the government appreciates that participants and the disability community has concerns about these proposed improvements, and it is a lot of change, but it is necessary to set up the NDIS for the future. So decisions on the reforms will be finalised following further consultation with the sector and evaluation of the current, in, uh, current independent assessment trials. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Van. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to take note of answers given by Senator Rushton on the NDIS. As we know in the debate in this place this afternoon, Liam Danher died of a seizure for lack of a seizure mat that would have alerted his parents to the fact that he was having a seizure so that they could intervene as they had done on many instances in the past when he had had previous seizures. I want to place on record today my personal condolences to Liam's parents, Kevin and Tracy, and I want to thank you in particular for your advocacy uh, around uh, this issue. At a time of grief and anger, the fact that you've been able to turn this into some ad advocacy so that other people, I hope, do not have to suffer these injustices and traumas through the NDIS. Uh, for that, I am deeply grateful. I am also very concerned at this government's continuing use of so-called respect for privacy as a cover-all for every instance where people want to take their issues up in parliament and have their parliamentarians raise them, where time after time this government simply hides out of respect for privacy or respect for uh, the people concerned. The simple fact is the parents of Liam want to be able to highlight how the system has failed their son. A and we know, as we dig deeper into this issue, there might be deeper reasons as to why the government might want to gloss over these issues. It seems to me, uh, when the National Disability Insurance Agency, Martin Hoffman, said to estimates, Liam's death was a complicated and terrible situation. What is that designed to mask over? We know that this young man died for want of a seizure mat that would have alerted his parents so that they could have rolled him into the correct position during a seizure so that he need not needlessly suffocate. Instead, what we also know about this indeed complicated case is that the NDIA was fighting Liam's parents uh, in regards to other elements of his care. That in the past, as parents under the previous system, they had been his carers, primary carers, and they'd been pa paid under that previous scheme to do so. Now, I would hate to think that a bureaucratic debate over uh, the, the care arrangements and who under the scheme uh, should be caring for Liam and I would have hoped that the scheme could adequately recognise that Liam was best cared for by his parents, as, would ev as was evidently the case for want of this mat. That that wasn't the issue being complicated in amongst this request for a simple mat that had been advocated for and requested by a number of other specialists and professionals that had sought uh, uh, for Liam to have access to that mat so that his parents could be alerted during a seizure. Now we know, and one of the key failings in the current assessment scheme uh, and concerns with this uh, uh, bureaucratic recasting of how disability is assessed, is the fact that people's needs change. Their disabilities change. Liam's parents were evidently concerned that their son might have been having more seizures. Well, how are they supposed to find that out if these seizures were happening at night when everyone was asleep? Were they debating 
with the NDIA about well, how many seizures is he having? Do we really know? Do we really think he needs this map? These are evidently very difficult issues, but they are also simple issues. We need a system that can respond to individual needs as the NDIA is supposed to. But we don't want to get bogged down by bureaucracy and legal fees when it comes to meeting the immediate and, as evidenced in this case, urgent needs of participants in the scheme. Thank you, Senator Pratt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Kitching to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I, I rise to take note of the answer to the question uh, that I asked of Senator Rustin representing uh, Minister Pitt. Now, I don't know if people know, but in the current financial year, the federal government has spent $9.13 billion of taxpayer money subsidising the fossil fuel sector in things like cheap diesel for the likes of Gina Reinhart and other big mining billionaires. Now, the Australia Institute crunched those figures and they worked out that that means for every minute of every day, there's $17,378 of taxpayer money, of your money, given to those big mining companies and other fossil fuel companies to support them to make the climate crisis worse. Now, I asked the minister representing about this very issue and I did not get a single scintilla of a response. There was no acknowledgement of the sheer and undisputed quantum of subsidies that go to the fossil fuel sector. There was no acknowledgement of how deeply inappropriate and frankly dangerous it is that in a climate emergency not only would the government be terrible in acting on climate but would actually be actively funding uh, the industries that are making the problem worse. It's like they're in a parallel universe. There was simply no uh, acknowledgement of the reality of the situation that we're in. And I asked why the ideological attachment to fossil fuels? Why do they get so much public money when they are wrecking the planet and making all of our lives more difficult? After the summer of bushfires that we endured when the Prime Minister was in Hawaii, I'm sure no one's forgotten that. Why? Why would they get such a big budget spend of taxpayer dollars? And I've got no response from this government, but people might be interested to know that the fossil fuel sector is a very large donor uh, to this government and, frankly, also to the other side of politics. And I've done the figures. So it's $8.2 million in donations to both sides of politics since 2012. Now, when you work that out, compared with the amount of fossil fuel subsidies that the industry gets, for every dollar that they donate, they get $10,000 of taxpayer money in return in cheap diesel, in accelerated depreciation, in a range of other infrastructure supports. What a return on investment. Nobody else gets those sort of numbers. So I must say the fossil fuel uh, industries and companies and the mining billionaires have got it sewn up very nicely with this government. And the reports are, the budget leaks are, that they'll get even more out of this budget. There's an unspecified amount of money that will go to Snowy Hydro for them to uh, produce not renewable energy but a gas-fired power plant. Um, there's half a billion for carbon capture and storage and a little bit for hydrogen. There's uh, 58 million to a so-called gas-fired recovery, with almost 40 million of that to critical gas infrastructure projects. Um, there's the continuation of that essentially cheap petrol for Gina that I mentioned before. Um, and there's all sorts of other subsidies, uh, coal-fired power subsidies, coal railway subsidies, ports. So how very convenient for these fossil fuel donors who are clearly running this government um, it, it's a plutocracy if I ever saw one, and this government just could not answer. But it's very interesting that Minister uh, Pitt couldn't answer a question either about why he vetoed a wind farm plus battery uh, proposal from getting federal funding through the NAIF, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund. There was a very, very hilarious, if I can be so frank, interview where he refused to acknowledge that, of course, wind farms can be backed up 
uh, by batteries, so of course that can make them dispatchable power. And so I asked Minister Rustin, well, can she confirm that simple and undisputed reality that, yes, batteries can back up wind farms? Um, and she wouldn't say the word battery either. So, you know, the big B is, is clearly very scary for this government. They can't acknowledge that batteries are the way of the future because it, would, it uh, interferes with their uh, nonsense ideology that somehow renewables can't power our cities and homes and be a massive growth export industry for us. So let's hope that they discover uh, the utility of batteries and maybe even give some taxpayer support to that clean industry and to that actual technology that works, rather than once again propping up their fossil fuel mates, um, who happen to be political donors, who often go off and work for some of these ministers and cycle through those industry rep bodies, um, back through to work for parliamentarians, and the revolving door of lobbyists just carries on. Question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk with petitions. Mr. President, a petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic red. Its terms will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, is I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators from the 11th to the 13th of May 2021. Senators Griffin Scar for personal reasons, Senator Molan for medical reasons, and Senator Payne on account of ministerial business. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator I Urquhart. move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Green and Gallup for 11th to 13th of May for personal reasons, Senator Billick 11th of May to the 24th of June for personal reasons, and Senator O'Neill for 12th to 13th of May for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any other matters? I'll call the clerk. Mr. President, there are no postponement notifications lodged today, but committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any of those proposals at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll just run through in the order they are in the notice paper because there are not many matters notified to me for discovery today. Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Before I ask the motion be taken as formal, I inform the chamber <coughs> that Senator Griff will also sponsor the motion. Is this 1082, Senator? Oh, yes, it Senator is. Urquhart. Yep. I ask that you. Sorry, I jumped the gun, didn't I? I ask that general business notice of motion number 1082 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being, there is. I'll move to 1083, Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1083 relating to women's economic security be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted for one minute, Senator Thank Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the 2021-22 budget will build on the 2018 and 2020 women's economic and security statements, demonstrating the government's comprehensive and sustained commitment to continue improving opportunities and outcomes for Australian women and girls while ensuring their safety, economic security and health and wellbeing remain paramount. The budget will build upon the already uh, record commitment of this government of over $1 billion for women's safety. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rice, number 1088. Thanks, Mr. President. And before asking that the motion be taken this formal, I inform the Chamber that Senator Kitching will also sponsor the motion. So I ask that general business notice of motion number 1088 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. Motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim, 1090. Thank you, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1090 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Tell us leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government is committed to delivering a simpler tax system that remains progressive, fosters aspiration and rewards effort. 
We should all be encouraged that the economic recovery is on track and ahead of schedule. Unemployment in March at 5.6 per cent is below the most optimistic Treasury forecast and well below the forecast of 7.5 per cent in the March quarter predicted in the 2020-21 MAIFO. Consumer confidence has recovered beyond its pre-pandemic level and sits at an 11-year high, and business conditions are at their highest on record. Senator Watt. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Labor supports tax relief for low- and middle-income earners, who should be the priority. Yet it looks like, under this government, uh, these will be temporary tax cuts while high-income earners get permanent tax cuts. We have expressed our concerns about committing to big tax cuts for high-income earners years down the track that are the least responsible, least fair and least likely to be effective in the economy. The question is motion number 1090, moved by Senator McKim, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1090 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is apparently 11 ayes and 39 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Urquhart. Senator, oh, Senator Watt. Uh, I seek leave to move motion 1082 uh, and that it be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? Yes. Senator Watt. Oh, nasty. <laughs> um, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving motion 1082. Question. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. The motion requires an absolute majority.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes. Senator Patrick teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 58, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Watt or oh, Senator Urquhart, you can move it from where you are if you wish. You can do it from there, if you, Senator Watt. Um, I actually thought I'd done what was required. Oh, I move the motion. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Dunham. Table the government's statement relating to this motion. Thank you. The question is. Motion moved by Senator uh, Watt, number 1082, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1082 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell for the noes. I'm advised that the result of the division is 28 ayes and 27 noes. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator McCarthy. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. Helping Aussies in India return, not jailing them, and fixing our quarantine system rather than leaving our fellow Australians stranded. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuing to Standing Order 75, I give notice today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. Helping Aussies in India return, not jailing them, and fixing our quarantine system rather than leaving our fellow Australians stranded. Mr. President, having an Australian passport used to mean something. It used to mean that your government looked after you when you were in a crisis, when you were stranded, when you are in trouble. It used to mean safety, protection and security. But as we've seen in recent weeks with Australians stranded in India, it seems to mean that the Morrison government is going to leave you behind. 9,500 Aussies in India, 950 of them considered vulnerable and tragically, 173 unaccompanied children, all left behind by Scott Morrison. Last week in the COVID committee, we heard the moving story of a Sydney parent, Dylan. Dylan told the committee that he and his wife had not seen their young daughter for almost 17 months, despite constant efforts to get her home from India. Dylan said, we have not seen our daughter grow. When her grandma says she has grown, I feel sad. We have not been able to see her grow taller. It's time we have lost and we can never get back. I cannot imagine how difficult it is for this family. How could any parent be separated from their child from that long, during their child's young formative years, and not feel that loss deeply? We still don't know when Dylan and his wife will be reunited with their precious child. I asked DFAT officials in this, the COVID committee hearings whether they had considered sending a special mercy flight to India to specifically bring home children who were separated from their parents in the middle of this global pandemic. And the officials confirmed that the government had not. 
Let's be clear. Banning Australian citizens from trying to return home from India and threatening them with jail and with fines is unprecedented. It did not have to be this way. It did not have to be this way because the Morrison government has failed in its responsibility for quarantine. If there had been a national quarantine facility, as Jane Halton recommended to the Prime Minister, more stranded Australians would have been able to get home to safety. These Australians, these stranded Australians, our fellow citizens, our mates, would already be home if the Prime Minister had just done his job and ensured that the federal government had been responsible for quarantine, something it's been responsible for now for over 100 years. Instead, he's left these Australians behind, trapped overseas and exposed to the coronavirus. Now, the chief medical officer, Paul Kelly, said last week that the India travel ban is a direct result of a lack of quarantine facilities. So let's just be clear. Scott Morrison ignored Jane Halton's recommendation mm. to set up national quarantine facilities with surge capacity to get stranded Australians home. If Scott Morrison had taken that advice from his hand-picked expert Jane Halton, if he had listened one of the three times that she briefed him on her report, if he had acted, the Australians in India would already be home. They would not have been left behind by this Prime Minister. Now, of course we need to follow medical advice. Nobody is suggesting otherwise. Of course we need to keep the virus out of Australia. No one is suggesting otherwise. But the best way of protecting Australians is through a proper national quarantine system and getting on with the vaccine rollout. Quarantine and vaccination, the two jobs that the federal government, the Morrison government had during this pandemic, and they are failing at both. The truth is our, qu our current quarantine arrangements are unable to deal with a surge in demand during a crisis. The exact circumstances that were referred to in the Halton report Inadequate quarantine facilities mean we are unable to deal with the 40,000 Australians who are still stranded overseas and can't get home to Australia. And this failure sits squarely with the Prime Minister. Quarantine has been a federal responsibility for 120 years. The Prime Minister used to know this. He used to hold the job of Minister for Immigration, and he got and commissioned for himself a big trophy. I stopped the boats, he said. He used to be responsible for the borders. But I tell you what, he is stopping Australian citizens from getting back to their home country because he is washing his hands of quarantine. He is ducking responsibility. He failed to act. He shoved it all onto the states. This I don't hold a hose mate attitude of Scott Morrison. I don't run quarantine, he says. I'm not responsible for aged care, except he is. The vaccine rollout, not my fault. Australians are getting sick and tired of a prime minister who fails to take responsibility, who ducks and waves, and who does not act. Scott Morrison is all about the re-election of Scott Morrison. Everything he does is designed to ensure that he is never responsible for any problem, but he's always around to take credit when things go well. When Gladys Berejiklian and Dan Andrews acted during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, they saved Australia. The Australian citizens responded to the leadership of Dan Andrews and Gladys Berejiklian. But where was Scott Morrison? The Australian people are to be credited for following the advice and the leadership of the state premiers and chief ministers. Where was Scott Morrison? All he did was stand around after national cabinet and announce what the premiers told him he was already, that they were going to do. That's not leadership. 
Scott Morrison is all about Scott Morrison. He is not about the Australian people, and he is not on the side of the Australian people. If Scott Morrison were, was on Australian side, he would have rolled out the vaccine. He would have secured enough vaccine deals. He would have ensured we didn't put all our eggs in one basket, the AstraZeneca basket. He would have implemented a national quarantine system, as his own hand-picked expert, Jane Halton, told him to do. Let's remember, the Prime Minister said, we're at the front of the queue, Australia, when it comes to vaccines. We're nowhere near the front of the queue. We're 100th in the world. We're up the back of the class. This is a Prime Minister who loves an announcement but doesn't pay attention to the details of delivery. This is a Prime Minister who promised we'd have four million Australians vaccinated by the end of March. We get to the end of May. We're nowhere near that. We're not even we're not he's now promising six million, six million are going to be vaccinated. I think his deadline is by the end of May. We're not going to hit that. This is a government that always loves an announcement, doesn't pay attention to the delivery. Understand where we're at. When the Prime Minister says we're at the front of the queue, we are lagging behind countries like Mongolia, El Salvador, and Panama. Mongolia, El Salvador, and Panama are doing a better job vaccinating their citizens than the Morrison government is doing vaccinating Australians. We were supposed to have every adult in the country, Scott Morrison announced, vaccinated by the end of October. That's laughable and it's tragic. The failure is tragic. And the people who are paying for it most acutely right now are Australian citizens and permanent residents who are stranded in India. As Senator Matt Canavan said, we shouldn't be jailing our fellow citizens. We should be fixing quarantine to help get these people home. As Senator Patterson said, this is a step too far threatening to jail our fellow citizens who want to come home in the middle of a tragic humanitarian crisis. More than 22 million people in India have the virus. More than 246 people have lost their lives. They have a shortage of oxygen in hospitals. This is a difficult time for India. My heart goes out to our friends in India. The help we give them is right, but we need Senator to get our fellow Neely, Australians your time home. time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, you know, I really felt like after we'd been out of this place for six weeks, it was like coming back to school, new year, new teacher almost. You weren't quite sure what room you were supposed to be in. But clearly those opposite missed out on that. They haven't quite got the same fresh approach to when we come back after six weeks because they are still sprouting the same old negative energy that nothing is right, nothing is ever good enough. It wouldn't matter which way we looked, which way we went, those opposite would find a way to complain. But what I think it is incredibly interesting though, Madam Acting Deputy President, is it's not everyone in Labor who currently has looked at the situation in India and constantly flip-flopped and changed their position, who've taken a politically expedient position just because it's the opposite of what the Morrison government's done. In fact, there's many in Labor that have actually embraced the decisions that the Morrison government has made based on health advice, making sure that Australians are safe. And I just thought I would take this opportunity to remind those opposite of what some of their colleagues have said and perhaps they might like to take this on board and, with regards to their objections, may like to raise it with them because it might get a little bit awkward at some of those federal council convention things you all get together with. So, Mark McGowan, now admittedly, not a big fan, not a big fan of the Premier of the one party state, said he could do it all, and then as soon as he got one case, shut the borders again and shut everybody down, closed the businesses, panicked overreaction, the knee-jerk McGowan that we always tend to see. But even Mark McGowan here decided to support Prime Minister Morrison and the coalition government, and I quote, with more and more arrivals coming from India, we need to seriously look at temporarily restricting the travel of people who've been in or through India. 
They're trying to put a stop to the third wave happening in Australia. That would be us, the Morrison government, trying to stop that third wave. And we need to do everything we can to keep this double mutant variety away. So it was, in fact, the West Australian Premier, Mark McGowan, come, came out urging, urging. In fact, normally when it's Mr McGowan, it's demanding, but I think he urged the federal government to suspend flights out of India. There needs to be a suspension, Mr McGowan told reporters. But it wasn't just Mr McGowan in the one state place of WA. It was also up in Queensland. Princess Palaszczuk, the woman who likes to claim everything. <laughs> Senator Urquhart. I would ask that the um, senator opposite call those by their appropriate names. Senator Hughes, you need to use the appropriate titles. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Anastasia Prem uh, Palaszczuk, Premier of Queensland, the other state known for slamming those borders shut, ruining its tourism industry at every opportunity, but then sticking its hand out for the federal government to bail out its industries yet again. But even Premier Palaszczuk came to the table on this one. She welcomed the news that the federal government's decision that we increased aid to India. But while she acknowledged the decision to suspend flights was difficult for families, and to quote Premier Palaszczuk, it's the right decision at this time. And when Premier Palaszczuk even gets that COVID is unprecedented and at different times we need to take different responses, I think it says something to those opposite that they need to pay a little more attention to their colleagues. But it's not just the state premiers. No, no, no. It's, it's quite a few that sit over in the other chamber. And in fact, the Leader of the Opposition himself quoted here, saying it's understandable these border closures have occurred given what's occurred in India, have, have happened given what's occurred in India. They recommend the health officials recommended a reduction, and I think that's appropriate. But of course, whilst Mr Albanese likes to have a bed each way, and I won't use the term that he is colloquially known as, in respect of those opposite. It was his predecessor, Bill Shorten, who was in, the member for Maribyrnong. Senator, Sorry, Hughes, Maribyrnong? Senator Hughes, you do need to use the appropriate titles. I sometimes forget what the name of their seats are. My apologies. <laughs> Senators are much easier to turn to remember. The member for Maribyrnong. He came out claiming that it was well past time to shut our borders to flights from India. The former leader of the opposition, the man who told Arne Schwarzenegger he was going to be Prime Minister, the next PM of Australia, he wanted to let us all know, to quote, but let's be clear, as a general principle, let's just close the borders for traffic from India and then we can send them to supplies. So whilst we have acted on the health advice, Whilst we have looked to keep Australians safe, whilst we have acted to ensure that a third wave of COVID does not occur in Australia, we were actually supported in this remarkably by a number of people on the opposite side. Unfortunately, in their party room or caucus meeting, that, probably, that message didn't get through to the senators putting forward an MPI today. But when it comes to the vaccine rolling, rollout, of course, we get the same boo-hoo, isn't it terrible story. No recognition last week was the largest number of vaccines delivered across the country. Uh, the vaccines are being rolled out, and as every country's experience, every country when they've started their vaccine rollout, it's had to be done under a safe and measured way. And as we're seeing, these numbers are now increasing exponentially. And I hate to think how upset you'll be when we do start to see increased numbers vaccinated. In fact, the fantastic work of Gladys Berejiklian means those 40 to 49, of which I only just slip into that age group, have been able to register for a vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine I registered yesterday on the New South Wales government website. If only every state was as effective as New South Wales, I'm sure you'd all be in a much happier place. 
I don't know what Senator Keneally's got against Mongolia or El Salvador or Panama, but I'm not sure she'll be getting an invitation to visit any of them soon. But I mean, just a couple of things that India has done that we might like to recognise, and that the world is now looking to look to them and support them in response to the generosity that they showed prior to the crisis that is now enveloping that country. Prior to India experiencing this COVID wave, they had actually exported 66 million doses of a vaccine globally. In our region, to Nauru and to Fiji, 10,000 to Nauru and 100,000 to Fiji. They've manufactured over 130,000 vaccines for Papua New Guinea and 24,000 for the Solomon Islands. And a chartered flight left Sydney on Wednesday, just last week, carrying essential medical supplies, which included over 1,000 ventilators and 43 oxygen concentrators, as part of the Australian government's initial package to assist. This is the initial part of the package. This assistance will continue as globally India is being supported, particularly in recognition of the generosity it showed prior to its COVID crisis. India has, of course, got 9,000 Australians waiting to come home, of which 900 have been uh, marked as uh, in a high-risk group. From the 15th of May, we will start to see repatriation flights. And there are a couple of states that have decided that they will participate in that quarantine of the repatriation. And the federal government, along with the ACT running the Howard Springs quarantine facility, will be there to bring those Indian Australians, Australian Indians, I'm probably getting my mixed around there, but they will be on their way home through repatriation flights commencing May 15th. But don't let the truth get in the way of a good scare campaign over there. These Australians will be coming home, and they'll be coming home in a safe way that's not only safe for them, it's not only safe for the frontline workers that will work with them through the quarantine period, but it's safe for the whole Australian community. And that's the way the Morrison government has approached all of COVID. Our decisions are based on health advice. Our decisions are based on how to best keep all Australians safe. We've seen increases just since February into March of the number of Australians coming home. This is going to continue to increase. It's not helped when states decide to shut down everything over one case of COVID. Again, I would urge them to look to the Berejiklian government for leadership and how to manage this crisis. But I think rather than scaremongering, we should look to the solutions, appreciate the support that the Indians are getting and know that they will start coming home from May 15. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, my heart goes out to the people of India who are basically experiencing immeasurable suffering at this moment. We are thinking of you and we are trying to do everything we can to support you and to push the Australian government to meet its moral obligations. The government's disregard for the lives and the health of people overseas has become striking over the past couple of weeks. The Morrison government's threat of jail time for stranded Australians trying to return home from India is absolutely horrific, it's discriminatory, and it is racist. The move was a reminder for non-white migrants to this country that our citizenship will always be conditional. For migrants of colour, terms and conditions will always apply to our citizenship. In the fine print, you discover that for you, being Australian means greater scrutiny, harsher policy responses and fewer protections. You find out pretty quickly that we are all in this together is a false slogan. Some of us will always be excluded. Healthcare is a human right. Your visa, citizenship or COVID status shouldn't change that. People whose homes and lives are here must be brought back immediately. Australia should also be flying back any sick citizens, permanent residents and partners home for treatment, and the cost of quarantine and flights 
should be covered by the government. Quarantine facilities should be humane, comfortable, safe. These should be places where people can stay with dignity. It is beyond unacceptable that Prime Minister Scott Morrison thinks it's the right thing to leave sick people in India with no access to local vaccines or work rights, little access to health care, and no prospect of coming home with partners or family members when they are allowed to return. The subcontinent diaspora that I've been speaking to are telling me that they are feeling like second-rate citizens. They are telling me again and again that their hearts are heavy, thinking about loved ones suffering the consequences of the pandemic. They are telling me that they dread phone calls from India because they will inevitably bear bad news. We must do everything we can to also provide healthcare aid and resources to India and make sure that they are delivered to those in need. I urge the government to immediately return Australian citizens, permanent residents and their partners in India back home to Australia. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I also rise today to support the motions put forward by Senator McCarthy. Um, now, I've previously risen in this place on a number of occasions to speak on the government's failure to secure safe passage home for vulnerable Australians abroad uh, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And since this first issue arose, I've been immensely disappointed by the lack of action from those opposite to assist our fellow citizens. My office, like many others in this place, have probably been inundated with requests, appeals for help, for assistance by their government, by the Australian government. They are so desperate to come home, home to a safe place, and not because they have decided to just pack up and leave Australia and go on a holiday, but because they have been trying for months to come back to Australia. Months. Once upon a time, not so long ago, Australian governments have understood their responsibility, that they have to assist Australians in need who are overseas. Once upon a time, Australian governments would have sought to actively facilitate those in strife returning home to safety. But sadly, this understanding has been lost by this coalition government. Their responsibility has been lost. There are something in the order of around 9,500 Australians currently stranded in India. Almost 1,000 of them are considered vulnerable. Almost 200 of them are unaccompanied children. These are Australians that have been abandoned, abandoned by their government, and there's no other way to characterise it. These are Australians that the government have made clear they aren't in the mood to help. But up until recently, the message to these people was, for all intents and purposes, you got yourself into this place, you get yourself out. And we have heard the stories of many Australians, many Australians, who have tried to organise flights, who have tried to organise ways to get home, to fund and fac facilitate their own return to Australia, independent of this government. But as if on a mission to compound their misery, the government has decided to up the ante, to threaten these people, these fellow Australians, with imprisonment, imprisonment upon their return. At no point were such measures required when the global hotspots were in China or Italy or in the United Kingdom. So why do this now? Why now? I mean, the answer seems plain and clear, that this government's complete inability to manage our quarantine system appropriately has led us to this point. And if we had a proper quarantine system in place, we wouldn't be here today. These Australians would already be home with their families. But instead, what we have is this hot mess, this abandonment of their responsibilities of those opposite, their abandonment of their responsibilities of their constitutional obligations. We should always follow the health advice. There is no doubt about that. But we also need to do what we can to make sure that advice like this never, never becomes necessary. One is left to wonder just how little confidence 
do the medical authorities have in the government's quarantine arrangements that would lead them to providing advice like this? And we've had members of the coalition, Senator Patterson, Senator Canavan, as I'd asked questions in question time early today to the minister, about their views that this government needs to do a better job at making sure that stranded Aussies have a right to come home and should be assisted to, in doing so. But the answer was very clear. This government is focused on making sure that whatever they can to make it very hard for those who are currently over in India, that they don't get a chance to come home safely, that they have to wait for the government to sort out the mess here. Sort out the mess that they should have looked after some months ago, not just relying on the state governments to pick up the tab and manage our quarantine system. It is the federal government's responsibility, quarantine. So the way ahead is clear that this government needs to admit that they got it wrong and they need to work hard to fix it. As members of the government themselves have said, they should be helping stranded Aussies in India to get home, not locking them up for making their own way here. The time for blaming others is over. The finger pointing at the states must end. Quarantine is a federal responsibility and has been since Federation. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I would I'd start by expressing my deepest support and solidarity with India as it continues to respond to this ongoing crisis. Australia is both a close friend and comprehensive strategic partner of India, and we stand with them as they continue to confront this uh, surge in COVID-19 cases. Uh, we have a vibrant, uh, almost 70,000 strong uh, Indian diaspora in Western Australia who make up part of the 700,000 Indians who live across Australia, uh, all who form an important and integral part of our local communities. Uh, we have all seen that uh, in our own communities. No doubt every single senator here in this place uh, knows what a valuable contribution uh, those uh, that have decided to, to move here and raise their families here are making in this uh, in this great country of ours. Uh, so our thoughts, of course, are with the thousands of Australians who are uh, still living in, in India. Uh, it remains an extremely difficult time for our friends in India. Australians in India and those uh, with loved ones over there are experiencing, no doubt, sig significant stress. Uh, we're continuing to stand uh, with them and we remain committed to doing everything we can to support India through this. Uh, India has shown both leadership and generosity during the COVID-19 pandemic. They've exported over 66 million vaccines globally, including uh, to our neighbours in the Pacific. Uh, so now it's our turn to repay that amazing generosity and show our support to India. Just last week, uh, we chartered a uh, flight to India, delivered uh, essential medical services, uh, medical supplies rather, uh, as part of the Australian government's package to assist India as they combat COVID-19. This shipment included uh, 1,056 ventilators and 43 oxygen concentrators. We've also helped the Indian Air Force collect four privately sourced oxygen tanks from my home state in Western Australia. The government is continuing to work with both state and federal uh, state and territory governments, as well as the uh, private sector, to help assist with the urgent deployment of further support. Helping Australians return home continues to remain a key priority, a key priority of this government. We made the call to pause flights from India to ensure that we prevent the virus from coming back and starting a third wave here in Australia. Temporary restrictions on arrivals into Australia help to balance the interests of Australians who are seeking to return home while also managing the risks uh, to the wider community and, of course, public health. Restrictions like this are critical to the integrity of Australia's quarantine system as well as the safety of the Australian community as a whole. And we have used this method before. Closing our borders and utilising quarantine for returning Australians is not something new. Australia was one of the first countries to close our international borders when the pandemic first began. 
It has proven to be the best strategy to protect the health of all Australians during the pandemic, and it has helped us maintain a way of life which is, of course, envy of the world. There has been uh, nationally uh, widespread support for the temporary pause, the temporary pause on travel from India. Uh, WA's Premier Mark McGowan went on the record multiple times last month, promising a temporary, uh, proposing ban, rather a temporary ban on arrivals from India. He even went so far as to urge the federal government to suspend flights out of India, describing India as the epicentre of death and destruction. Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk also backed our choice to suspend flights into Australia, saying other countries have done a temporary suspension. I don't think that would be out of kilter uh, for Queensland and Australia to do the same. The Shadow Health spokesman, Mr Butler, member for Hindmarsh, also supported the pause of flights and stated, given the scale of the crisis in India right now, the proper thing to do is to pause travel from India to Australia. Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, member for Grainler, also noted it's understandable these border closures, given what has occurred in India. Yet now, all of a sudden, he's saying that the Commonwealth has a duty to abandon, not to abandon Australians stuck in India. So which is it, Mr Albanese? Are the temporary restrictions understandable or not? It's pretty simple. India is currently identified as a high-risk country due to the significant, significant increase in positive case numbers in return travellers from India. Of the recent cases of COVID-19 detected in hotel quarantine in Australia, over 50 per cent of cases since mid-April 2021 of overseas acquired cases reported have, uh, cases reported have acquired their infection in India. What the government has done is respond to the current situation and ensure that we protect Australians both overseas and in India. And we're seeing positive signs from this latest temporary pause of flights, which has reduced the number of positive cases within the quarantine system to a level that is manageable and to reduce the risk of COVID entering the community. A number of confirmed cases in Howard, the number of confirmed cases in Howard Springs are also starting to fall. So the government remains committed to continuing to bring people back safely from India, but we have to make sure that we do it in a way that won't subject the rest of Australia to a third wave of COVID-19. The Biosecurity Act was deliberately drafted broadly to protect Australians from health risks. These tools will always be used responsibly and proportionally. These measures have been in place for 14 months, and in that time, they have been used very judiciously to protect Australia. So it is not fair to suggest that these penalties, in their most extreme forms, will be likely to be imposed uh, anywhere. When you go into Western Australia, uh, and this has been the case for, I, I suspect, decades, uh, you have restrictions on the, uh, on the importing and the bringing in of uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and nuts and various things. And there are penalties if you do that. There are very strong penalties if, uh, that, that could go in the extreme if one does that. And so just because there might be an upper limit of a penalty doesn't mean that we need to scaremonger around this particular issue. Australians that are trying to get back into Australia are under, uh, that are in India right now are under immense uh, stress and pressure. And we don't need scaremongering we need to obviously work as judiciously as we possibly can to see flights returned, to see as many flights come back in and ensure that our quarantine system is able to deal with it. Since the start of the pandemic, the Australian government has helped over 45,200 Australians return home, including 18,500 people on 125 government facilitated flights. Of these, 38 flights have departed from India, so far assisting around 6,300 Australians. Over 20,000 Australians who have registered with DFAT in India have safely returned since the pandemic began. Now, there are still 9,000 Australians in India who are all keen to return home, 
of which 900 are considered vulnerable. And as of 15 May, government charter repatriation flights to the Centre for National Resilience uh, to the Centre for National Resilience at Howard Springs for returning Aussies with India will resume. An estimated 1,000 Australians will be able to return home by the end of June, with one repatriation flight into Howard Springs every seven to nine days. We've put in place new measures for all flights resuming from India to the Northern Territory, requiring all returning Aussies to provide both a negative and COVID-19 chain reaction test and a negative rapid antigen test prior to boarding. These new measures will help protect those returning, uh, those returning home and the Australian community at large as well. So we are helping Aussies who are in India return to Australia. We are not leaving them stranded. We've done the tough job of making sure our quarantine facility has the capacity to handle those coming in from overseas. And it has helped ensure that we protect Australian communities and prevent any further outbreak of COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The fact that Australians have not been able to return home at a time of international emergency is a clear indication of how this government has failed when it comes to meeting their responsibilities to keep all Australians safe. All Australians not just those lucky enough to be within our borders when the COVID pandemic hit. Quarantine is clearly a responsibility of the federal government, but one this government has shirked from the beginning of this pandemic. The Northern Territory government stepped up to the challenge when the pandemic hit. A dormant workers' camp on the outskirts of Darwin at Howard Springs was offered up as a place where Australians returning from countries where the virus was raging could quarantine before returning to their homes. The first Australian coronavirus evacuees from Wuhan arrived at Howard Springs last February. Since then, it's developed into and this is February last year. Since then, it's developed into what health experts have called a gold standard purpose-built infection control facility safely quarantining thousands of arrivals, including domestic travellers, overseas fruit pickers, international students and repatriated Australians. Throughout the pandemic, NT Health has been managing the domestic section of the facility where no cases of coronavirus have been recorded in people arriving in the NT from interstate. Mr Acting Deputy President, can I take this opportunity uh, to speak directly to our frontline workers in the Northern Territory, in particular at Howard Springs and the OSMAT team, under the guidance of the Chief Health Officer, Dr Hugh Heggie, and now uh, Acting Chief uh, Health Officer, Dr Charles Payne, a deep and sincere thank you from not only uh, this side of the Senate, but indeed the Australian Parliament, because it is you who are working at the front line and have been uh, consistently since February 2019 to take care of vulnerable Australians and indeed those Australians who now just wish to travel across the country and who know that that is a place they can go to quarantine. But there are still Australians so many thousands of Australians still stuck overseas who so desperately want to come home without having to have the threat of a jail sentence on the top of them. The Commonwealth has been managing international arrivals, Mr Acting Deputy President, and management is now being handed over to the Northern Territory. Throughout the pandemic, NT Health has been managing the domestic section of the facility where no cases, as I said, of coronavirus have been recorded in people arriving in the NT from interstate. So under the federal agreement, capacity at Howard Springs will increase to 2,000 individuals per fortnight. 2,000 extra Australians are able to come in to Darwin and feel safe. I have no doubt the Northern Territory 
and all of those frontline workers, not only just in health but also in emergency services, our retail sector, the bus drivers, the transport workers who need to be so much a part of this safety mechanism in protecting Australians from coronavirus, giving a place for quarantining, but just as importantly protecting the Territorians who live and who so generous, generously welcome uh, all Australians to that facility. So I have no doubt the Northern Territory will continue to do an excellent job in running a gold standard quarantine service. The federal government would have been better served by using Howard Springs as a model for quarantine facilities elsewhere in the country. We would perhaps not be facing the situation where not only have Australians in India been banned from coming home, they have been threatened with jail time and huge fines if they do so. How horrific is that on top of an already desperate and depressing situation for those families wanting their loved ones back in this country. If the Morrison government had not so comprehensively failed to deliver our vaccination program, we would not have to be banning Australians from coming home. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the debate on helping Aussies in India return, not jailing them and fixing our quarantine system rather than leaving our fellow Australians stranded. People both here in Australia and around the world were in fact disgusted when our government announced that the, tra the travel ban and then further threatening to jail and fine Australian citizens and permanent residents if they dared try and return home from India. India is suffering a terrible humanitarian crisis, with COVID cases continuing to spike. Right now, people need help. Australian citizens and permanent residents in India need help. The Morrison government has abandoned our citizens and residents trying to escape and come home from a desperate situation. There are, there are nine and a half thousand Australians in, in India right now who would like to come home. That includes 950 vulnerable people and 173 unaccompanied minors, which the government didn't even know about until there were questions asked in the COVID committee last week. The government introduced this racist ban because that's what it is, because our ho held hotel quarantine system is not up to scratch. It cannot handle permanent cases with a guarantee of those cases not with, uh, with those cases or COVID not escaping them. And we've had examples of that. The whole point of quarantine is to be able to handle positive cases. That's the whole point. And yet what's happened over the last 12 months is the Commonwealth offloading responsibility, which it has for quarantine under our laws, onto the states and then continuing to refuse to fix the system that is clearly broken, to take and show the leadership to make sure that we had, we had quarantine facilities around this country that were the best they could possibly be. We do have Howard Springs and that's being expanded not quickly enough to deal with the most immediate crisis in India. And people may think that the government is acting, but all they have done is announce three guaranteed flights once the ban ends. That should end now. Those flights should be leaving to bring people home. The first three flights will only bring home 450 people. There's 950 vulnerable, let alone the other 9,000 that still need to come home. The government has no timeline, no timeline to bring them home and can only actually guarantee they'll get 450 home at the moment with the possibility of another potentially three flights that may then get some more of the vulnerable Senator home. Senator Seward, your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Here is my question to, to Labor. Is it OK to shut borders to protect citizens and ensure internal health services are not overwhelmed? Or is it not? I mean, it's a simple question. 
And if you don't think it is appropriate, then why don't you ring Premier Mark McGowan, who shut his border on the 5th of April last year, right through to December? Nine months. A nine-month ban on travel. I had a member of staff, born and raised in Perth. She could not go home to visit her family for the nine months. You might want to call on uh, Premier Dan Andrews, who slammed his border shut with less than four hours' notice on New Year's Eve, preventing families from getting together to ring in the new year. You might want to ring um, Premier Palaszczuk, whose border was shut for eight months last year. Now, I am on the record speaking about those border closures. I am on the record speaking about the negative impact of families stuck on opposite sides of the border, supporting boarding school students and university students who couldn't get home for holidays and families who were split by a divide. I am on the record calling for common sense. But I never once questioned the right of the state premiers to listen to health advice and impose restrictions they thought necessary to protect their citizens. And, and let's put it in context. Nine months, Western Australia, you, Mr Deputy Pre President, were restricted from travelling beyond your state borders other than the fact that uh, you're a, an essential worker in this place. Um, that was nine months. Our government announced this Indian travel ban on the 27th of April to come into effect on the 3rd of May. So no four-hour notice like Premier Andrews. We gave them a week's notice. And it is now being lifted on the 15th of May. Twelve days. Twelve days to buy us time to ensure that when we reopen and reaccept people returning to Australia from India, we have the capacity to, to care for them. In the middle of April, 50 per cent of all our quarantine COVID cases were returning travellers from India. 50 per cent. At that rate, we would have been overwhelmed. Twelve days is what we asked for so that we can put in place systems to make sure we can care for our citizens. In the words of Premier McGowan, we need to do everything we can to keep this double mutant variant away, talking about the disease that has occurred in India. And when we reopen our borders on the 15th of May, we will be focusing on prioritising the most vulnerable and getting them home. And we will have the confidence that our systems won't be overwhelmed, that we can look after them. So I agree it is heartbreaking for families and for citizens who found themselves on the wrong side of this border ban temporarily. I, I share their concerns. But I also stand with the premiers from around this country, from both parties, Labor and Liberal alike, who have themselves taken measures to protect their citizens. And I stand with them to say we need confidence, we need to make sure that we have capacity, that our health systems are not overwhelmed, that we don't inadvertently do things that would make us vulnerable, because we don't want to be the next India. We don't want that level of COVID in this nation. We want we want to keep our citizens safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. <coughs> Excuse me, Senator. There. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, the, the last contribution does just de demonstrate that the coalition government doesn't grasp the situation that they're in. 
doesn't grasp their responsibilities. I think I've got five minutes to actually, by the way. Um, the, the, the government doesn't understand that, as Senator Patrick just said, with 12 months to prepare, it's the federal government's responsibility, the federal government's responsibility to de deliver quarantine services and vaccine services and a vaccine rollout that would keep Australians safe. You see, in the middle of last year, the Prime Minister said that all Australians overseas who wanted to come home would be home by Christmas. There's still 40,000 people waiting. In late, late last year, the Prime Minister said Australia would be at the front of the queue, the front of the queue for vaccines. Now we're last in the queue, a hundredth in the queue for vaccine delivery. This government's abjectly failed. The Prime Minister said four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. There's still less than three million Australians vaccinated now, and we're in May. The Prime Minister thinks this isn't a race. Of course it's a race. It's a race for our economy. It's a race for our public health. And the real human consequences of the government's failure to appreciate the urgency of the situation, to appreciate its responsibilities and to act, is the India ban last week. Lock them out and then threaten to lock them up. That's all that's left to this miserable excuse for a government. Its failure has real-world consequences for ordinary Australians. Last week, Ziva Narang, just 19 months old, staying with her grandmother. They couldn't get her, her family, on a, on a flight back last year. They are trapped. Here's what her parents told the committee. Every time I see her on the video cam, I feel like crying, but I can't cry in front of my own parents. It makes them so disheartened. And this miserable excuse for a government confounded completely. I remember having them all out there all through last year bellowing out, open the borders, open the borders, they said, confounded by the fact that Australians in the states and territories were rewarding the performance of state premiers who took a tough line on the pandemic. Well, you know what the difference was? The difference is that the state premiers have done their jobs. They have carefully examined their responsibilities, done their jobs and delivered, and the economic figures that ministers over there crow about are a result of the Senator delivery of the Ed, state governments, your time not the performance of this joke of a government. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, it is the responsibility of the Australian government to assist uh, Australians who are in difficulty overseas, not to criminalise them for coming home. I'm going to say that again. It is the responsibility of the Australian government to assist Australians who are in difficulty overseas, not to criminalise them for coming home. And certainly, any such decision to do so should properly be the decision of the parliament not some faceless official drafting an, an instrument and getting the minister to sign it into law. A single minister should never have the authority to outcast an Australian from coming home. It's improper and it's immoral. There are uh, powers available to the minister to deal with Australians that return home, to put them in quarantine, to make the uh, Australian citizenry uh, safe. Uh, the government has, of course, failed in its, uh, its setup of quarantine. We know from the COVID committee that it is a capacity restriction that has caused uh, this um, instrument to be uh, brought into effect. Uh, and I'd just indicate to the to the Senate, I'm um, noting it is on the notice paper now, that uh, uh, a bill. Uh, I will be introducing a bill tomorrow uh, in, in the Senate, a biosecurity amendment, no crime to return home bill, uh, which will seek to uh, firstly remove or repeal the instrument, but make sure that doesn't happen again. It will certainly allow the continuation of powers uh, for a uh, minister to deal with people who are here, but never should we criminalise an Australian for wanting to return home. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, 
Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, Australia is very fortunate to share many things with our friends in India. We are both democracies. In fact, India is the largest democracy in the world. Uh, we obviously share a love of cricket. Uh, we share cuisine. We share the rule of law. We share many other legal and bureaucratic systems. And of course, in this day and age, uh, we share, like India, a growing Indian Australian population. In fact, I saw some figures on the weekend which showed uh, that the Indian Australian community is the, now the fastest growing uh, migrant community in, uh, in Australia. Uh, and I think we, we now have over 700,000 uh, Indian Australians uh, living with us in this country and from whom we benefit. Uh, Indian Australians have made an enormous contribution to our country. Uh, whether that be in academic fields, in business fields, in community areas, in sport, so many ways, our own country has been enriched by the contribution of Indian Australians. So you can well understand why Indian Australians feel so desperately abandoned by their government at this time. India, uh, the world's largest democracy, we all know, is going through an absolute crisis. Uh, in terms of COVID infection rates at the moment, and it is extremely distressing that several thousand Indian Australian citizens are stranded in India at the moment. And the important point there is that no matter where uh, these citizens may have been born, it may well have been in India, but these are Australian citizens who have been let down by their government. Uh, I had the great honour of uh, hosting a forum uh, this weekend just passed with leaders of Brisbane and Gold Coast Indian communities uh, that was joined by Senator Wong as Shadow Foreign Minister and two of my other federal Labor colleagues. And it was entirely obvious the level of distress uh, that people in the Indian Australian community are experiencing right now. Now this government has tried to make this an argument about whether Australia's borders should be closed at this moment in time, and that's not what this is about. There is no one arguing that we should be bringing back all several thousand Indian Australian citizens now, but what this government should have done is put in place quarantine facilities so that we could be bringing back people safely rather than leaving them stranded overseas. Thank you, Senator Watt. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell of the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 22. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I thank senators. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. Uh, the documents are listed on pages five and six of today's order of business. I might allow senators to leave the chamber if they aren't participating in this part of the day, so I can figure out who's seeking the call. Uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, in terms of uh, page five, uh, I take note and seek leave to continue remarks on uh, numbers six, 14 and 15. Is leave granted? I'm seeking guidance from the whips. Is leave granted for Senator McC Yes, leave is granted. Thank you. Okay. And we'll come back to reports and government responses. That is the next part of the day. Yes. Anything further on the consideration of documents? Uh, Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, I wish to take note to document number 18 on page 6, um, which was the response from the South Australian Premier in response to a resolution of the Senate about not imposing um, discriminatory taxes upon electric vehicles. I really do want to note my disappointment in the response from the South Australian Premier, who outlined their intent to continue the South Australian government's proposal to impose a discriminatory tax on electric vehicles. And in doing so, in that letter, was re continuing to repeat the insinuation that such taxes are appropriate because electric vehicles supposedly don't pay their fair share. They uh, don't pay their fair share and don't contribute to, to tax revenue. Fortunately, in the time since we sent this letter to the premiers, um, we have had an economics committee um, 
inquiry and a hearing. And in fact, today there is a report from the Economics um, Legislation Committee on my private senator's bill, which was aiming to neutralise the potential impact of these discriminatory taxes on EVs. And I know that I'm not able to speak to that Legislation Committee report this afternoon. So I think it's worth actually bringing out some of the evidence that was presented to that committee in this um, time slot now. And in particular, with regard to this furphy that electric vehicles don't pay their way, we had so much evidence that showed that, in fact, the benefit to society and the benefit to government in terms of tax revenue from electric vehicles was overwhelming. That there was recent an analysis from E. Young. Ernst Young EY that was commissioned by the Electric Vehicle Council that quantified the net benefit of electric vehicles in Australia, where the average net benefit to government and society of an electric vehicle replacing an internal combustion engine vehicle is $8,763.40. This includes higher tax revenue from electric vehicle sales today during to, due to their comparatively higher upfront cost. In other words, even though electric vehicles aren't paying fuel excise because they're not burning dirty, polluting petrol, they are paying more than that in terms of the extra revenue because of electric vehicles currently being more expensive than internal combustion engines. So this whole furphy that electric vehicles aren't paying their way, which has continued in this response from the South Australian Premier, is completely that. And that we should be, in fact, encouraging, doing everything we can to encourage the uptake of electric vehicles. And in fact, there was a, so much evidence that was put to our, um, the economics committee hearing, where you know, the, and that committee report says that there was constant support for electric vehicles through most of the submissions, and a general consensus that more could be done to encourage Australian consumers to purchase electric vehicles, and that the idea of imposing a tax specifically on electric vehicles has met with significant um, opposition. And, and one of the other strong um, findings from the evidence that was presented, presented to our committee, which is not, which is in fact why the state governments are going it alone, is that there needs to be a consistent natural, national approach. We cannot have a hodgepodge of different taxing regimes and different approaches to electric vehicles across the state. And the logistics industry certainly told us that, that they did not want to see a whole range of different approaches. Uh, um, because that was going to be an extra regulatory burden on them. So what we need and what these um, responses from the state premiers are showing is that we need to have that consistent national approach. We need leadership from this government and it's leadership that is so lacking. And this is important because transport makes up 20 per cent of our carbon pollution. If we are going to do what Australia needs to do to slash our carbon pollution, to play our role in tackling the climate crisis, well, then we need to slash the pollution from transport. We need to be rapidly increasing the uptake of electric vehicles. But of course, this government are basically climate denialists. They are not showing leadership on electric vehicles because they don't think that it's important. They are happy to keep subsidising coal and gas and oil and, in fact, keeping on internal combustion vehicles for as long as they can keep riding along the, driving along the road. And meanwhile, electric vehicles are not even in the slow lane. They are broken down at the side of the road and there's no emergency response crew in, in sight. We are being total laggards here in Australia. We're being left behind. And the types of policies that the state governments have implemented um, in imposing selective discriminatory taxes have been described as the worst in the world. We absolutely have to do better. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Steele-John. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek uh, leave to take note of government document number 14, Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of uh, uh, Disabled People, Royal Commission, Public Hearing 5 response. Before I get you to do that, Senator Steele-John, um, can I just put the question on the ah. document that Senator Rice was um, speaking to, that the Senate take note of the document? All those in favour say aye, against, I think the ayes have it. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Thank you. Uh, I uh, 
in, in contributing uh, to uh, this uh, consideration of this document this evening, I am taken vividly back to uh, those very frightening times uh, not so long ago, uh, when the pandemic first reached uh, our shores, uh, and it became very clear to us as disabled people, uh, as it became clear to many members of many at-risk uh, communities uh, in our country. Uh, that our government uh, did not have a proper plan, uh, whether it was uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, whether it was older Australians, uh, whether it was disabled people, um, very, very quickly it became clear that we had been forgotten, that the systems and processes that were uh, spinning up, that were coming into place, were leaving us out. And it was a quite terrifying time uh, as disabled people all over the country dropped the vital work that we were doing, primarily work in preparation uh, for uh, the Royal Commission into Disability Abuse, uh, to scramble together and attempt to call upon our government to take action, to take necessary steps. It felt at the time that there was not a single person within the health department whose dedicated job it was to ensure that the pandemic response met the needs of disabled people. Now that Royal Commission heard our concerns and shared them and called on the UN rapporteur to intervene to make statements. And a hearing was held into the government's response and its treatment of disabled people during the pandemic, and it vindicated those very concerns as it found that there was not a single person in the entire Australian Department of Health with the dedicated responsibility of ensuring that disabled people, 4.4 million Australians, with a historically disadvantaged access uh, to the healthcare system at the best of times. Need I remind the Chamber that the life expectancy of an intellectually disabled Australian is 24 years less than that of the rest of the population. That this community, at risk, did not have a single person on the job. Those were the findings of the Commission. That is the evidence it took. Today we have a response from the government to that interim report. And I note with deep concern that to the critical recommendation at 16 made uh, to ensure that the Quality and Safeguards uh, Commission's policies and procedures and practices reflect its powers and responsibilities to actively protect and preserve the safety, health and well-being of disabled people, of national disability insurance participants, this recommendation has merely been noted. Sometimes it does feel as though there is a central lack of humanity at the heart of this government. Particularly on days when I come into this place and I hear senators on the other side of the chamber speak about the death of a disabled child waiting for vital equipment and make the observation that occasionally some things go wrong. I ask you whether that reflects the humanity that the Australian people expect of their government. Has the government learned? I fear not. This very Monday, the Royal Commission shall reconvene to hold yet another special hearing into the treatment of disabled people in relation to the vaccine rollout, from which we have at various times been excluded and forgotten once again. Again and again, disabled people request that this government, our government, listen to us, engage with us, support us to live a good life. And again and again, this government fails. We die, we struggle, we suffer. This Monday, we will see another opportunity to get to the truth. The truth must be heard and acted upon. Senator Steele, John, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? I'm seeking leave to Thank continue Thank you very much. Remarks. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave 
uh, to speak to document number 17 uh, in relation to a letter received from the Northern Territory Attorney General. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I'm frustrated, sad, angry, and absolutely over the oppressive regimes in this country against this country's first people. Uh, the Labor Territory government's oppressive and, I would say, racist knee-jerk actions that will see more of our kids and babies sucked into the colonial criminal system. Let's be honest here. What the Attorney General of the Northern Territory is talking about in this letter is not about community safety. It's about building an even bigger school-to-prison pipeline. The Territory government has backed off its commitment to implement the Northern Territory Royal Commission recommendations. In fact, the co-commissioner, Mick Gooder, says the government learnt nothing. What's the point of having a royal commission? We see that with deaths in custody. Now we see it with black kids in, in custody. Uh, sorry, but if that ain't racist, then what is? This knee-jerk reaction will expand youth remand centres and give police unprecedented powers. It will restrict bail and diversion options for young people. And this is a direct contradiction to the Northern Territory Royal Commission recommendations. In fact, this is really what is the 21st century sophistication of genocide in this country. That's what it is. It's today's genocide couldn't wipe us out, so lock us up. What kind of government wants to honour or wants to be honoured for increasing their population of kids behind bars? Who's proud of that? Which minister or MP can stand up and say, yep, I locked up another black kid? It's disgusting. You all should be ashamed of yourselves. We know who will be most affected by these changes. Black kids. We know that the, these systems are full of our kids, and a lot of those kids have got disabilities. They shouldn't even be in there in the first place. There was an open letter sent to the Northern Territory government just last week by a group of experts from organisations working in child and adolescent health. I do hope the Attorney General given he probably didn't read the Royal Commission recommendations, hopefully he listens to these experts. Hopefully they're white, and you know, white is right in this place. They pointed out that young people in the criminal legal system have complex needs. And there is a huge number of kids in the system with FASD. For example, these kids should not be locked up. They need diversionary programs and support services and it needs to be self-determined by their local communities. We know that the NT prison system doesn't have the supports or services these young people need when they have complex health needs and disabilities. Medicare doesn't even cover these kids in this system. So how can they get help? How can they get support? They're not criminals. These kids are not criminals. Having a bite of a, chocolate, of a stolen chocolate bar is not a reason to lock a kid up. How many times do governments need to hear that punitive responses do not change the behaviour pattern? It doesn't rehabilitate people and it doesn't keep communities safe. The Attorney General and the Labor Chief Minister aren't serious about doing the things that work because they're more interested in racing the country libs to the bottom. A government that actually wanted to prevent youth offending becoming devastating tragedies would keep kids out of the endless cycle of criminalisation in the first place. Throwing kids in watch houses will not do this. The Territory should be making sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal servers have the resources they need to keep our kids out of the criminal legal system. They should be providing stable, culturally appropriate housing mental health and family support services. 
A government with a spine would be raising the age of legal responsibility to at least 14 and implementing strong, culturally safe diversion reprograms. Senator Thorpe, your time has expired. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Yes. Thank you very much. Any further contributions on the consideration of documents? Uh, Senator Walters. Uh, yes, Acting Deputy President. I um, seek leave to take note of and then to continue my remarks on uh, document number six. Is okay. leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Thank you very much. If that is all for this part of the day, I will move on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Brockman. On behalf of the Chair of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, Senator Askew, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the provisions of the Social Services Legislation Amendment Strengthening Income Support Bill 2021. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration, I present an interim report of the Committee on, the, on Australia's Skilled Migration Program, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Brockman. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I make a report by way of a statement uh, relating to the draft budget estimates for the Australian National Audit Office and the Parliamentary Budget Office for 2021-22, and I table the statement. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Uh, Senator Waters. Uh, yes, Acting Deputy President, I would like to take note of that most recent uh, report of the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit relating to the ANAO and the PBO. Thank you very much. Well, um, this is a very interesting uh, little report, and it's a it's a frankly a little known committee. With my humble apologies to those that um, populate the committee. But it's uh, made a very interesting recommendation. It's essentially said that the PBO and the ANAO, two of our important accountability uh, mechanisms in our, in our structures of government, are underfunded and deserve to have more funding. So that's, um, that's a very encouraging report, given that we have, uh, sadly, for many, many years, these organisations have been uh, running on the smell of an oily rag um, and had their capacity and output has been uh, projected to diminish should they not receive additional top-up funding in the budget. Now, of course, we'll all find out in what two and a bit hours' time now whether or not this government is going to fund the Parliamentary Budget Office and the Australian National Audit Office uh, to do the valuable work that they do. But it's um, encouraging uh, that this report is suggesting that they do just that. So it would be a very brave government that ignores the recommendations of uh, its own committee. So I, I, I'm an eternal optimist and I look for some, uh, some positive signs and one hopes that that's what we'll see tonight because we have a very impoverished transparency structure um, at the federal level of government. We don't have a federal corruption watchdog. We have a, an Australian National Audit Office, or an ANAO as they're known, who do amazing work but who are really worked to the bone, um, sadly because of the uh, massive amount of dodginess that this government keeps coming up with. Um, they've got a lot to do and they don't have a lot of funding to do it with. Now, Likewise, the PBO, which is a, an initiative that the Greens are really proud to have been part of um, establishing when we were in minority government with um, then Prime Minister Gillard, which is essentially a, a budget honesty mechanism that allows parties to seek independent costing of their election promises, and indeed once an election is called, uh, parties are required to do that so that there's a level of transparency and accountability to the public so that they know that um, costings of promises uh, can be added up and either, either they add up or they don't. In the Greens, of course, they always add up. So two really important bodies that are all the more important precisely because we don't have a federal corruption watchdog. Now that's another interesting point because in last year's budget there was funding for a federal corruption watchdog, but we still don't have a copy of the bill. And in the most recent uh, Senate estimates, I asked the, um, the the minister who was representing at the time. Turns out they're going to do a third round of consultation on the shape of a federal corruption watchdog. Well. 
I suspect the third round of consultation will tell you exactly what the first and second rounds told you. We need one. It should have teeth. It needs to be independent, and it needs decent funding to do its job. Um, and all the powers of royal commissions and various other um, really good suggestions. So that is a delay mechanism if I ever saw one. It's as plain as day. Um, so in the absence of a watchdog with teeth to actually do the job um, that is so desperately needed, we really need the PBO and the ANAO to get the funding that they are asking for to do their job. Now, just on the ANAO, they've got a, um, a very proud history of uh, scrutinising government expenditure and government um, actions, and it's led to some rather embarrassing reports, I might point out. Embarrassing for the government, that is, because the ANAO has ex uh, exposed incidences of dodgy conduct, um, sometimes to a level that I would consider uh, to be corruption again, exactly why we need a corruption watchdog. But one wonders if that's why the ANAO has fallen out of favour with this government, precisely because the ANAO is holding this government to account. Now, the fact is um, the ANAO have a target of uh, uh, undertaking uh, 48 um, audits a year, but because of other obligations that they're also <laughs> legislatively required to undertake, um, their resources are being diminished. And without an additional uh, top-up of funding, their capacity to undertake audits of government dodginess is going to reduce by 20 per cent. Now, the ANAO investigations led to uh, sports rorts being revealed. It had a hand in revealing sports rorts number two. Um, there's a list of uh, documents just in today's read uh, where the ANAO has investigated other conduct that's unseemly at best and often downright dodgy at worst. And again, this is exactly why we need a strong and independent federal corruption watchdog and a well-resourced ANAO. Standards need to improve. Even in my time here, nigh on 10 years, the level of accountability and conduct that's deemed acceptable has just reached all-time lows. We need these bodies to be strong, to do a good job. They need appropriate funding because the, the standard of behaviour here, the standard of decision-making, the, the callousness with which public money is allocated and the flagrant um, electioneering and pork barrelling that goes on, um, it, it's, just, it's worse than it's ever been. So um, I'm really pleased that this uh, joint Committee of Public Audit and uh, Public Accounts and Audit have noted the requests for additional funding made by the ANAO and by the PBO, um, and we would endorse those requests. And the government will be judged tonight on whether or not it has increased the funding of those two integral integrity bodies, and it will certainly be judged on its continued failure to deliver on a corruption watchdog. Um, and on all the other elements of the budget. So, um, with that, I commend this report to the Senate. Um, Senator Waters, you seek leave to continue your remarks, my, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Senator Sheldon. Is this on the same report? Uh, no, it's on item 14, uh, which is regarding the Australian Skilled Migration Program, and I'll be taking note and seeking leave to continue. Yes. Yes. Good. Good. Right uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. I just want to say, look, you know, this, for anyone who's read this report, you'd actually be amazed to find that there is so many weaknesses in what this government is proposing. It is actually not about skilled migration program. It's about how to unskill Australians, and it's about how to exploit those workers brought in from overseas. There are several deeply dis disappointing aspects of this document. The recommendations from the government members have made are quite simply outrageous. They're streamlining, they say, in those words, or more, more accurately, trashing labour market testing. They want to make it easier for employers to bypass their current requirement to look for local workers. More employers will go straight to temporary visa workers instead, and the government also wants to reserve the quarantine spots and flights for temporary migrants. How many war ways can you whack the Australian community? This government has no idea what it's doing. Oh, oh, second thoughts, they do. They want to suppress wages. 
They've very successfully done that. The wages have never been lower of this last eight years of this government, and now we see stagnant wages. This is the first government that actually has declined the middle class in this country. Because it was a middle class job being a care worker. It was a middle class job being a cleaner. It was a middle class job being a transport worker. But what this government has done is turn around and rip the heart out of those jobs that brought the middle class into this country. For the family members of 40,000 Australian citizens who are still stuck overseas and desperate to come home, this decision also is absolutely heartbreaking. In the past 12 months, our immigration system has come to a total pause. This year, of course, since, first since 1946, more people left Australia than entered it. This government has delivered the first worst vaccine rollout and abject failure to invest in quarantine facilities. It's no wonder we're looking at limited immigration for months to come, because the government has spent 11, uh, eight long years—it feels like 11 now going into nine long years underspending on education and training, our nation's workforce is facing a disastrous shortage of skills. At this government's feet, young Australians, older Australians, all Australians are second class in their own country. And of course, we all know that immigration is incredibly important for this country, but immigrants who provide our country with drive and imagination, our rich multicultural society, and of course, in the past, what happened was migrant labourers, for example, on projects like the Snowy Hydro Scheme, was given a path to permanent residency and citizenship. The government used support to support apprenticeships. They used to support apprenticeships and TAFEs. Employers would provide on-the-job training, and all that has changed. Because now what the government's proposing, don't put any money into training. It's cheaper to bring people from overseas to come and do this work not to skill Australians and to give the opportunity for future generations, let alone the reskilling of Australia that we need in the, with the challenges with the future of work. Of course, TAFE funding is going down, not up. According to the Independent Education Union, TAFE funding is now lower than it was a decade ago. Seventy per cent of courses have had funding cuts. Instead, our skill gaps are filled with endless temporary workers with few or little rights. And of course, very few of these people ultimately have an opportunity to become permanent residents. Now, if the coronavirus pandemic has shown us anything, it's shown us the utter failure of the system this government has brought in place. According to the OECD, Australia is now home to the second largest temporary migrant population in the developed world, right behind the United States of America. We're number two. In the hospitality industry, around one in five chefs, one in four cooks and one in five waiters hold temporary visas. We aren't training people for the future. We aren't training hard-working Australians for an opportunity to be in our, our important industries. Now, of course, our fourth largest export is international education. But it should be a national embarrassment that we can educate the world while facing skill shortages in our own backyard. This budget's current reliance on temporary visa workers is bad for everybody. It's bad for those visa holders who are dependent on an employer to keep their job, who can get exploited by unscrupulous operators preying on their vulnerability. Now, a study this year by Unions New South Wales showed that over 80 per cent of Sydney's international students were illegally and shamefully underpaid. This is an unacceptable level of exploitation right here in Australia. It puts unfair pressure on other employers who try to do the right thing. And it locks out Australians who want to be employed in a fairly paid job. Many visa holders come to this country because they want to become Australians. Our system provides far too few opportunities to become permanent Australians or citizens. But most of all, this strategy, this policy from this government, is bad for wages. It's bad for a wages-based enterprise bargaining system. How, as a visa holder, do you enter into bargaining negotiations with your employer? How does two million, 
temporary week worker visa holders in this country turn around and bargain under the enterprise bargaining system. But of course, the government's answer to that was that we'll make it easier. We'll give them even less rights, for even the rights they've got now they can't exercise without retribution and be deport potential, uh, potentiality of being deported at the employer's whim. And of course, we've seen this in the aged care sector, where now the government suggesting and have been suggesting now consistently for a number of months that aged care workers should be workers that own temporary visas and have the hide to sit here and tell us what they're doing for the Australian community in, skill, in the skill areas and in aged care, and not making those jobs the middle-class jobs they should be, because they have middle-class responsibilities, they just don't have middle-class wages. And this government is directly responsible for that strategy. They're responsible because it's the policies they put in place regards temporary visas, and they're responsible because they have a clear responsibility about making sure that decent wages are delivered in an area they f substantially fund. No procurement requirements, no responsibility, no training, and the answer is, let's bring somebody in we can exploit. It's that simple. Well, currently, these workers are exploited ruthlessly by bad operators. They undercut those employers who are trying to do the right thing, as I said. Now, it's an outrageous situation. What we've got the government now saying is that not they will decide who comes into this country. Bad employers will decide who comes into this country. Employers that exploit, rip off and won't employ Australians. And not only will they do that and allow them to do it, they're actually making it cheaper for them to do it. That's a government working against this community and the Australian, Australia's future in work and, and skills. Now, there's a role for temporary visas, and there's a, of course, and there is a genuine temporary visa shortage in certain skills. If skills are rare and hard to find, then that needs to be considered. But there's been a number of important reports that this government has also put in place. John Azari's wrote a recent report of that National Agricultural Workforce Strategy in March this year, and previous reports by the same author in various panels under this government which called for the opportunity to employ and engage more Australians, to have an appropriate system that actually balances and checks. Because I'm one of those silly people. I remember when all the chefs were people that were trained here and as apprentices. But when it's cheaper to do it overseas, I don't blame the employers for doing that, because you've made the opportunity for them to do it. What I do blame is those employers that exploit and you allow that to do it and you encourage it by your policy and those decent employers who stand up for hard-working Australians by giving them jobs and opportunity and fair wages. In April, The Guardian reported the story of a German woman named Nina who took it for granted that she would, uh, would work for three months for as little as $35 for full day's work just to fill, fulfil her visa requirements. She knew that she was being ripped off, but she had no choice but to carry on. And of course, it's not just the hospitality industry. The same thing is happening actually in the meat and livestock in, uh, in the meat industry, you know, in, the, in the abattoirs, where a lot of these jobs are being given over to what were good, well-paid local jobs to hard-working Australians, has now been given to short-term temporary visa holders, again, who have no say, no real right, because they, they are temporary and they can be easily disposed of by the employer. That's why they're employed. It's quite clear that instead we're stuck with this policy of this government that doesn't have any real vision, only a plan on how to demolish skilled Australia. Senator Sheldon, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Yes, I did seek leave to continue. Thank you. Senator Shikoni. Uh, look, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also wanted to speak uh, briefly on the, on the same report that Senator Sheldon has um, quite uh, eloquently and articulated, I guess, some very good points around the, the reliance and over-reliance, I think, of temporary migration in this country. And it's really in light of, uh, of the last 12, 18 months, this country does need to have a good hard look at itself um, about where we are heading as a nation um, in terms of our temporary migration in this country. Um, as a member of the Joint Standing Committee for uh, Migration and, and the interim report that's been um, tabled here today in the Senate on Australia's skilled migration or, or lack of skills and as um, Senator Sheldon also mentioned, de-skilling Australians, because ultimately this is what this is about, the recommendations that were put forward by government senators and, and government members of, um, of the committee in what can only be described as very hasty, short, 
uh, rushed process. You know, three days for an inquiry, three days that we had to jam pack witnesses. Um, it was quite obvious, having been to some of those, um, I couldn't obviously go to all the hearings uh, over those three days because it was all set up and, and, and rushed very quickly. Even the departments, the department secretaries and their representatives that appeared before the inquiry uh, weren't even in a position to answer questions that were asked by Labor senators and members on the day and had to take quite a few answers on notice because uh, they weren't prepared. And it just shows you that this government already had predetermined, in my opinion, predetermined uh, outcomes that they wanted to see as part of this uh, report in time for Budget Week. And I guess we'll have to wait and see what comes out of the budget later tonight. But I've um, been a member of that committee now since I was uh, appointed initially and then elected into this place. And there's always been, I guess, uh, a goodwill bipartisanship on that committee. But unfortunately, that bipartisan nature has been thrown out the door. Um, certainly, we've cooperated on a lot of matters with the government, but to date, um, that last report really did put a bad taste in our mouths. And given how important migration is to this country, migrants have built this nation. Mm. You know, my parents came here back in the late 60s, and there would be a lot of stories in this place too about migrants and the great story, the great success story of what makes Australia such a great nation around the world, uh, our multicultural and diverse community. Um, and we should be very proud about our, our, our migration history. But sadly, the government has chosen to play politics with this. And um, I would just hope that once the final report is tabled in this place later in the year, um, that we can actually say some more complimentary things rather than this haste and you know, rushed process mm -hmm. just to satisfy, I guess, the government's budget response later tonight. Mm. Um, Look, we were left, as we being Labor senators and members were left with no other choice but to write a dissenting report. Uh, and it was probably one of the strongest dissenting reports that I've seen in my, in my time in this place, and, and rightly so. Rightly so. There was no doubt about, and we should not make no mistake about this, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the recommendations in this report constitute an attack on working people, whether they're Australians or, or migrants, but in particular to locals in Australia. Should they be adopted by the government, the recommendations, that is, they would deliver poorer outcomes, poorer outcomes for Australia and Australian workers. Um, as I've said, Australia is a migration nation, and proudly so. Uh, but what Labor does oppose uh, was some of the recommendations, and I just want to go through some of these just now. The recommendation in the report would see us undermining the labour market testing, which would make it harder for Australians to find a job. To find a job. Right now, unemployment is still high, and uh, there is a lot of work out there. But what this does is that employers, and there were a lot of witnesses that appeared, including the Business Council of Australia, to openly saying that they would rather have migrants coming to Australia rather than looking for locals mm. to fill those jobs. And there is just so many roles right now, so many roles. Uh, we also oppose the effective scrapping of the Skilling Australia Fund, which would make it harder for young Australians young Australians to get the skills that they need. And, and this touches on the point that Senator Sheldon had made. We are effectively de-skilling mm. not just current Australians, but future Australians as well. Um, we are also opposed to the immediate expansion of the skills shortage list, which would put the jobs of Australian hospitality workers, tradespeople, people working in manufacturing and seafarers all at risk. Why? Why would we want to do that? Right now, given the geopolitical environment that we're in, given the, the experience that we've all experienced in the last 12, 18 months with COVID, why on earth would we want to start to de-skill and put the jobs of many people at risk in manufacturing, seafaring, uh, transport, retail, hospitality, tourism, all these industries? Hairdressing. Hairdressing. You know, we've even got cooks on the list that apparently we don't have enough cooks. Well, why aren't we training people? I mean, we've got TAFEs, we've got universities, excellent institutions. Let's put the money into those bodies, into those organisations. Let's skilling people up. Now is the time to do so. Now, at a time when Australians are doing their best to get back on their feet or simply to get by, this is the support, in inverted commas, that this government has promised to offer them. These recommendations are not appropriate. 
They do not warrant and, if anything, are counterproductive. And it is clear from the way in which this inquiry has been conducted, the pace and the lack of appropriate consideration of evidence that's been provided. And I know, um, you know those opposite might take issue with this, but really, if we are to have an inquiry, and it is to hear all sides of the story, let's not just have as witnesses those on the, employ on the, on the employer side. There was not one trade union movement representative. There was not one body that represented the workers, all the migrants, all the settled services that offer support to migrants in this nation. Not one. But yet we had the department and we had plenty of employer associations. And that's nothing wrong with that. But let's have a fair and balanced approach, fair and balanced evidence before any inquiry in this place. But it was so one-sided that made it laughable, quite frankly. And it's just simply clear in the way that this, sadly, how this inquiry was conducted. And in some ways, I guess, it represented a wish list from those opposite on migration reform. So I just do want to make it very clear, abundantly clear that is, that Labor does not support them, does not support the recommendations in the report, and that is why we did submit a dissenting report. We oppose them, each and every one of these recommendations, and we'll continue to oppose them. And I really do hope that the government and, and members of the, the committee take note of, of what uh, myself and others have said about this report, not just here in the Senate but also in the House of Representatives. Because we do want to work with government making sure that we have a strong migration system, one that does have benefits for our economy, that does benefit Australian workers. But we can't do so when you start ripping the guts out of our industrial relations system, start ripping the guts the pain conditions of Australian workers. Now, we are in very dangerous times at the moment, very interesting times, times where we don't know where we could end up in the next 12, 18 months with COVID. But yet we need to provide that confidence to Australian workers right now, not the other way around. So again, we will oppose um, the recommendations and we'll continue to do so. Um, and I'm sad to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, you know, we are trying to offer the government you know, I guess an opportunity to work with us. Come and work with us, um, and I guess we'll see where that goes over the coming months once we do report, um, so once we do submit a final report. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Shikoni. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I um, rise to take note of item 40, page 8 of the notice paper, the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee's report on the data availability and transparency bill. 2020. Um, uh, and uh, with your indulgence, I would just say I want to associate myself with the remarks that Senator Choney and Senator Sheldon made about the previous bill. It is a strongly worded dissenting report from the Labor senators. I'd encourage everybody on the other side to read it and have a careful think about um, what approach this government is going to take uh, on temporary migration. Um, if used properly, uh, data sharing and data matching can, of course, create rich data sets that can be used to deliver government Order, services Senator Ayres, better. Uh, apologies. Yes. Um, my understanding is because the report that you wish to speak to is um, a legislation report, the opportunity to speak to it is when the bill comes on in the Senate. Thank you. Order, Senator Ayres. I've, I'm sure there will be a time for the day for you to have that uh, conversation another time. Senator Rice, you are seeking the call. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I wish to take note to document 27, which was the government's response to the Finance and Public Ad Administration References Committee report on lessons to be learned in relation to the Australian bushfire season 2019-20. Yes, I'm not seeing anything from the clerk, so I think you can take note Excellent. of that. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Rice. Um, and in fact, that's what I thought that um, Senator Ayres was going to get up and speak to as the chair of the committee that undertook this, um, this inquiry or, and is still undertaking this inquiry. Um, look, I just wanted to comment. Um, the recommendation, there, was, there were 
13 recommendations, I think it is, that, and very reasonable, sensible recommendations that our committee put together on what need in this interim report. And the government only seen fit to support three of them. Um, the rest are merely noted, or there was one that was supported um, in principle. And there are some critical ones that the government has only noted, and I, I wish to speak to them. But firstly, um, talking about the one, um, one of the three which they do support, and that's that basically the need to streamline application processes for dis disaster recovery funding arrangements, the need to harmonise eligi eligibility criteria, and the need to remove impediments for applying for betterment and mitigation initiatives. I'm glad that the government saw fit to support this one, because it is, it is the bottom line of when you go and talk to people and the evidence that our committee is still receiving of the difficulty of getting support, of the multiple layers of bureaucracy that you still need to go through to get support. It is a complete maze that people find so difficult to, to be navigating through. We have to be able to do better to be supporting communities. I had the privilege last week of travelling through East Gippsland, which of course was dr drastically and dramatically and tragically af affected by fires in the 2019-20 Black Summer fires, where over 80 per cent of the forests of East Gippsland were burnt. And look, you know, I've been travelling all of my, I've visited all my adult life areas of southern Australia that have been affected by bushfires. You're used to travelling through bushfire-affected areas, and you know, you're driving along the highway, you're driving through an area that's been burnt, and then you move into areas that haven't been burnt. The experience I had last week was very different to that. You just kept on driving through burnt areas, and you kept on travelling through burnt areas, and everywhere you went, the forest was burnt. There were only tiny bits of forest that weren't burnt. And so I think we really need to take note of the scale of the impact of these fires and also to be aware that these fires are going to continue to become more intense, more frequent, more extreme as time goes on due to the climate crisis. We are facing hotter and drier conditions. So we've got to get really serious and really clever about how we respond to these fires. First of all, of course, we need to be tackling the climate crisis. We need to be reducing, reducing our carbon pollution. We need to get out of burning coal and gas and oil. But even if we do that, and I urge the government to take on board that. I know they're not going to do it in the budget tonight, but they need to. Otherwise, they are climate denialists. Otherwise, they are putting our community at risk. And last week, I just saw what the impacts of our climate crisis are, of the fires that swept through, which were hotter, which were more intense, which were more extensive. I met with representatives from MADRA, the Malakuta and District Recovery Agency, which is basically working across the Malakuta community to work out what needs to happen in terms of recovery. What can they learn? What can they you know, pass on to other communities? And there are a couple of key things that were needed if we are going to genuinely be making it easier for people to um, recover from bushfires. And the, the core thing is to have a community-led response and to empower communities, to resource communities, to build community connectedness and community resilience. I mean, in the Having experienced the fires, of course, the, Mala the Malakuta community are really aware of what needs to happen. And MADRA has been set up as an elected committee from right across the Malakuta um, area. And it, they had an election that was overseen by the Victorian Electoral Commission. 87 per cent of eligible residents in the Malakuta area, they voted for their representative of the committee. So you've got a committee that's now been set up in Malakuta, which is very representative of the local community. And the key thing that they are doing is bringing the community together. It's educating the community. It's supporting the community. And this is the sort of work that needs to be done right across the country, not just in communities that have just been affected by fire, but basically way beforehand. And Mal the Malakuta residents knew that if there had been work to build that community resilience before the fires, they would have been in a much better place after the fires. And 
essentially a model of, of what's needed and what, what this government needs to take on board, what we as Australians need to take on board, is, is building that sort of community-led response. It's bringing together community members. It's bringing together um, indigenous, indigenous members of our, of our community, the First Nations, and with their knowledge about fire. It's bringing together the ecological knowledge of of the impact of that fire and how fires are changing under climate change and how fires are specific to particular different ecological um, forest types across the country. And it's bringing together, obviously, what are the assets that we need to be protecting? How are we going to be protecting them? What is the value of doing planned burns? Because that was also very evident from my trip last week, that just going out there and burning more forest um, is not going to solve. It's not going to make people safe. I mean, people are fearful. People want to be told that they are going to be safe. And unfortunately, in the hotter, drier, climate crisis-fueled climate that we are under, we can't be, we can't promise that the people of Malakuta and other communities at risk from fire are going to be safe. All we can do is to say that we'll do what we can to be making you safer. But it's got to be a sophisticated response. It's got to be not just the sort of let's go out there and burn and pretend to people that, that make them safe. Because the evidence from the Black, the Black Summer fires is that that's not the way to do it. Yes, there is a role for hazard reduction burning, but it's got to be done in a sophisticated way. It's got to be done in a way that, um, where it is supported by science. It's got to be done with a clear understanding of what you're achieving by doing that hazard reduction burning. And at the moment, that's not what's going on around the country. Um, one of the other recommendations that the government has only noted was recommendation seven, which was for um, essentially better mental health support. I'll just find it here in my, in my um, document. That the, the recommendation was that the, the committee recommends that the Commonwealth Government make the Better Access Bushfire Recovery Initiative and the Better Access Bushfire Recovery Telehealth Initiatives permanent mental health support services, with both initiatives properly funded over the four estimates. Sadly, the government only noted this recommendation. They didn't commit to doing that. They said they recognised the need for continued mental health support and providing funding, but it's very clear, again from my trip last week, that the funding that is currently being provided and the support for people's mental health as they are still dealing with the trauma of those fires is not meeting the need. In particular, I spoke to a mental health nurse who worked out of Orbost, who was servicing communities in very remote areas of East Gippsland, in um, Bendock and Tubbot, Goongarra and Bonang. And her work is she's basically only a day a week, and there is no ongoing certainty about the funding for her mental health outreach, and that she's tried to get support for, to have an ongoing um, bush nursing um, provision to be providing the health support and the mental health support to these remote communities and has been currently knocked back. So that clearly, again, governments at both state and federal level need to be listening to the community, genuinely engaging as to what the needs of those communities are, and actually then implementing it, rather than having a top-down approach that the government knows best, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to hold on to the power, we're going to do what's good for you, community, rather than supporting and facilitating communities to come together and to be working with government in a genuine way to actually work out what the best way forward is. And finally, I want to go to the, uh, one of the other recommendations that the government said that they support and that was to fund mitigation projects through the Emergency Response Fund. And I thought, well, that's great. They're funding mitigation projects. What does it mean when you're funding mitigation in the, in the case of bushfires? And to me, mitigation, that means what are we going to be doing to be reducing the risk of fires? And it's very clear. The lessons from Black, the Black Summer was that we need to be tackling our climate crisis, and we need to be tackling Thank it you, urgently. Thank you, Senator Rice. Your time has expired. Do you wish? Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Um, look, I will seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted. Sake, but... Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. <laughs> That's right. Senator Giacomo. Thank you, Madam 
Deputy President. Um, I just wanted to take note of items 32 and 33 on page 7 and seek leave to continue my okay, remarks. Okay, so let's just double check. There's no other documents on page 6 that anyone, any senator wishes to take note of? No? I thought we did that. Sorry. Uh, okay, so which documents? Sorry, At 32 you... and 33 on page 7. Right, and you're seeking leave I to do. continue your remarks? Uh, okay, so I think that uh, finishes reports and government responses. No one wants anything on page eight, down to number 37. No? Okay. Um, all right, so that concludes that part of the business. Um, are there any ministerial statements? Thank you. The president has received a letter nominating senators to be members of a committee. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be appointed to the Select Committee on Job Security as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to messages from the House. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill 2021 and Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 4 Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Clark. For an act to amend the law relating to taxation, superannuation, industry codes and the coronavirus economic response and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Mutual Recognition Act 1992 and for related purposes. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 4 Bill 2021 and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Extension and Other Measures Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Act 2016 and for related purposes. Minister. I table an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order for the day for a later hour. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Archives and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the bill with an amendment and requesting the concurrence of the Senate in the amendment. Minister. I move that the message be considered in the Committee of the Whole immediately. So the question is that the motion as moved by the Minister uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So we're now in Committee of the Whole. Minister. I move that the Committee agree to the amendment made by the House of Representatives. So the question is, do, are you wishing to speak to that? Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. 
Uh, Labor supports the amendment to the bill made in the House. Our staff deserve nothing less than a completely safe and supportive workplace. The independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces by Commissioner Kate Jenkins is going to be enormously important in changing the culture in this place. This bill is necessary to ensure that our staff can participate in that review and be assured that their privacy and confidentiality will be protected. <coughs> Since the bill's passage in the Senate, further consultation has occurred with current and former staff, resulting in an additional protection being agreed and passed in the House in the form of this amendment. The amendment ensures that staff with current or historical complaints lodged with the Department of Finance are not prevented from accessing documentation about their complaint through the FOI process. The amendment does not erode the protections afforded by this bill to ensure the complete privacy and confidentiality of participants in the review. With the passing of the bill through the Senate today, I hope that Commissioner Jenkins will move swiftly to open submissions so that we can begin the process of long overdue reform. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Waters. Deputy President, if I could just add some brief remarks Certainly. which encourage every member of staff, every MP, uh, anyone covered under the MOPS Act or who work in this building to participate in the Jenkins review. The culture of this place will not change until we shine a light on all of the problems with it. And we strongly encourage everyone to participate and also have supported this amendment to give additional protection um, and comfort to those who wish to involve themselves in this, in this process. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to, which is, and that is the amendment made by the House of Reps. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, I think we're now reporting. Thank you. So the report from the Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered message number 395 from the House of Representatives relating to the Archives and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 and has agreed to the amendment made by the House of Representatives to the bill. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 12 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives as follows informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the biosecurity amendment clarifying conditiona conditionality non-prohibited goods bill 2021 without amendment, informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's jobs and economic recovery bill of 2021, informing the Senate that the House has concurred with the resolution of the Senate relating to the rate of suicide among current and former serving Australian Defence Force personnel and informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr Hill in the place of Mr Gorman to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services. I think we might have a few more messages. We're just waiting for those. <coughs> The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence, Appropriation Bill No. 3, 2020-21 and Appropriation Bill No. 4, 2020-21. Minister. I, I move that these bills may proceed without formalities and be taken together and now read for a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe, the ayes have it. I call the clerk. To appropriate additional money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the Ordinary Annual Services of the Government and for related purposes, bill for an act to appropriate additional money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for certain expenditure and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted.
uh, I believe I'm calling you, Senator Watt. Madam Deputy President, uh, these bills seek to appropriate additional funding for the 2020-21 financial year, largely relating to the measures delivered in last year's mid-year economic and fiscal outlook, otherwise known as MIEFO. Uh, $2.5 billion is allocated from Bill No. 3 and a further $141.3 million is sought from Bill No. 4. Labor won't stand in the way of these appropriations, as is our practice with appropriations. The reality is the spending contained in these bills has been dwarfed over the past few months. We've borne witness to announcement after announcement, media drop after media drop, containing billions upon billions of dollars announced in new spending. We've seen nearly $55 billion in new spending flagged since MIEFO and over $30 billion in the last week alone. But in the avalanche of spending that we've seen, we have to look past the glossy headlines. That's because in tonight's budget we'll again see a deficit of delivery, a deficit of credibility and a deficit of vision. Yet another political con job from the master of marketing, the Prime Minister, long on announcements and short on delivery from a, vis from a visionless government that waits until there's an absolute crisis before it acts or an election that is not too far off into the distance. And then it's all about acting in its own political self-interest for self-preservation. And the essential truth of this budget tonight is that it's designed to get the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, through an election. We don't yet know when that will be or whether there'll be another budget between now and then, but it, this is certainly a political budget designed to serve Scott Morrison and the government's interests, not deliver for the Australian people. The fact is that this government has been in office now for eight long years. At the next election, they'll be asking for 12 years. That's longer than the Howard government. After eight long years of the Liberals and Nationals, what do we have? Four million Australians are in insecure, casual or gig work. Two million Australians are unable to find work at all or unable to find the hours that they need to survive. There are 140,000 fewer apprenticeships. There are 90,000 fewer manufacturing jobs. Out-of-pocket health costs have gone up by more than a third. Childcare costs have gone up by more than a third. And you now have to work even longer just to save enough to buy your own home. It's only now, right before an election, when all the pollsters are telling them that women voters don't trust them, that this government starts caring about women. It's only now, after eight long years, that this government is finally making promises about funding for childcare. It's only now, because they think there are votes in it, that they're announcing funding for roads. And I might add, in my home state and Senator McGrath's home state, this government is actually spending less per capita on infrastructure than any other state in this country. The state that returned the Morrison government is being given a slap in the face with half the funding, half the new funding for infrastructure that is being provided to New South Wales, to Victoria and even to South Australia, a much smaller state than Queensland. I would really hope that Senator McGrath could do better than that. Beyond, after almost a decade, can you think of anything proactive this government has done to make your life better? Beyond the COVID response that has been driven by the states, the Australian Public Service, and the experts in departments across government, what are the policies of this government? Where are their big changes for the future? What have they actually delivered rather than just announced? And now they want you to give them three more years to do more of it. They've had eight long years in power with nothing to show for it. No legacy, no reform, eight wasted years. And many of the issues they now claim to be addressing tonight are in fact problems of their own making. It's this government's cuts, it's this government's policies, this government's neglect and this government's mismanagement that have made childcare and aged care, the economy and particularly the stagnant wages that have gotten worse, not better, on their watch. Astonishingly, Mr Morrison wants the Australian people to believe, all of a sudden, that he and his government care about jobs and wages. The very government who, who senior ministers said had a deliberate design policy of keeping wages low. 
All of a sudden, Mr Morrison wants the Australian people to believe that he cares about childcare and women's participation in the workforce, that his government cares about aged care, despite a damning royal commission titled Neglect that found that this government's own cuts had contributed to the neglect that we continue to see in aged care. In the eight long years this government has been in office, it's their cuts to aged care, their inability to deal with childcare and their deliberate attempts to put downward pressure on wages that has had genuine, tangible costs and consequences for the Australian people. Now, look, I'll be honest. This government excels at generating headlines and putting up shallow, sugar-hit announcements. I have rarely seen a better government in my life—Labor, Liberal, National. So congratulations, Senator Dunningham. That's something I will concede to you. But what has this government done uh, uh, and what they do have a big problem with is generating secure, well-paid jobs for Australians. Even today, this government, uh, which in, again in my home state of Queensland, and Senator McGrath will remember this, won a range of regional Queensland seats at the last election by promising coal miners that they were on their side. This government, who likes to have, whose members like to get around dressing up like coal miners, today, of all days, that same government is in the High Court of Australia appealing a decision won by the mining union that would have finally done something about the casualisation explosion that we've seen on this government's watch. Today, this government, that says that it cares about mining workers, that cares about mining communities, is in the High Court of Australia trying to, backing labour hire firms and big mining companies who are trying to continue the casualisation of their workforces. That's how much this government cares about generating secure, well-paid jobs for Australians. And while they're at it, some figures that came out recently through a question on notice revealed that they are going to spend $300,000 of taxpayers' money taking this matter to the High Court. So this government, um, that went to the last election saying it would have the back of mining workers, is now turning around and stabbing them in the back by going to the High Court to try to keep them working as casuals, even if they've worked there for seven years, eight years, nine years. That's how much this government cares about secure, well-paid jobs. As I say, right now there are still two million Australians who still can't find work or can't find enough hours to support their loved ones. Yet despite this need, we know that this budget tonight will be all about getting the Morrison government back into their jobs, not about getting Australians back into secure, well-paid jobs that they can feed their families on. Labor wants to see the, the economy recover strongly and broadly and in a sustainable way. We want there to be more jobs and more opportunities for more Australians. But just because the recession could have been worse doesn't mean that the recovery couldn't be better. The fact is the recovery in the economy would be stronger were it not for Scott Morrison's own failures. I remember even just a couple of weeks ago we had a hearing of the COVID committee, um, probably about the 80th hearing, you know, if, I've, if I've lost track. We had representatives of the tourism industry there. Um, who were talking about the desperate skill shortage that they now were finding. They were unable to find people um, to, to fill uh, their jobs. And again, it comes back to decisions that this government made. They admitted, and these are tourism business, business, business figures, they're not Labor Party members. They were saying that the two key decisions that this government had made that now contributed to the inability of tourism businesses to get back on their feet and hire the workers that they needed were the decision of this government to exclude uh, short-term casuals from receiving JobKeeper, which saw a whole host of people leave the hospitality and tourism industry because they couldn't keep JobKeeper. They had to go and get a job somewhere else. And then, secondly, it was the decision of this government more recently to stop JobKeeper, even though so many tourism and hospita hospitality businesses are still on their knees. So it always comes back to decisions of this government that are making problems worse. And now they want us to forget about that and look at all of the headlines which talk about all the billions of dollars they're going to throw at every political problem that they have caused. And you can bet your bottom dollar there's going to be something in the budget tonight about skills. Again, a problem that this government has caused through its decisions about JobKeeper and its own decisions over the last eight years to cut 140,000 apprenticeships. Again, in my home state of Queensland, if you look at the government's own figures, the most recent figures we've seen, 
uh, from this very government show that in the period that it has been in office since 2013, the number of apprentices and trainees in North, in North Queensland has fallen by over 33 per cent. Over one third fewer apprentices and trainees in North Queensland now than there were when this government was elected in 2013. And it's the same all around the country. So again, tonight we're all supposed to sit back and give the government a nice big clap about some more funding for skills when all they've done for the last eight years is cut money to TAFE, cut apprenticeships and traineeships and make decisions, particularly in sectors like tourism and hospitality, that now see employers desperate for skills. That's the kind of government we've got here, uh, rather than a government that is actually planning for the future. So the fact is the recovery in the economy would be stronger were it not for the Morrison government's own failures. There are a range of issues which have been festering in the economy and in the budget for eight long years that this government has ignored. But by all accounts, this will be a showbag budget. It's, it'll be a budget that looks pretty flashy, but when you take it home, it only lasts for a few days or a few weeks. There will be no substantial economic reform and no plan to deal with stagnant wages, because that's how the government wants it. It's a deliberate design feature of the economy under this government to keep wages low. Uh, no, there will be no plan to deal with cost of living pressures that families are contending with and no plan to support the two million people who are underemployed and seeking more work. And what, this government also, sorry, and what this budget also shows is that for all their bluster about budget emergencies and def debt and deficit disasters back when the budget deficit and debt were at levels far lower than what they are today, is that those on the other side were just hypocrites when it came to the budget. Their newly embraced fiscal strategy simply vindicates the approach that Labor took through past crises, most recently the GFC, and was condemned universally from the very people who are coming in here now and spending even more money, racking up even more debt, racking up even bigger deficits. Let's not forget it was this Prime Minister, including as Treasurer, that was using debt as a political weapon Was it when it was a quarter of what it is today. Well, we've now got a trillion dollars on the national credit card and they've manifestly failed to meet their own test on public debt. Putting the level of debt and the hypocrisy of the Liberals and Nationals to one side, we are careering towards $1 trillion in debt, the highest level we have ever seen in Australia, and what have we got to show for it? Just consider what they delivered, or rather failed to deliver, in just the last year, despite racking up historically high debt levels. The Morrison government has failed to efficiently and effectively roll out a vaccine program probably the most important thing that any government to do, could do to get the economy going again and getting people back into work. Firstly, they failed to secure enough vaccines, and now we're paying the price of a slow rollout. Last budget, they were boasting about the fact that a faster vaccine rollout would benefit the economy to the tune of $36 billion. But you can bet your house on the fact that tonight they will be silent on the cost to the economy that their botched vaccine rollout is having. The Morrison government has also failed to set up a safe national quarantine system and one that is fit for purpose to bring stranded Aussies home. They didn't just break their promise to bring Aussies stranded across the globe in COVID-infested countries home by Christmas last year. They are now even threatening people with Australian passports with jail if they come home from India. Over a broader timeline, the failure is no less stark. We've got significant areas of need in the budget where this government has made cuts year after year effectively denying people essential services. And we've also got a budget weighed down with waste. Companies that got billions of dollars in JobKeeper and turned a profit, and this government seemingly doesn't care. Contrast this with how actively and viciously this government pursued victims of their failed robo-debt scheme. We've got slush funds that exist in the budget, billions of dollars in slush funds that the government doled out as they head towards an election, with ministers deciding where taxpayers' funds should go, based on political convenience, not actually what the community needs. A trillion dollars on the national credit card and a government that's focused on political fixes and not real solutions. What Australians cannot afford tonight is another political patch and paint job. For a trillion dollars of debt, Australians cannot afford yet another budget, which is all, again, about spin and marketing but fails to deliver. Time and time again in these budgets, we've seen big promises made and big failures follow. Just think about last year's budget, where the centrepiece, the thing that all the headlines were about last year, was yet another epic failure from this government, the job maker hiring credit. That was the $4 billion centrepiece of the last budget in October. 
The government Thank said. You, uh, Senator Watt. Um, the Senate now stands adjourned, and you've got 30 seconds if you wish to remain in uh, continuation. So the Senate will resume again at 8:30 p.m. Senators, I call the Minister for Finance. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I tabled budget statements for 2021, 2022, and other documents as listed on the dynamic red, and I seek leave to move a mo motion in relation to the documents. Is leave granted. It is. I move that the Senate take note of the budget statement and documents, and move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Birmingham. Thank you. I table particulars of proposed and certain expenditure for 2021-2022 and seek leave to move a motion to refer the documents to legislation committees. Is leave granted. It is. Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. I move that the documents be referred to the committees for examination and report. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I table the portfolio budget statements for 2021-22 for the Department of the Senate, the Parliamentary Budget Office and the Department of Parliamentary Services. I call the minister. Thanks, Mr. President. I table portfolio budget statements for 2021-22 for portfolios and executive departments as listed on the dynamic red. There being no other matters, I propose that the Senate do now adjourn. Thanks, senators. I'll give senators a moment to take their places or leave the chamber and call Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. Just over a week ago, Tasmania went to the polls, and for the first time in our history, a Liberal government has won three successive terms. I would like to congratulate Premier Peter Gutwin on that victory and also acknowledge his personal vote, achieving the highest personal vote ever in a House of Assembly election, receiving over 32,000 primary votes. All seats will be finalised in the coming days, and I wish to congratulate all candidates, both successful and unsuccessful, for their contribution. But on 1 May, there were also two upper house seats decided in Tasmania. Voters in Windermere, the Legislative Council seat covering parts of Launceston and into the state's northeast, 
were faced with five new names to choose from after long-standing independent member Ivan Dean decided not to contest this election. Tonight I would like to acknowledge Ivan's 18 years as a Legislative Councillor as well as his varied roles before politics, all of which add up to a phenomenal record of service for Tasmania and Australia of more than 60 years. Ivan insists he is not retiring but moving into another phase of his life, which he knows will involve more time with his family, some bike riding, building a new house and maybe even writing a book. Growing up in Levendale as one of eight, Ivan remembers his childhood fondly. His parents were hard workers and his family was embedded in their southern Midlands community through their logging business, sawmill, milk bar, school bus contract, transport business and a farm. Ivan was conscripted as a national serviceman, serving in the Indonesian confrontation in Borneo for two years. Military service forced Ivan to learn new skills, like starching and ironing his uniform and complying with commands quickly. But it also left him with permanent hearing loss, which he said had a huge impact on his life. Upon his return to Tasmania, Ivan worked in various odd jobs before joining Tasmania Police, a role which shaped his career. Starting in general policing in Hobart and New Norfolk, Ivan worked at a time when there were single-person patrols. At one stage he was assaulted and hospitalised and he was even often the first responder to horrific road accidents. Ivan was seconded to the Commonwealth Police as a United Nations peacekeeper in Cyprus where he worked with personnel from Britain, Finland, Sweden and Denmark. He also spent time in Sydney, seconded to the homicide and consorting squads, working under infamous convicted murderer Roger Rogerson, a man he learnt was not a man to be questioned or messed with. Ivan's time in the police force included a stint in prosecution, 17 years in CIB investigating murder, rape, child sexual abuse, robbery, home invasion and fraud. Time as a tutor with the Australian Institute of Police Management and he was eventually promoted to commander in Hobart and later Launceston, which was where I first met him. Ivan rightly holds 11 decorations for his service to Tasmania, Australia, the United Nations and policing. Post-Tasmania Police, Ivan turned his commitment to government, serving as a councillor of the City of Launceston for nine years, including two years as mayor. His most recent role as representative for the Legislative Council seat of Windermere followed. Elected to Tasmania's Parliament upper, Parliament's Upper House in 2003, Ivan's profile in Tasmania Police afforded him strong support. He sees his greatest wins as moving a power pole that was in a dangerous position, an underpass, roundabouts, speed changes and gaining funding for community groups. However, Ivan says nothing has been as rewarding as helping a person, a family on their knees, to get a house, to get employed or employment or to retain their employment. Ivan was also, will also be remembered for two further things, his questions on the legitimacy of Tasmania's fox eradication program, or what he calls the fox saga, and his attempt to raise the legal smoking age to 21. The latter is something Ivan is still passionate about, citing it as a root cause in Tasmania's poor health status and the reason 560 Tasmanians die prematurely each year. In his last speech in the Upper House, Ivan said he knew somebody else would pick up the issue of smoking and bring it back before Parliament. Admitting he stood on a few toes and upset some, Ivan's final words in the Legislative Council is something we can also relate to here in this place. He said, I admire in the most part the work of the State Service, the departments who bring the work to us, put the bills together, brief us and answer our questions and put up with us. So Ivan, while you may have ruffled feathers in your various roles, your service to your state and country is something we are very grateful for. I am honoured to have been able to share part of your story here tonight and I wish the new member for Windermere, Nick Digan, great success in his role. Congratulations, Nick. You ran an excellent campaign. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I rise tonight to speak about a South Australian organisation that have cha has changed many lives for the better. Catherine House provides services to women from right across the, sta the state. It is the only recovery-based service that supports women in crisis and experiencing or facing homelessness. And it is the only service available to women who are not eligible for support through the domestic and family violence system. Currently, 95% of Catherine House clients are no longer homeless at the end of their period of support, which is a remarkable statistic. 
However, after 33 years of providing this service to South Australian women, its future is now uncertain. Stephen Marshall's government has decided to change how homelessness, domestic and family violence services in South Australia are funded. And rather than individually fund separate services, the new model funds five alliances, each run by a consortium of organisations. And this is where the issue for Catherine House arises. There is a statewide domestic and family violence alliance and four geographically based alliances. But Catherine House is a service that does not have a place in this new service delivery model. The scope of the support Catherine House provides does not fit into any one of the alliances, precisely because it provides services no other organisation provides. And as a result, Catherine House's funding arrangement will come to an end in June. And South Australia's only service that specifically supports women in crisis will see a loss of $1.2 million of state government funding, wiping out a third of its operating budget. And this is happening when women represent 44 per cent of all people experiencing homelessness, and women over the age of 55 are the fastest growing group of those becoming homeless. Now, the Marshall government has acknowledged that the new alliance model does not work for all services. For example, Youth 110 is one of the services that has been determined as out of scope for the new model. Like Catherine House, Youth 110 specialises in supporting a specific segment of our community delivering crisis accommodation to South Australians aged 16 to 21. But unlike Catherine House, Youth 110 will continue to be funded directly outside of the new alliance-based service delivery model. Well, South Australians deserve to know why the same approach has not been taken with Catherine House. Put simply, we must have properly funded women's, women's homelessness services, and we must have a state government that knows the distinction between women's homelessness services and women's safety services. Because our community does not want women experiencing homelessness. It's not who we are. But without this service, with the cuts that are being imposed, Single women in our state risk losing their only support option. Now, I have written to Michelle Lensink, MLC, the State Minister for Human Services, urging the state government to reverse its decision to cut funding to Catherine House. And now, again in this place, I urge the South Australian Liberal government to reverse these cuts. And I ask Minister Lensink, surely this is not what you entered politics for. Don't do what your federal Liberals have done for eight years. Don't leave acting until only un when there is a political problem. Do the right thing. Please remember how many women's lives have been transformed because of Catherine House. And I have had the privilege over the period I have engaged with Catherine House of meeting some of them. And I say women in our state deserve continued access to these transformative and empowering services. And I want to thank my colleague. Ms. Ms. Nat Cork MP, the State Shadow Minister for Human Services, who is standing up for Catherine House and the whole homelessness sector during this time of change. With other vital service providers, such as Naomi, the Hutt Street Centre and Vinnie's also facing cuts, the sector needs Nat's advocacy and community support now more than ever. And I also want to thank Catherine House's staff, volunteers and supporters for all that you do and recognise the women, the clients past and present who you have supported. These women face enough certainty and stress as they recover from personal crisis, and their state Liberal government should not be making it harder. Senator Seward. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I rise tonight to share an account of a mother who is trying to survive on the cashless debit card. To protect her privacy, I'm going to call this mother Emma. In 2020, Emma was living in a so-called cashless debit card trial site and she separated from her violent partner. She relocated to a small regional town to escape domestic violence, to find safety and to be close to family support. The town she moved to is not a cashless debit card trial site. It has a population of around 1,000 people and is around 30 kilometres from the nearest regional centre. The place she's living has, has one local store, an IGA, and guess what? It does not accept the injury card. 
Emma does not have a driver's licence, and there is no public trans transport that goes to the nearest bigger regional centre. Emma has three children, including a relatively newborn baby, and accessing the regional centre is extremely difficult. She generally relies on the kindness of her community to collect shopping for her or to provide transport to that town. Emma rents a property from a local resident and has negotiated to be able to pay the landlord using bank transfer. However, this consistently fails and she is often having to pay the rent using her cash portion. The inability to consistently pay is also quite embarrassing for Emma, who budgets adequately for rent but is let down by the system. This impacts on her reputation in this small community where she is establishing a safe home for her and her children, and acceptance from her community is important. While her landlord has thus far been patient and supportive of her situation, it is not right to, ex it, it is not right to expect the landlord's kindness to make up for the failure in this system. Emma chooses to live in this small community for several reasons, one of which is the supportive community around her. However, she is feeling increasingly stigmatised because of in her inability to participate fully in her community. She is often left short of cash as a result of having to pay rent from her cash supplies when the system fails and for essential daily supplies such as nappies, milk, bread, fresh fruit. This often leaves her unable to pay for items that sh sorry, which should not be seen as luxury, such as school uniforms and excursions, daycare or second-hand clothes from the local thrift store. Emma has applied to be exited from the card and has been rejected twice. The reason for the most recent rejection was that she did not supply bank statements. Emma was informed. Uh, Emma has clearly told me and also sent details to prove this that this is incorrect. There has been no follow-up um, from the department, and Emma is left in a precarious situation. It is very clear that in these circumstances, the injury card is simply inappropriate. The infrastructure support to support the use of the card in this location is not up to standard, and she is not in a situation where this is working for her. Emma is in a unique situation, and despite her raising these very legitimate concerns about the efficacy of the card in this location, there have been no improvements since November 2020, and she hasn't been able to get off the card either. She is still not able to pay rent consistently, nor per, per purchase basic daily groceries, simple, basic human requirements. Emma was experiencing domestic abuse by her partner, and this is financial abuse by her own government. In November 2020, I wrote to Minister Rustin in regards to how she could assist Emma. I'm once again calling on the minister to show some compassion and ensure Emma gets off this card because the government is causing abuse to this mother and her three children. This is a woman escaping domestic violence, trying to start a new life in a small community where she knows she will get support in that community. The government, the government is undermining her life and her ability to mother her children and to establish herself a new life in safety. Shame on you, government. Senator Antich. Mr President, I rise this evening to speak regarding the lamentable South Australian Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill and the equally lamentable social and moral trajectory of state parliaments all across this country, including in my home state of South Australia. Now, the last 12 months has seen the South Australian State Parliament pass numerous radical social policy bills, bills which devalue the very essence of our humanity. And I'm puzzled by the newfound priority at state level of social policy reform, given the difficulties Australians now face in their day-to-day -day lives due to COVID-19 and the array of restrictions and shutdowns imposed upon them. In times when businesses are trying to keep their doors open, the South Australian Parliament appears insistent upon spending its time debating matters including, but not limited to, the decriminalisation of prostitution, full-term abortion and euthanasia. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Last week, 
the South Australian Legislative Council passed the radical voluntary assisted dying bill, but rather than adopt the evasive language of the left, let's call it what it is, state sanctioned suicide. The bill has been introduced into the state parliament despite a recent report from the Joint Committee on End of Life Choices in South Australia recommending a wait and see approach following the introduction of legalised euthanasia in Victoria and Western Australia. Now, I refuse to believe that members of parliament would wish to send the message that life is not worth living. And I ask those in our state parliament to consider the following. At what point can you be satisfied that someone doesn't deserve hope? At what point can you be willing to tell a person and their family that their life is no longer worth living? And at what point can you be satisfied that there are enough safeguards in place? In 2021, we have access to high quality palliative care and we can reduce the pain of our loved ones in their final days. Nobody wants to see their loved ones suffer, but the notion that the state would aid and provide its blessing to end someone's life is immoral. It is the responsibility of parliament to legislate to protect its people and the law should never support any belief that some lives are not worth living. There is no human dignity or freedom in state sanctioned assisted suicide, but rather it poses a very real risk to vulnerable people through coercion and abuse. If passed, this bill will place pressure on vulnerable people who may well feel like a burden on their family or carers, and this would especially affect those who are elderly, who are sick or those who are disabled. It will also have a profound effect on the relationship between doctor and patient, and instead of only having a healing or caring role, doctors will be burdened with the role of the Grim Reaper. Once legislation is introduced, the ability to water down protections and to extend the powers becomes very, very real. The slope will become very, very slippery. And we've seen this in jurisdictions such as the Netherlands and Belgium. Now, I too have lost loved ones under difficult and awful circumstances, but Parliament should promote a way of caring for the dying without inducing death. We must not forget the sanctity of life and the belief that all human beings are equal regardless of their race, their social status or their religion. Sadly, I have little doubt this bill will pass, and so to those South Australians who hold the strong convictions about what is right and what is wrong, I say I too share your dismay about what has been taking place. Together we must reclaim the moral narrative, and together we must turn this around. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to speak on Al Nakba, and Senator Urquhart puts her name to these remarks. May 15 marks the day in 1948, which the Palestinians call Al Nakba, the catastrophe, after which the State of Israel was founded. The Israelis call it the War of Independence. Tragically, heading up to Al Nakba this year, we have seen the worst violence in many years erupt in Jerusalem. Some 300 Palestinians and 17 Israeli police were reportedly injured in fighting around Haram al-Sharif, or the Temple Mount. The violence has continued despite calls by the UN requesting that Israeli authorities exercise maximum restraint and respect the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. Tragically, children, along with adults, have lost their lives and more than 15 other children have been injured. This violence has erupted because Israel will not halt forced evictions from the East Jerusalem neighbourhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Palestinians have lived in this neighbourhood for generations, in homes specifically built for them by the UN. If the forced evictions go ahead, Palestinians will once again be forced from their homes to be replaced by Israeli settlers. Of course, the latest attempt by Israel reflects a larger reality. During the 1948 war, more than half of the Palestinian population was driven off or fled from their ancestral homes. Seventy-three years after Nakba, life for Palestinians remains poor. 5.6 million Palestinians remain refugees. Many live in substandard refugee camps in neighbouring Middle Eastern countries. Palestinians make up 21 per cent of the global refugee population. Other Palestinians live inside what is now Israel. They live as second-class citizens, with 65 laws discriminating against them and in favour of Israelis. In neighbouring West Bank, Palestinians live under a military occupation with grim effects on life and the economy. 
Israel has fragmented the West Bank into disconnected segments of land, between which movement is restricted and controlled by military checkpoints. Just 50 kilometres south, two million Palestinians live in Gaza, an isolated enclave cut off from Israel and the West Bank. The situation there is dire, with a lack of basic infrastructure. 96 per cent of the water is undrinkable. There's irregular electricity and a blockade which significantly restricts movement of people and goods. Five years ago, the UN indicated Gaza would be unlivable by 2020, and it certainly is. But people have no choice but to stay there. Hannah is a West Australian constituent whose story I'm honoured to share. His, father, his grandfather was a saddler in Jaffa in Mandate, Palestine. When cars arrived, he transformed his business into a bus factory, importing chassis from Germany and building coaches, the first in the Middle East. Business was excellent. He bought more land and built a new house for his young family. However, in 1948, he was forced from his village, leaving every single thing behind, like thousands of Palestinians who were pushed into neighbouring countries. Hannah tells me his grandfather was 63 years old when he was given a special permit to visit his old town. This was in 1973. He knocked at the door of his old home and a Polish woman opened the door. I know who you are, she said. I found old photos in the house of you, but the government gave me this house. His proud grandfather was in tears as he told of this experience. They stole everything, our properties, furniture, wall paintings, photos, businesses, money, memories, our livelihoods, our lives, he said. The next day, penniless in exile, a fatal heart attack finished his story. Hannah's family eventually arrived in Australia. Having an Australian passport enabled Hannah to travel back to his hometown of Jaffa, now part of Israel. But despite the detailed information given to him by his mother, he couldn't find his grandfather's house because names have been changed and the landscape has changed. The international community must take action to challenge Israel on these policies, to better prepare the ground for a future just solution for all Palestinians and Israel. Towards that end, I'm proud that Labor sees the recognition of Palestine as an important priority. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to relate my travels through the Flinders catchment area, which is the fourth biggest river flow in Queensland. Rich soil, vast grassy plains with no trees, water, abundant water, regular water, yet untapped. The potential is being wasted. I felt excited, supportive and encouraged with the people I met in North Queensland and inspired. But I also felt worried and disappointed because of the atrocious state and federal governance that's cruelling that area. My needs in the people were met entirely. Commitment competence, dedication, matched sadly on the other side of the scale by the inability of the state and federal government to meet their needs for support and good governance. We went to look firstly at the Bradfield scheme to do our due diligence. We've done it in the Murray-Darling Basin, now we are doing it in the, in the Flinders, because the Bradfield scheme is a visionary scheme to turn the waters that are flowing and wasted to the east to the west and into the Thompson River. So we wanted to look at the Murray-Darling Basin catchment, which we have, and also at the Flinders. And this was a chance to see the, Mar the Bradfield scheme source and then to go up the, uh, across the Flinders. What we saw flying up the coast was naturally wet area in the tropics. On the coast, Ingham, Tully. Then we swung west over the Tully Mill Stream, and then we went all the way down the Bradfield, the Burdekin River, to the Burdekin Falls Dam. And then we turned west and went back across the Flinders catchment area through Charters Towers, Hewenden, Richmond, Julia Creek, Cloncurry, touched down in Cloncurry to fuel. Then we went north to Normanton, huge, vast plains, and then back southwest to Townsville where we started. And then we spent a week driving on the ground, listening to people, 
getting the lay of the land and the lay of the people. What impressed us was the locals with vision, real vision, complemented by their energy, their knowledge, their competence and their practicality. Very inspiring, as I've already said. And plenty of water. They all said, we don't need the Bradfield Scheme water here. Let it go to the Thompson as the original visionary plan from Bradfield suggested. In particular, I was impressed with the Richmond Council and John Wharton, I think is Queensland's longest serving mayor, 25 years if memory is correct, and his very young but very competent CEO, Peter Bennett. They have a plan and a project that the locals are on board with called the Richmond Agricultural Project. And it's very simple. No dams, just divert water into 8,000 hectares of irrigation, irrigatable and, and rich, fertile soil. And with the agricultural production comes the people. And with people come the services. And instead of Richmond bobbing around 900 people, can get back, back up to 3,000, maybe even 8,000 people. A really vibrant area in the north to be recreated. We also visited Hewenden. The same recipe is being followed. Water captured, not in a dam, but in weirs diverted into storage areas or underground water. And we saw Jane McNamara leading her team there and Daryl Buckingham, who's had experience in the Murray-Darling Basin and is transferring it to the north. We also visited HIPCO, Hewenden Irrigation Project Corporation with Shane McCarthy and council's sponsored projects there, as I said, same recipe. Then we went to Julia Creek on the ground and we went to Etta Plains, where we saw a very dynamic young Lucas Findlay from Findlay Farms escaping the Murray-Darling Basin and the devastation of the regulations down there and the bureaucracy and the poor governance in the south and seeing something fresh. I could go on, but time will catch me here. What they're all waiting for is good governance that the state government and the federal government are not providing. The state government won't allocate water allocations. They can't do anything without that. And ironically, the state government talks about capturing carbon dioxide, which the, which the evidence shows is not necessary, but crops absorb carbon dioxide. Dams create crops that will absorb carbon dioxide. So if they're a fair income, they do it. Ironically, the challenges up north are land tenure, water and energy. And while they're looking for that up north and have it in abundance, they can't use it because the same policies are destroying governance in the south. Order, Senator Roberts. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. After eight long years of this tired Liberal government, after eight long years of flat wages, after eight long years of rising job insecurity, Scott Morrison needed to deliver more than a budget tonight. He needed to deliver a plan for good, secure jobs for all Australians. But the only jobs that this government has been focused on delivering are jobs for their mates. Jobs for their mates. Because this year has definitely been the year of the Liberal mates. Just how good are the Liberals to their mates? Appointments to the Fair Work Commission, appointments to boards, appointments to government agencies, appointments to government departments, and most on more than $300,000 per year, all while almost two million Australians are unemployed or underemployed, all while four million Australians are in insecure, casual or gig work, and all while Australians are crying out for a pay rise. This Morrison government has no plan. This Morrison government has no plan for the real challenges that Australians face every day. No plan for people working two, three jobs to make ends meet. No plan for workers stuck in endless casual job after endless casual job. No plan for vulnerable gig workers to get basic protections, basic protections. And no plan for labour hire workers or contract workers to get certainty and security. No plan for the almost 40 per cent of Australians who are stuck in insecure jobs under this government. 
and they don't have a plan or a vision for Australia because they're too busy figuring out how to cover up their next scandal and their next rort. They are too busy figuring out their next big headline and how not to deliver on it. Look at JobMaker, an absolute dud of a scheme, a dud of a scheme that failed to produce anywhere near the amount of jobs that they promised in the last budget. And now they've scrapped it, the one idea for job creation that they had, and they've thrown it straight in the bin. How can Australians trust this government to deliver for them when they can't even deliver on their own ideas, your own ideas? How can Australians rely on this government to ever come up with a real plan for good, secure jobs? They can't. They can't. And this government has had every opportunity over the last eight years to stand up for working Australians, to stand up for aged care workers, to stand up for Australian manufacturing and the good, secure jobs it can provide to stand up against wage theft and insecure work, to stand up for the women workers of Australia. You have had every opportunity to stand up for the women workers of Australia, and you haven't. You haven't. The only people this government stands up for is themselves. The only jobs they stand up for are their own and the jobs that they hand out day after day to their Liberal mates, day after day. On Labor's side, we, we have a plan for good, secure jobs in this country. We will stand up for good, secure jobs for aged care workers because we know there is no solution to the aged care crisis without treating the workforce with the respect that they deserve. The respect that they deserve. We will stand up for Australian manufacturing with our National Reconstruction Fund. Because we know that made in Australia means good, secure jobs for Australians. And we'll stand up for young workers and guarantee that one in ten workers on major federally funded work sites will be apprentices, trainees or cadets, because we know the importance of upskilling the next generation. We'll stand up and give insecure workers portable leave entitlements. We'll stand up and crack down on cowboy labour hire firms to guarantee that if you work the same job, you get the same pay, just like you deserve. And we, we will stand up against the toxic casualisation of permanent work that is happening under this government. We have a vision for good, secure jobs, a vision that only Labor will ever build, and it's a vision that we will deliver. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last week, I travelled to Gomorrah land to hear from community members in Coonabarabra and Gunnada, living on the front line of coal seam gas expansion in the central west of New South Wales. These communities have been fighting against dirty coal seam gas drilling for many years now. It was a real privilege to reconnect with locals and activists who have had their lives upturned by coal seam gas. The First Nations people I spoke to in Coonabarabran told me that if the 850-plus wells Pilaga Narabra gas project were to go ahead, gas wells would be constructed only a few kilometres from their homes. We know from previous gas expansions in, in the Queensland Surat Basin that there are real concerns about health impacts of living so close to coal seam gas wells, not to mention the damage and destruction of Aboriginal cultural heritage the environmental impacts from the mass deforestation required to construct the wells or the huge amount of carbon emissions that would be released. The First Nations people of Coonabarabran wanted to know why their Gomorrah land, their culture and heritage was being destroyed for a dangerous industry that has become irrelevant. They wanted to know why the government would let their precious water be poisoned and air made toxic for a fossil fuel project that makes no sense when there are renewable energy alternatives available right now. But sadly, they knew why. Because the choice to destroy our planet is a political decision made time and time again by our so-called leaders and corporations in the pursuit of their profits and political gain. I had the rare opportunity to celebrate the cancellation of the Shenhua Watermark Coal Mine um, license with the Gomorrah people and the farmers in Breeza. This massive win came at the end of a 13-year campaign 
of relentless and powerful community opposition. It shows that change is possible when we fight for it. However, throughout the celebration, there was an acknowledgement in the community that the fight was not over, because while they had fought off a coal mine, their land is still under siege from coal seam gas extraction and the prospect of the Queensland Hunter gas pipeline. The high-pressure pipeline is planned to run from Wollambilla in Queensland to Newcastle, passing through valuable farming land in Moree, the Liverpool Plains and the Upper Hunter region. Such a pipeline will lock us into a dirty industry for decades to come, threatening the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement and leading billions of dollars away from investment in renewable energy. These communities are sick and tired of their land being destroyed for profit-hungry billionaires and corporations. Those of us who live in the cities would be naive to think that we too aren't impacted by, the, by this destructive behavior. Because it is the regions that supply our water. It is the regions that supply our food. It is also the emissions from these projects driving the current climate crisis, which has contributed to ever more intense and frequent fires and flooding across our country in the last few years. It is shameful that this government is using public money to subsidize climate criminals. Just look at the federal budget, $51 billion of public money for coal and gas corporations. They are out of control. The notion of a gas-led recovery is farcical, especially that we now have the technology to support the production of clean energy. However, we also must recognize that technology cannot be the only solution. We need climate justice. Climate justice means democratizing energy and engaging communities in infrastructure decisions. Climate justice means handing First Nations land back to First Nations people to be cared for and protected. We know that a post-carbon economy in the hands of big corporations would be just as damaging as the system we live in today. It is clear that there is no hope for climate justice in our current capitalist profit-driven society. If we want to seriously address the climate crisis, we need to challenge the economic system that demands constant resource extraction. The only way we can do this is by coming together and demanding change. And we do have the power. As the end of the Shenhua Watermark Coal Mine license shows, strong community resistance can lead to change. Together, we need to stay strong and demand climate justice and a future with First Nations, sovereignty, green jobs, and no more fossil fuels. Senator Ayres. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Oh, I've been distracted uh, by <laughs> Senator Polly. Um, it was deliberate. We, we, um, of course, we've been treated to, um, to the government's budget. Um, I can't help but reflect upon last year's budget. Uh, the, bu the centrepiece of last year's budget was JobMaker. It was the first measure. It was the biggest measure in last year's budget. It promised to support 450,000 jobs for young Australians. But what did it deliver? By March, it had supported 609 jobs. The total was just over 1,000, 0.02 per cent of what the Prime Minister and Mr Frydenberg promised. So there is no relationship between what comes out of the Prime Minister's mouth in terms of announcements and what actually happens in the real world. You can tell that the Prime Minister is telling mistruths because his lips are moving. Announcement, no delivery, time after time after time. And we see it with this budget. No plan for wages. In fact, what it shows is that for most Australians, wages will go backwards. An heroic assumption after this catastrophic failure on vaccine delivery, this budget tells Australians that they will all be vaccinated by the end of the year. It's like the you'll all be home by Christmas. It's like the we'll be at the front of the queue. It's like the four million by the end of March. All of them lies probably knew when they were making the announcement that they were lies. Well, I think people will see this budget for what it is. Over the break, however, we were greeted with some good news. In a six-minute, very strange video, the member for Dawson 
announced that he's retiring at the next election. He said, I'm concerned with where our politics is heading. Our politics does not seem to be working when it comes to the issues that matter to me. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that these issues can be properly fixed via legislation and the ballot box. He has been a member of parliament for 11 years and in the governing party for eight of them. After all that time and attention, Mr Christensen has decided that politics doesn't work, which raises the question, what exactly was he doing here? Because he wasn't here for a great deal of the time, nor was he in his electorate of Dawson. For many of those years, Mr Christensen spent more time in the Philippines than in Parliament House, up to a third of the year on a taxpayer salary. I don't think it's a coincidence that Mr Christensen gave up on the Australian political system the minute that a pandemic forced him to stay here to be a part of it. And what was Mr Christensen doing there? Mr Turnbull wrote in his memoir, Christensen had an unusually complex online presence and had been spending substantial sums in Manila bars and nightclubs as well as, as, well as making small payments to women there. The so-called the so-called God-fearing Conservative was leading culture wars from the red light district in Manila. Mm -hmm. He is a security risk for the country, but he is a reputational risk for this parliament. He is a disgrace and a dishonour to this parliament. He has maintained that the concerns about his travel are all a vile smear, but when he had the chance to be open and honest with the Australian people, he made sure that the files that the Australian Federal Police proposed to release were never released. It's hard not to be sceptical of his calls for privacy and understanding. He has rarely extended uh, that courtesy to other Australians. This part-time part parliamentarian appears to be devoting his last moments in public life to beating the drums of war and claiming on his Facebook posts that war is coming. A keyboard warrior, entirely reckless about the consequences of war, he wants conflict but will never know the horror of war. He wraps himself in the flag but undermines our national interest every day that he continues to sit in this parliament. Now he hasn't, He's given up on the Australian political system but not on the taxpayer because he's demanding that the LNP disendorse him so he can trouser another $100,000. This bloke should be sacked by the Prime Minister as the chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment and Growth Senator, because yes, every day that he's here he under— Senator Fair of Anti -Wells. Uh, Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Regional Development Australia is an Australian government initiative that brings together all levels of government to support the development of regional Australia. Funded by the federal government and by state, territory and local governments, the 52 RDA committees across Australia are made up of dedicated, passionate local leaders. These committees work with the three tiers of government to support economic and workforce development, local procurement, strategic regional planning and inform government programs and infrastructure investments. With my office located uh, in Wollongong, I have been fortunate to work with and see firsthand the contribution by RDA Illawarra. The Illawarra region comprises Wollongong, Shell Harbour and Kiama local government areas. Over 300,000 people live in the Illawarra and, the board and borders the Shoalhaven in the south, Sydney in the north and Southern Highlands in the west. RDA Illawarra has a board of 14 dedicated people who volunteer their time to drive economic development initiatives for the greater good of the region and have a small staff of three. They are neutral bro brokers of growth as well as public and private sector investment for our region in collaboration with regional stakeholders. Under the guidance of CEO Deborah Murphy and Chairman Eddie de Gabriel, RDA Illawarra continues to work towards the delivery of projects, often from concept, the stage that will sustain and grow the Illawarra region. RDA's flagship project is the Innovative Leadership Illawarra program, which is in its ninth year. It provides a sustainable pathway to grow the next generation of leaders in the Illawarra community. And it's been my very great pleasure to meet with many participants in this program, both here at Parliament House and at my electorate office in Wollongong. 
Each quarter, RDA Illawarra publishes a report to the region in which it provides a snapshot of its achievements. In doing so, it demonstrates openness and accountability to the region's stakeholders and the wider community. Moving forward, the Illawarra region continues to face challenges. Having said that, I believe that there are many, if not more, opportunities for the Illawarra, especially given the University of Wollongong now ranks in the top 1 per cent of universities in the world and the presence of international corporations like Bluescope. RDA Illawarra, through its work, has identified some of these challenges and opportunities, and I would like to examine some of these this evening. The Illawarra economy is diverse. There is an over-reliance on health care and social assistance sector and education jobs, which respectively are 14 and 23 per cent above the state, uh, New South Wales state average. Sadly, the Illawarra has lost thousands of jobs in the manufacturing and mining sectors over the past 10 or so years, and this means it has a lower than average income, namely 12 per cent lower than New South Wales and national incomes, and consequently Illawarra residents have less disposable income. Economic changes have seen lower income jobs replace more highly paid jobs. There is a jobs deficit of more than 25,000 jobs. Hence, many people are required to commute long distances to work, often two hours each way per day, or they choose to no longer participate in the workforce. Infrastructure investment is lagging, with major roads and rail corridors near capacity and in need of investment. With the advent of the second airport at Badgerys Creek to Illawarra's northwest, I hope that future consideration can be given to greater connectivity of air, rail and port links. There is, however, opportunity to grow sectors, uh, the professional and technical services, the finance sector and information and communication technology sector. The Illawarra is also in a prime position for further decentralisation of public and private sector jobs uh, due to its proximity to locations Sydney and Canberra, particularly as part of RDA's COVID recovery strategy that includes a future of work uh, project focusing on remote working opportunities for the region. The post-COVID recovery of the visitor economy in the region is patchy, with Wollongong LGA especially lagging in the recent domestic tourism boom. RDA estimates that 50 per cent of food and accommodation services jobs will be lost when JobKeeper ends. The current job decline in the tourism sector one year on from COVID is a loss of 1,500 jobs across the Illawarra. There are opportunities, though, for growth in advanced manufacturing and scale-up and start-up businesses. Uh, most recently, RDA has led a collaborative approach to address many of the Illawarra's regional challenges and leveraging opportunities through the Illawarra Shoalhaven City Deal initiative, with the prospectus launched in October last year. Uh, to date, projects identified in the deal have secured funding of over $69 million from the New South Wales Government and $240 million from the Federal Government. And those familiar with the area will be especially pleased with the announcements in this year's budget of $240 million to construct the Mount Ousley interchange. Work on the Illawarra Shoalhaven City deals continues, and I am informed that the pace has increased uh, engagement with both the New South Wales and federal governments as well as with uh, local stakeholders. The RDA has maintained uh, that the port at Port Kembla has been underutilised, and I certainly agree with this. In October 2014, in my capacity as an Illawarra-based senator, I made a submission to the Defence White Paper, attaching a paper prepared by my husband, Commander John Wells, RAN retired, proposing the time had come for consideration of the relocation of the Royal Australian Navy Fleet Base East from Garden Island, Sydney to Port Kembla. Following this, RDA Illawarra in June 2015, with bipartisan support from local MPs Sharon Bird and Stephen Jones and key regional stakeholders, produced this publication, The Jewel of the East Coast, the case for relocation of the Royal Australian Navy Fleet Base East to the port of Port Kembla. In 2016, RDA, together with other stakeholders, commissioned a report outlining the suitability of Port Kembla Harbour as a potential location for future RAN basing on the east coast of Australia. The report was provided on a confidential basis to both the federal and New South Wales governments. And there are significant opportunities for growth at the port of Port Kembla and surrounding industrial land precincts, either current investment attraction opportunities or potential future 
precinct opportunities. The RDA Illawarra continues to support current investment attraction opportunities at the port. The Illawarra Hydrogen Hub includes significant opportunities for green energy, including Corrigas Hydrogen Production and Heavy Vehicle Refuelling Station. Andrew Forrest Squadron Energy Group has two key developments, Australian Industrial Energy Port Kembla Gas Import Terminal and Australian Industrial Power Port Kembla Dual Fuel Green Power Station. The gas terminal will be the first LNG import terminal on the East Coast and could supply 75 per cent of New South Wales' annual gas needs. In November last year, Blue Scope announced a $20 million plan to create a renewable manufacturing zone at Port Kembla. RDA Illawarra continues to highlight significant future investment attraction and precinct activation opportunities available at the port of Port Kembla, including a future Navy submarine base and maintenance facility. And I have advocated that this would be very good to base our submarines, given the proximity of the harbour, especially to the deep waters just off uh, Port Kembla. A hydrogen vehicle production facility and advanced manufacturing and industrial support services, dry bulk and bulk liquids facility, a container terminal, along with warehousing and distribution centres, including activation of the South West Illawarra Rail Link and the Southern Container Intermodal Rail Terminal projects, green energy production and resource recovery and circular economy facilities to handle recycling from Greater Sydney. There is significant industrial land in the port precinct at Port Kembla and Unandera that could be activated for future growth. With an estimated 1,400 hectares of land, RDA is working to ensure the highest and best uses for this land for maximisation of economic benefits and high value jobs for the Illawarra. To see the port of Port Kembla come to fruition, a planned and strategic approach to its development is required. Having been born and raised and educated uh, in the Illawarra and uh, having been born and raised uh, in Port Kembla, it is my dream to see the port of Port Kembla developed and most especially to see a Royal Australian Navy presence there. Can I conclude by congratulating RDA on its work in growing a confident Illawarra regional economy that harnesses competitive advantages, seizes on economic opportunities and attracts quality and sustainable investment uh, to the region? I commend the work of the RDA Illawarra, included, including its dedicated staff and volunteer board. Senator Polly. I rise to speak about the 2021 Tasmanian state election. Although the final result is still yet to be determined, I believe that Tasmania has re-elected a Gutwin Liberal government. Unfortunately, uh, Tasmania were forced to go to an election 12 months early to capitalise on the COVID effect. The Premier was hoping that the result would emulate what happened in Western Australia, Queensland, the ACT, Northern Territory and be returned. Well, yes, he was in returned, as all those incumbent governments were. Mr Gutwin ran a presidential-style campaign under the pretense of maintaining a majority government. But what we've seen is the result will most likely return the status quo. So there was no landslide victory in Tasmania. And in fact, returning with only 13 seats is not what I would call a landslide not like what was experienced in West Australia and Queensland in particular. He's already shown a lack of judgment by not sacking the former member, the former minister and candidate in the state election, Adam Brooks, who, as we understand and the public has learned, that there's been serious allegations made by two women that he used aliases of Terry and Gav Brooks. Now, this happened after what we have seen as extraordinary circumstances and events in this place. And what did we see the Premier do? Absolutely nothing. He stood by without taking any serious consideration of what these women had brought to the attention of the public. Now, we have already experienced Mr Adam Brooks when he was a minister. 
his career-ending performance in budget estimates in the state parliament, where he denied using his mining business email while, servicing, while serving as the Minister for Mines. This was uh, the uh, extraordinary behaviour of this minister. Now, to date, we have seen no explanation from Mr Brooks in relation to the allegations that, in fact, two women have come forward saying that he used these aliases and, in fact, falsified a Victorian driver's licence. These are serious allegations, and yet we see the Premier standing by him. Now, the campaign was short. It was a year um, early. It had its highs and lows, and so many people, as usual, put up their hands to be candidates. And from whatever party, wherever they came from, as independents, they should be commended. But ultimately, Tasmanians rewarded the current government for keeping them safe during the COVID-19 and the pandemic. And quite frankly, as I said, there is nothing for this government or the Liberals to crow about when, in fact, they were only returned with the same numbers after orchestrating the early election by uh, sacking uh, what was the Speaker of the Tasmanian Parliament. Now, this election result, unfortunately, was fought and created under false pretence. And what we've seen is there will be no change at all to TAFE. There will be no changes to the ramping of ambulances in both the Hobart Royal Hospital and the Launceston General Hospital. There will be no change whatsoever in the unemployment um, in Tasmania. There will be no change under the incoming Liberal government of housing affordability. There will be no change to the fact that too many Tasmanians cannot find affordable a rental accommodation. Now, what we have seen is a continual growth in the casualisation of employment in Tasmania, as it is around the country and underemployment. What we did see, though, was an innovative, creative health policy that was put forward. And I'm hoping that the incumbent, incoming government will actually take that policy and implement it. Because I wanted to put on record my appreciation of uh, Bastian Seidel, uh, Upper House member, the shadow uh, spokesperson on health. It did an extraordinary job in pulling together a well-costed, well-founded uh, health policy to take to that election. But unfortunately, and that's democracy, and I respect the Tasmanian community that they have uh, voted in and returned a Liberal government. Unfortunately, as I said, the real issues, the health crisis, the crisis in our hospitals, underemployment, casualisation, housing affordability, unable to find rent, not supporting TAFE, not employing enough um, apprentices and making sure that our um, community are well skilled in the jobs of the future and that there is real security in employment. But what I'm particularly um, disappointed with is that the Liberal um, government did not see in its wisdom uh, the need to actually match the Labor's commitment to building a 10-bed standalone hospice for Northern Tasmania. After all, it was the former Minister for Health who made a commitment to uh, Dr John Morris on his deathbed that he would support and make sure that there was established a hospice um, in northern Tasmania. But again, he walked away from that, as has the government. And I just want to commend Bar Baker and the Friends of Northern Hospice for their 14 years of unwavering support and lobbying to have a hospice in northern Tasmania that will meet the names, the, um, the needs of Tasmanians in their final weeks and months. Now I'd like to turn to something more positive, and that is to commend and congratulate Park City Radio for their 35th anniversary. What an outstanding achievement for a local community radio who have serviced northern Tasmania and, in particular, my home city of Launceston. Now, 
Park City Radio is Launceston Community Radio Station. It offers a diverse range of locally and nationally produced programs, both music and spoken word. It does this from studios situated at the cottage in the Launceston City Park. People have been tuning into this service for the past 35 years for Australian music, for local news and events, to hear local voices and personalities, and for an independent voice which isn't owned by a big business. I was honoured to attend the event hosted by the Launceston City Council to celebrate the longevity of the radio broadcast. It is it's so important to support our community, and this is something that myself and I'm sure a lot of people have been reminding themselves over the past year of how important during this pandemic having that local uh, radio community radio station with local voices and personalities being that conduit, that connection to their community and how important that has proven to be, not only in our local community but around the country. Now, City Radio um, City Park Radio is a microcosm of the community with people of all ages, cultures and walks of life being involved. It's run by a large workforce of volunteers who value the importance of community engagement. The volunteers are an essential part of the station's existence and another hallmark of its value as a community service, are the lifeblood of the station. Taking on positions from radio announcers and producers to behind-the-scenes roles including management, administration and the technical services, amongst so many others. City Park Radio offers and encourages all individuals and groups of the community to the opportunity to, to participate and work towards creating a more inclusive society. Through multicultural programming and station broadcasts in over 10 languages, in providing this service, it enhances the quality of life of residents in Launceston and Northern Tasmania and creates a more inclusive community which promotes multiculturalism. Community radio gives a voice to a diverse range of groups and is Australia's largest independent media sector, a key pillar of the Australian media landscape. It must be supported so that it can prosper into the future. Six million Australians tune into over 450 not-for-profit, community-owned and operated radio services across the country each and every week. These stations provide programming that caters for the needs and interests of their communities and provides the news and information that is relevant to them. It's, it's provided in a very authentic and familiar voices that we know and we trust. Another vital role that the community radio plays is to help people not feel socially isolated, and that's why it has been instrumental throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I congratulate them and I wish them all the very best for another 35 years and beyond. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak about human rights, both here in Australia and around the world as has been my habit every Tuesday night on sitting weeks for a while now. The Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all people. So talking of human rights, I want to start here in Australia. And sadly and tragically, there are significant human rights breaches occurring right here in Australia. We've seen the government implement a travel ban on Australians coming from India, threatening them with jail time for returning home. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil, rights, civil and Political Rights say that everyone has the right to return home to their country and shall never be deprived of the right to enter their own country. We have written to the Prime Minister calling for the government to significantly increase quarantine capacity and travel capacity to return home, to enable everyone who wants to to safely return to Australia, upholding that fundamental human right. For First Nations peoples in Australia, it's been 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, custody that made clear recommendations to prevent future deaths. Tragically, in those 30 years, more than 474 families have lost a loved one in custody. And as my colleague Senator Lydia Thorpe has repeatedly called for, governments across Australia must implement the long-delayed recommendations of that Royal Commission. 
Moving to the United States. In America, the Black Lives Matter movement has been born out of tragic and unnecessary deaths. As Human Rights Watch summarised, the police killing of George, George Floyd and a series of other police killings of black people sparked massive and largely peaceful protests, which in many instances were met with brutality by local and federal law enforcement agents. Police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the shooting of Jacob Blake um, provide, provoked massive protests calling for police accountability, reduction in the scope and power of police, elimination of extortionate court fines and fees, and investment in black communities. But rather than address problems of poverty or health that contribute to crime, many US, US jurisdictions focus on aggressive policing in poor and minority communities, fueling a vicious cycle of incarceration and police violence. So we call on the United States government and state governments to protect the lives and human rights of all and respond to racial injustice with clear, rapid action that addresses wealth inequality, racism in their police structures and the unequal effects of the, of the COVID pandemic. In Afghanistan, we've seen multiple attacks on members of the, of the Hazara community, with the latest bombing in Kabul targeting and killing innocent schoolgirls. Those who carry out such crimes must be held accountable. And some of the attacks which have occurred against Hazara communities in Afghanistan, particularly those against medical facilities, amount to war crimes. The Australian Greens have called for action by the Australian government and Afghan authorities to protect Hazara communities and individuals who are at risk. And we want the Australian government to increase the humanitarian quota in Australia's refugee program, ensuring that more places are available to accept Hazara refugees. And of course, in speaking about Afghanistan, we must also acknowledge the awful actions committed by Australian troops. As my, Senator, as my colleague Senator Steelejohn has said, the lack of oversight from chain of command meant that individual patrol commanders were enabled to set their own objectives which, as we have seen from the horrific allegations in the Brereton Inquiry report, fell far outside the behaviour Australians expect from our troops. On top of the dreadful cost that we have also paid dearly in the lives of our own and in resources, Australia must acknowledge the terrible legacy that we have left in Afghanistan and compensate the families and the communities affected by our occupation. In West Papua, the worsening situation is tragic. Killings are occurring, including, in recent weeks, nine Papuans and an Indonesian police officer. We've seen internet access cut to West Papua and leaders in the Indonesian government saying that human rights will be disregarded in the crackdown as military troops are deployed to West Papua. We call on the Indonesian government to urgently withdraw all combat troops from West Papua and to allow immediate, unfettered access to UN and other independent human rights observers. The Australian government must not be silent while this occurs. The Greens call on our government to speak out for our West Papuan neighbours and to advocate to the Indonesian government to prevent violence and the loss of life in West Papua. And to Palestine. This week, Palestinians commemorate Al-Nakba, Al -Nakba, Arabic for the catastrophe, when in 1948 thousands of Palestinians were killed, an estimated 700,000 lost their homes and became refugees, and many of their descendants have remained in refugee camps since. And this week, some Palestinians are facing the threat of a second expulsion, this time from the Sheikh Jarrah neighbourhood in Jerusalem. In the aftermath of the Nakba, the UN and Jordan built and granted ownership of homes for 27 families on what was vacant land in the Sheikh Jarrah neighbourhood in East Jerusalem. And since that time, generations have been born, grown up, married and died in these houses. However, of course, Israel seized control over Jerusalem in 1967, and despite international calls for it to withdraw, it has refused. And East Jerusalem is recognised as being under military occupation. And Israel has used a raft of discriminatory residency regulations and planning frameworks to reduce the, popula the Palestinian population in Jerusalem. 
Israel passed a law that allows Jewish people to claim land that was owned by Jews prior to 1948. But in contrast, Palestinians who lost homes or property in 1948 are not compensated, nor can they exercise their inalienable right to return to their former homes inside what is now Israel, which is a right enshrined in UN Resolution 194. And these are some of the policies that have led human rights groups to, con to conclude that Israel is committing apartheid. Last month, a report by the US-based Human Rights Watch found in most aspects of life, Israeli authorities methodically privilege Ju Jewish Israelis and discriminate against Palestinians. Laws, policies and statements by leading Israeli officials make plain that the objective of maintaining Jewish-Israeli control over demographics, political power and land has long guided government policy. In pursuit of this goal, authorities have dispossessed, confined, forcibly separated and subjugated Palestinians by virtue of their identity to varying degrees of intensity. Human Rights Watch's report follows one by Israeli human rights group Beit Salem that reached the same conclusion, as did a 2019 report to the UN by Palestinian human rights organisations. And this institutional discrimination is felt acutely in the Sheikh Jarrah neighbourhood. While the pandemic rages, 500 Palestinians are at risk of unjust eviction, 87 of them imminently. They faced years of long, exhausting court battles that have been financially draining, beyond the personal stress on those residents. And this is the tragic experience of people facing discriminatory laws and policies from the Israeli government. The Greens support the rights of Palestinian and Israeli peoples to live in peace and security in their own independent sovereign states and recognise the ongoing injustice that has been done to the Palestinian people. That injustice needs to be rectified to enable Palestinians and Israelis to live in peace. And we condemn the escalation in violence overnight, which has cost the lives of Palestinian civilians, including children. This violence has roots in the efforts of Israeli settler groups to evict Palestinian families. We need to end injustices like settlements, forced evictions and the occupation itself to have a hope of putting an end to violence and conflict, starting with no evictions in Sheikh Jarrah. Last week, the EU said that the Israeli authorities should cease these activities and provide adequate permits for legal construction and development of Palestinian communities, with similar sentiments expressed by UK officials and the US State Department. Australia must speak out and add our voice to stop the ongoing Nakba for Palestinians. I have spoken tonight about ongoing human rights abuses, and I will keep speaking out in this parliament. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. All women deserve to be safe at work, something that shouldn't have to be said again and again. But it does. It does need to be said. I'd like to uh, share with the Senate uh, an important uh, centre in the Northern Territory called the Northern Territory Working Women's Centre. Sadly, the federal government has turned its back on the safety of working women in the Northern Territory by cutting funding to the only NT-wide service providing free advice and advocacy. The NT Working Women Centre has been supporting women in regional and remote areas to have safer workplaces for more than 30 years. But this government has cut their core funding with the NT Working Women's Centre facing a very uncertain future from June 30. Recommendation 49 from the Respect at Work report says working women's centres should be supported by the Australian government. Yet, disappointingly, especially tonight, this government is still continuing to let the NT Working Women's Centre close its doors after June leaving the rest of us stranded. In December 2020, the centre was unsuccessful in sec securing its core funding from the Fair Work Ombudsman under the Federal Community Engagement Grant. And every four years, the NT Working Women's Centre had to go through this funding drama. 
But this time, the federal government decided to award the funding for the NT to a youth law organisation in New South Wales. Now, no disrespect to this youth law organisation in New South Wales. Uh, it no doubt does an excellent job, but it is a hell of a long way from the Northern Territory. So the Northern Territory Working Women's Centre is left without three quarters of its core funding after 30 years of supporting Territory women. The NT government has provided the centre with short-term funding to cover the shortfall, but this government continues to avoid the responsibilities that it so blatantly needs to give. The fact is most Australians and Territorians are no different. They spend a third of their lives at work, and the federal government should be prioritising the creation of safe and healthy work environments, including right here in Parliament House. I'm certainly proud to say that workers from the NT Working Women's Centre recently delivered training to senior Labor staffers around identifying and dealing with workplace harassment. But this training is only one facet of their work. In the last six months of 2020, the service had 2,093 client contacts with 157 clients receiving case support. Now, 50 per cent of their clients are from regional, rural and remote locations. And to give you an idea of just some of the work that they do, I'd like to just share the story of one client. We'll call her Maria uh, to protect her, uh, her identity. Maria was working in the Northern Territory on a visa. And after hearing about her unsafe working conditions, debt bondage and appalling treatment, the NT Working Women's Centre took advice from Anti-Slavery Australia and the case was referred to the Australian Federal Police. This resulted in a human trafficking investigation uncovering national and international links, exploiting workers across an industry. Eight people in the Northern Territory were removed from forced labour. Without the NT Working Women's Centre, these vulnerable women would still be exploited harassed and treated appallingly. I urge the federal government, please step up, in particular about our working women's centres across Australia, but especially the Northern Territory Working Women's Centre. We need to make sure they continue well, before June, well beyond June 30. Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd also like to take this opportunity to, tonight to talk about the ongoing and life-changing impact on people in our community affected by brain tumours, including patients and their carers, families, friends and colleagues. I also acknowledge the significant cost to the community and the economy of these diseases, primarily through premature death from brain tumours and brain cancer, particularly and heartbreakingly the deaths of children. Over the last 35 years, while survival rates for many cancers have improved, survival for brain cancer has shown no significant improvement. Five-year survival for brain cancer remains stubbornly low at 22 per cent. Cancer Australia estimated that in 2020, 1,879 new brain cancer diagnoses would occur. That is more than five people in this country being diagnosed with brain cancer not including non-malignant tumours, every day. For that same year, it was estimated that 1,518 people would die from a malignant brain tumour, and that is, on average, more than four people dying a day, every day. Distressingly, brain cancer was the leading cause of cancer-related death in Australian children between the ages of 0 and 14 years in 2019. And whilst many childhood cancers have seen excellent increases in overall survival, some childhood brain cancers, such as diffuse intrinsic pontine gliloma, or DIPG, remain terminal on diagnosis, with children surviving an average of only nine months from their diagnosis. This is not acceptable, and we do need to do more as a country. The cost of brain cancer is more than the suffering and grief of those affected by it. Through this cost, uh, 
Though this cost is more than we would want anyone in our community to bear, financially brain cancer costs more per person than any other cancer because it's highly debilitating, affects people in their prime and often means family members can't work if they become carers. It is the cancer with the highest total burden of disease. On the 28th of November 2017, the Senate Select Committee into Funding for Research into Cancers with Low Survival Rates handed down its report. I and seven other senators sat on this select committee with Senator Katrina Billick sitting as chair. And many in this place will know that in March 2008, Senator Billick had two benign brain tumours removed. In February this year, our colleague Senator Billick announced she had been diagnosed with a further brain tumour, a slow-growing meningioma. She's advised that it does not pose a serious threat to her health and she's taking a short leave of absence from parliament to undertake treatment. And Senator Billick, uh, if you're listening, our love and thoughts go with you. Yeah. It's heartening to know that Senator Billick does not currently face a serious threat, but she is incredibly courageous yeah. and deeply passionate about wanting to see this disastrous disease treated more seriously in Australia and in particular by the Australian Parliament. The Senate Select Committee into Funding for Research into Cancers with Low Survival Rates made 25 recommendations in its report. On the 16th of November 2018, the government provided its response to the report. Of the 25 recommendations, 10 were simply noted, eight were supported in principle, five were supported and two were deemed to be the responsibilities of the states. Most disappointingly, recommendation 24 that the federal, state and territory governments develop and implement a comprehensive Australia-wide strategy to increase five-year survival rates for low survival rate uh, cancers to above 50 per cent by 2027 was only noted. While the brain cancer mission of doubling survival rates in 10 years by 2027 was welcome, this did not aim as high as the committee had recommended. Most importantly, I am aware that brain tumour patients, their carers, families and friends had hoped for more support for the report's recommendations. If carried through, the recommendations have the potential to improve quality of life, reduce financial burden and ultimately, and most critically, extend and save the lives of brain tumour patients. I celebrate these improvements as little as they are and, and I hope that very soon Australians facing brain cancer and those who love them can also have vastly improved survival rates and the chance for more of them to live long, healthy and productive lives in our community. We've seen improved survival rates in other cancers, notably, for example, the five-year survival rate of prostate cancer has increased from 60 per cent to more than 90 per cent. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Last month, the Australian Government made a significant announcement in relation to cybersecurity threats to Australia. In a joint statement issued by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Ter Defence and Minister for Home Affairs, the Australian Government joined with the US and UK in condemning Russia's harmful cyber campaign against the US software firm SolarWinds. The Australian statement followed an announcement in Washington that US President Joe Biden had signed an executive order declaring a national emergency to deal with the threat of Russia's foreign interference, including malicious cyber-enabled activities. US intelligence agencies directly attributed the SolarWinds attack to the Russian Cozy Bear Hacker Group operating for the Ru Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, the SVR. The Australian ministers declared that in consultation with our partners, the Australian government had determined that Russian state actors were actively exploiting SolarWinds and its supply chains. The Foreign Affairs, Defence and Home Affairs Minister further declared that over the 12, uh, previous 12 months, Australia had witnessed uh, Russia's, Russia used malicious activity to undermine international stability, security and public safety. This wasn't the first time that the Australian government had attributed cyber attacks to Russia. Just over three years ago, then Defence Minister Senator Payne publicly attributed the, the hacking of more than 400 Australian businesses 
to unnamed Russian actors, but at the time stopped short of attributing the attacks to agents of the Russian government. So the announcement last month represented a shift in Australia's response to its cyber attacks, for the first time joining with other countries to call out a particular foreign government as responsible. This was a step forward. While there have been many warnings about da the dangers to Australian and uh, state government agencies, to vital defence capabilities and infrastructure, the critical infrastructure, to Australian businesses, universities and community organisations from hostile cyber attacks, the Australian government has been very reluctant to directly identify those responsible for such acts. While diplomatic sensitivities, mu sensitivities must be considered, the absence of specific attribution of responsibility for major cyber intrusions and attacks has diminished the government's effort to alert Australians to the importance of cyber security. This systematic weakness in their approach to cyber threats was evident when the government announced in June last year that, and I quote, Australian organisations are currently being targeted by a sophistica sophisticated state-based cyber actor. At that time, the Prime Minister said hostile cyber activity was occurring across a range of sectors, including all levels of government, industry, political organisations, education, health, essential service providers and operators of other critical infrastructure. The Prime Minister noted that there aren't too many state-based actors who have those capabilities, but he declined to name the culprit. The perpetrator was rather like Lord Voldemort, Voldemort in the Harry Potter mo uh, novels, too scary to be named. The government has now been prepared to name Russia, a country in, with which we only have limited bilateral relations. But the elephant in the room is, of course, China. Former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull reflected the reality well in his memoir in which, in which he observed, and I quote, what has become increasingly apparent over the last decade is the industrial scale, scope and effectiveness of Chinese intelligence gathering and in particular cyber espionage. They do more of it than anyone else by far and apply more resources, at, resources to it than anyone else. They target commercial secrets, especially in technology, even when there's no connection with national security. And finally, they're very good at it." End quote. Although the Australian government is not prepared to public, uh, publicly um, attribute responsibility for the cyber attacks directed at numerous federal, state and government agencies, universities businesses, there is no doubt that the Chinese state, the Ministry of State Security and the electronic warfare components of the People's Liberation Army have been responsible for a great number of these hostile actions against Australia. And so far, China has waged this cyber campaign without any effective response from the Australian government, even when the parliament's IT system was hacked. We have strengthened our cyber defences, spending well over a billion dollars nationwide, but China has suffered no consequences at all. This state of affairs cannot be allowed to continue. If we, to, if we are to counter China's strategic cyber campaign, there must be disincentives. There must be consequences for Beijing. The first thing we need to do is call out China's behaviour. China will no doubt protest their innocence and engage in further, a further round of vilification in the Global Times and other Communist uh, uh, Party mouthpieces, but we shouldn't be too worried about that. Our bilateral relationship with China is what you would expect of a Cold War. That's the reality. What we need to do is send a very clear message to our allies and friends that we will not lie down and accept electronic aggression from the Chinese government. Cyber warfare is just that, a form of warfare, short of open hostilities, but warfare nonetheless. Secondly, the government needs to impose targeted sanctions against individuals and organisations involved in the Chinese state's hacking and cyber warfare programs. We should be prepared to act in concert with our allies, especially the US, but we should also be prepared to implement our own unilateral sanctions, especially against Chinese telecommunications and IT companies with any connection to China's cyber warfare activities. Sanctions may not have a large material effect but they will send a clear message that we regard China's actions as hostile and unacceptable. 
Third, the Australian government needs to impose direct dip, a direct dip, diplomatic price for cyber attacks that can be attributed to the Chinese state or its proxies. Each time such an attack occurs, the Department of Foreign Affairs should expel at least one diplomat from China's Canberra Embassy and at least one consular official from each of China's consulates in Australia's state capitals. In the event that China keeps up its cyber attacks, such a policy would at least quickly reduce China's bloated diplomatic and consular presence, larger than that of any other country, which serves as cover for espionage and political interference operations in Australia. Finally, Australia should be prepared to re retaliate in kind. The Australian Signals Directorate has significant offensive cyber capabilities, both as a national capability and as, and as part of a wider collective capability among signal intelligence agencies of the so-called Five Eyes countries. Those offensive capabilities are, close, are a closely guarded secret, but I note that in December 2016, the government made a wide-ranging disclosure to ABC News about the Signal Directorate's success in hacking and destroying the electronic infrastructure of the Islamic State propaganda unit. In the event that China continues its cyber offence, uh, offensive against Australia on the scale experienced in recent years, the government should authorise targeted retaliation, especially against st Chinese state-owned enterprises uh, operating outside China, Chinese communist uh, propaganda outlets and, Chinese, uh, and Communist Party-controlled United Front organisations. Another focus should be on exfiltrating data from Chinese state agencies that highlight the Chinese state's systematic human rights abuses and the rampant, uh, rampant uh, corruption that pervades the top echelons of the Communist, power, uh, Communist Party's power structure. The threat of such action might give Beijing pause for thought before they embark on another round of hacking or decide to ratchet up economic pressure on Australia's export industries. One thing is clear. Without imposing some consequences, there is no reason to dial back what are unquestionably hostile actions against Australia's national interests. Without consequences, they will continue to treat Australia as a hacker's training ground and may eventually secure electronic footholds that may deeply harm our national interests, including defence capabilities. This cannot be allowed to continue, and the Australian government uh, needs to move from a strictly reactive, defensive posture to a proactive, offensive one. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak about the 2021-22 Morrison government budget. This is a budget which leaves no Australian behind. And this is the next stage of the Morrison government's economic recovery plan to build a stronger Australia. There is no doubt that Australians and Victorians, whom I proudly represent, have had a very, very tough year. We've endured lockdowns, separation from our friends and families, unemployment and many other consequences of the global pandemic. This budget continues the Morrison government's work to put us back on track. It reflects our ironclad commitment to ensuring all Australians benefit from our economic recovery. It guarantees services, creates more jobs and keeps Victorians safe from COVID-19. I want to reflect on a, a number of initiatives in tonight's budget. Starting with the government's commitment to implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety, with some $18 billion worth of funding for the aged care sector, including substantial support for mental health, suicide prevention and also support for people living with disabilities. Uh, most importantly, in, insofar as our support of the aged care sector is concerned, uh, we are also ensuring our aged care workers are better paid and better trained. 
and something that will make a massive difference to seniors who are staying at home, uh, some 80,000 additional home care packages. So all of this extra funding brings our total commitment to aged care to some $119 billion over the next four years, which is the most significant investment in aged care in Australian history. The budget makes childcare more affordable for families, funds essential infrastructure, supports new construction jobs and home ownership, and provides record funding for schools, hospitals, uh, and of course uh, the vitally important NDIS. The budget includes some $10 billion of targeted infrastructure spending and on road and rail projects around the country, including a $2 billion initial investment for a new Melbourne intermodal terminal servicing uh, inland rail. There's another $1 billion to extend the local roads and community infrastructure program to, to deliver upgrades for local roads, footpaths and community infrastructure. And of course, this allows local councils to have the certainty to decide the projects which are most important to their communities are providing their shovel ready because uh, this is a program of course that drives jobs and gets shovels in the ground as quickly as possible. Across southwest Victoria, which I represent as a patron senator, uh, there is more funding for many major infrastructure projects which are underway, uh, including better and safer roads and more reliable rail. In the Geelong region in this financial year, for the Bowen Heads Road duplication, for instance, there's another $90 million. For the Warren Ponds to South Geelong rail upgrade, another $105 million will flow this financial year. And some $69 million will be delivered under the Geelong City deal to continue our support of the tourism economy, uh, particularly around the Twelve Apostles along the Great Ocean Road and in Geelong Centre. Uh, in the Ballarat uh, region, uh, there's another $35 million for the Ballarat line upgrade stage two, including uh, as well more funding for the Western Freeway. And in the Bendigo region, uh, a massive new injection of funding for the Calder Highway for road safety upgrades, some $15 million. The budget commits another $1.7 billion to childcare over four years to help working families cope with childcare costs. The government will raise the childcare subsidy for families with two or more children under five years old to 95 per cent, up from 85 per cent. Now, this is forecast to save some 250,000 Australian families around $2,200 per year. For those Australians affected by natural disasters, the government has committed some $600 million for natural disaster recovery to help Australians rebuild their communities after natural disasters hit. These measures include funding for bushfire and cyclone proofing, as well as measures to ensure telecommunications resilience, a vital element in any disaster response. A major part of this budget is its support for women. It includes a support package of some $3.4 billion, which will target women's safety, economic security, health and well-being. These include women's safety measures for women fleeing domestic violence. There's also a very significant women's health package, some $334 million, to support women's health, including funding for cervical and breast cancer uh, treatments, endometriosis and re reproductive health. The budget ties national objectives to local needs. Uh, and if I consider the massive investment in mental health and in suicide prevention, this is a landmark reform for our nation. Uh, this is going to make the most extraordinary difference to so many families, uh, including the 65,000 or so Australians who attempt to commit suicide every year. Uh, as I say, there is very substantial funding in the budget to support uh, those people 
after they leave hospital who traditionally have left and have had no ongoing support. These numbers that we hear in the budget are so often abstract, a billion here, 10 billion here, uh, 100 billion, but this is money being spent by our government to secure our economic recovery at one of the most toughest times in our history. And it's so important that at the end of the day it ends up on the front line and that is why, as we've heard, there's another $1.7 billion or so uh, for um, vaccines right across the country. Uh, we know how important our investment is in our health response, including in vaccinations. The 2021 budget is, as I say, the next stage of the Morrison government's economic recovery plan to create a stronger Australia. I'm very proud of what our nation has achieved so far. I'm very proud of the way in which our government has stood up for all Australians. I'm incredibly proud that this is a budget which leaves no Australians behind. And the absolute landmark massive investment, particularly in aged care, in mental health, in infrastructure, in tax cuts, in backing small uh, and family businesses in driving job creation uh, will help Australians go from strength to strength. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I also, in the short amount of time left, I just want to mention something else, a very significant event happening tomorrow in Geelong. Tomorrow uh, Geelong farewells one of its favourite sons. Uh, Frank Costa's funeral is tomorrow and many people from my city and the region will gather. Uh, he will go down in history as one of Geelong's most significant citizens. In fact, uh, he was a dynamo, and so many of the projects and investments that we have um, delivered and so many of the policy changes that we have achieved and the transformation of the Geelong uh, city has been driven by Frank Costa, including when he was steering the committee for Geelong. Um, he has left an incredible legacy. He was such a wonderful community leader. He was a leading philanthropist. Uh, he was a good friend. He was a mentor. And he was the heart and soul of the Geelong community. My sincere condolences to Frank's wife, Shirley, and his eight daughters, and to the broader Costa family. And I say vale, Frank Costa. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise tonight um, to, among other matters to come, acknowledge this year's highly successful AFL women's season, the AFLW. After its cancellation last year to the COVID-19 pandemic, this year the AFLW has showcased women's sport at its very, very best. Since its inaugural season in 2017, we've seen the action on the field continue to get better and better, while off the field we've seen interest in the competition continue to grow. This has been reflected by strong attend attendances, growing media interest and the strong rise in participation by women and girls in the sport of Aussie rules right around the country at the grassroots level. The success of the AFLW competition has been no fluke. It is the result of considerable investment in women's football by the AFL and competing clubs, and I congratulate them. It has also involved great effort by the players, their families and volunteers, who work hard to put on the high-quality competition so many of us enjoy today. I've particularly enjoyed watching Collingwood's performance this year, playing some great football, despite falling just short of making the grand final, losing to the eventual premiers. Having attended the competition awards night just a few weeks ago, I would like to extend my congratulations to all of those selected in the AFLW All-Australian side, particularly Collingwood's Brianna Davey, who was also named its captain, Chloe Molly, and Ruby Schleinder and Brittany Bonici. I'd also like to congratulate the winners of this year's AFLW Premiership, the Brisbane Lions, and the winners of the season's best and fairest award 
which was also uh, jointly won by Brianna Davey and Fremantle's Kiara Bowers, as well as all other award winners on the night. Like many of my colleagues in this building, I thoroughly look forward to next year's competition and will be cheering on the Mighty Pies in their campaign next year to win their first AFLW Premiership. On a separate matter, I would also like to acknowledge the recent 73rd anniversary of the Declaration of the Independence of the State of Israel. Israel truly is the miracle in the desert. Its formal re-establishment of all those years ago has facilitated the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and together have created a state that they can be incredibly proud of. From the harsh terrain and climate of the British Mandate, Israel has risen as an example to other nations of what is possible through determination, hard work and perseverance. It has developed an economy that is both prosperous and, innovation, and innovative and a society where diversity and progress are embraced. And of course, it is a country which has a long and close relationship with Australia, back to before its independence. Australians fought in the Sinai-Palestine campaign during the First World War in what is now modern-day Israel, including in the famous battle of Beersheba. Beersheba sorry. Through the leadership of H. V. Evett, Doc Evett, we were the first country to vote in favour of the UN Partition Plan Resolution and were then amongst the first countries in the world to formally recognise the Israeli state under the Chifley Labor government in 1949. And this support for the state of Israel is something we should be incredibly proud of and ensure that countries well into the future. Uh, sorry, ensures continues well into the future. And while there has been some stark differences between our two countries, one only needs to look at a map to see the contrast in size. There are many things that we have in common. Our two peoples both share a deep commitment to participatory democracy, the rule of law and respectful minorities, just to name a few. And like Australia, Israel has faced challenges over the last year, but has also had notable successes, including the signing of the Abraham Accords, the groundbreaking normalisation of relationships between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, and through its vaccination program, with Israel leading the world in the race to combat COVID-19. Israel is showing the global community how to beat this deadly virus through vaccination, achieving the highest vaccination rates against COVID-19 in the world. There are a number of factors that have contributed to this, including a strong and universal healthcare system, as well as the desire to prioritise a quick rollout of the vaccine. But it is the effective rollout of the vaccine that the global community should look to as a template on how to protect their population during a pandemic. I would also like to commend the State of Israel for its commitment to rolling out the vaccine to Palestinians in recognition of the fact that while Israel is under no obligation to do so, given the failure of the Palestinian authorities to provide for their own people, Israel nonetheless has a moral obligation to take up the task and lend a hand where they can. While sadly some have sought to spread misinformation on this matter, already tens of thousands of Palestinians have been vaccinated by Israel, with hundreds of thousands of more to come. So as we mark the recent anniversary of the State of Israel, I'd like to wish our Israeli fr friends, both near and afar, all the best for the 74th year and I look forward to seeing our respective countries grow closer and continue to thrive together in peace and prosperity. Now, last week, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I had the pleasure of touring parts of Western Victoria, visiting towns along the southwest coast of the state. Like others in this place, I take my responsibility to represent my constituents seriously, regardless of where they live, in metropolitan areas or in regional or remote communities. In Portland, I visited the Alcoa Aluminium Smelter, a facility which employs around 500 workers and supports the jobs of many thousands in the region and beyond. Much has been said about the smelt in this place over the years. Sadly, some of it less than favourable. And by those who are yet to step foot in, the, in Portland and to understand the true value this facility contributes to the town and its people. Whilst there are many lessons to come out of COVID-19 for Australia, 
One that I think is most important is the need to ensure that we maintain our solar and capability to manufacture the inputs that our economy needs to prosper. In the case of this smelter, the workers there produce around 20 per cent of Australia's total aluminium output. Labor has welcomed recent announcements to secure the smelter's future. However, there is still more to be done in this space. In particular, I draw attention once again to the plight of Keppel Prince, also in Portland, Australia's only producer of towers for wind turbines. Despite the significant increase in wind energy over recent years, Keppel Prince finds itself losing out to cheap imports from overseas, jeopardising the livelihood of its workers. Now, when we talk about manufacturing, when we talk about sovereign capability, these are the kind of jobs we're talking about. Jobs at Alcoa, forging the nation's medals, jobs at Kelpel Prince, providing innovative solutions to our energy challenges. So whilst I thank the management of Alcoa, of Kelpel Prince, as well as the Australian Workers' Union for facilitating my visit and giving me the opportunity to, to talk to workers firsthand, I also want them to know that I stand with them because the livelihoods of these workers are too important for our language on in securing Australian jobs to be hollow. Lastly, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to acknowledge the retirement of John Keeley as Vice President of the United Dairy Farmers Victoria. After faithfully serving the organisation and its members since becoming Vice President in 2019, John has decided not to recontest for the role in the upcoming UDV election for the position of Vice President. Uh, I know that his departure will be felt, and I look forward to seeing him later on this month at their annual conference, which I'm sure he'll do a very fine job. And again, John, thanks for your advocacy, for your leadership and support to the many dairy farmers, not just in your region, but across the state of Victoria. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. With the passing of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, we say farewell to a great man. For more than 80 years, Prince Philip served his country, our Commonwealth and the Crown. He was an outsider when he entered the royal family, but his love for his wife inspired nearly eight decades of devoted service to his Queen, to the people of the Commonwealth, including Australians, and to the world. The Duke's life was one of duty and service, of loyalty and of honour, always standing beside our Queen. And as Her Majesty has said, he was her strength and stay. Prince Philip cared deeply for Australia, visiting on more than 20 occasions. Some of these visits were celebratory. In 1956, he opened the Olympic Games in Melbourne. Others were in times of mourning and loss, such as in 1967, when Prince Philip came to Tasmania to comfort the victims of the terrible Black Tuesday bushfires. Humbly, he met with people and heard their stories. He was no stranger to suffering, having lived through his family's exile from Greece, his mother's mental breakdown, and the death of his beloved sister Cecile in a plane crash when he was just 16 years old. But when an interviewer once asked the Duke how this made him feel, he was apparently bemused, stating it wasn't good, but he, quote, just got on with it. There are many positives to our growing awareness of mental health issues and our willingness to talk about things we're struggling with. But it's worth observing that there was strength in Prince Philip's attitude too. It was his willingness to get on with it that allowed his generation to, like him, face seismic shifts in the course of their lifetime. This was a generation that fought the Second World War to secure our liberty, lived through the fear and tension of the Cold War, and helped shape the international rule-based order that we have ben benefited from for generations. The Duke was patron of more than 50 organisations here in Australia. His efforts in them reflected his personal passions, including conservation, science, industry and design, engineering, sports and the military. 
Truly, his was a life dedicated to making the lives of others better. His efforts were focused on fostering the talents of individuals and enabling communities to grow and to thrive. In that work, he leaves behind a legacy that will extend long beyond his years and, I have no doubt, long beyond ours. In this place, we often talk about the ways that government can make people's lives better. Government. It's a sentiment I appreciate, well-meaning as it is, but it's a principle I take with a grain of salt. Governments have resources from Australians, sure, but the decisions made by politicians and bureaucrats will never be made with the same local knowledge and care as decisions that are made by local community organisations and civil society on the ground. So one organisation that I'd like to pay tribute to today is Brisbane's Mercy Community. They provide enormous love, care and support for people facing some terrible, difficult times in their lives. With a history as St Vincent's orphanage and convent that has developed into an important child fostering program, there are many vulnerable Queensland children who are now safer, loved and educated because of Mercy's work. The training and employment help that they offer for people with disabilities, including in their hospitality program, which is first class, gives real freedom, hope and independence. And that is so important to people in our community who are so deserving of the dignity and accomplishment that comes with them having the ability to earn their own living. Mercy provides support for older people needing residential aged care. Again, enormous dignity in the face of what, the end of one's life's hardships. But they have one program about which I'm particularly passionate. It's the New Families Program. And it solves this problem. What do you do when a woman is expecting a baby but has either had past adverse contact with child safety authorities, is living in a circumstance of domestic violence, or were still both. Well, Mercy provide a safe residential program that begins in the last trimester of pregnancy, where mums can be protected from violence, learn about healthy eating and living, and how to provide what their child will need helping them grow into capable parents with the skills and framework to be able to keep their family financially stable, to maintain safety and to grow the awareness of what good, healthy relationships mean and look like into the future. I have to acknowledge it's frightfully expensive. But by the time you take into account the support workers, the clinical care that's provided, housing, food and in-community visits once the residential phase comes to an end, it really adds up. Demand for this program well outstrips supply, but it has an enormously successive, impressive success rate. These successes are measured by injuries not sustained, by children reaching their development milestones, by mothers' improved mental health, staying away from unhealthy substances, and the kind of loving family life that we know massively improves the chances of permanently breaking cycles of violence, poverty, crime and neglect. When you take into account all of those practical effects as well as the brutal reality of the cost of all of those flow-on impacts, well, it's an investment well made. On Mother's Day, I visited the ladies in the Mercy New Families program, and I can't, meet, I can't mention the names of the brave people I met, but I have a message for them. Ladies, I want you to know that I am so proud of your courage to seek a better life for yourselves and for your babies, better lives than you had and better lives than you until recently have been having. 
And I want you to know that with the determination you're already showing, I believe you can do anything, including raise your children to be outstanding members of the Australian community and to achieve your most ambitious goals. It's also timely to salute the team who work with Mercy, who are building stronger communities, lives of dignity and a devotion to leaving our world and this nation a better and more loving place than they found it. To them, I say thank you. Thank you, Senator Stoker. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.